Chapter 13 of The Last of the Mohicans A Narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 13 Quote I'll seek a readier path. Unquote. By Purnell. The route taken by Hawkeye lay across those sandy plains, relieved by occasional valleys and swells of land, which had been traversed by their party on the morning of the same day, with the baffled Magua for their guide. The sun had now fallen, low toward the distant mountains, and as their journey lay through the interminable forest, the heat was no longer oppressive. Their progress, in consequence, was proportionate, and long before the twilight gathered about them, they had made good many toilsome miles of their return. The hunter, like the savage whose place he filled, seemed to select among the blind signs of their wild route, with a species of instinct, seldom abating his speed, and never pausing to deliberate. A rapid and oblique glance at the moss of the trees, with an occasional upward gaze toward the setting sun, or a steady but passing look at the direction of the numerous watercourses through which he waded, were sufficient to determine his path and remove his greatest difficulties. In the meantime, the forest began to change its hues, losing that lively green which had embellished its arches in the graver light which is the usual precursor of the close of day. While the eyes of the sisters were endeavoring to catch glimpses through the trees of the flood of golden glory which formed a glittering halo around the sun, tinging here and there with ruby streaks or bordering with narrow edgings of shining yellow, a mass of clouds that lay piled at no great distance above the western hills, Hawkeye turned suddenly, and pointing toward the gorgeous heavens, he spoke. Yonder is the signal given to man to seek his food and natural rest, he said. Better and wiser would it be if he could understand the signs of nature, and take a lesson from the fowls of the air and the beast of our field. Our night, however, will soon be over, for with the moon we must be up and moving again. I remember to have fought the Maquas hereways in the first war in which I ever drew blood from a man, and we threw up a work of blocks to keep the ravenous varmints from handling our scalps. If my marks do not fail me, we shall find the place a few rods further to our left. Without waiting for an assent, or, indeed, for any reply, the sturdy hunter moved boldly into a dense thicket of young chestnuts shoving aside the branches of the exuberant shoots, which nearly covered the ground, like a man who expected at each step to discover some object he had formerly known. The recollection of the scout did not deceive him. After penetrating through the brush, matted as it was with briars for a few hundred feet, he entered an open space that surrounded a low green hillock, which was crowned by the decayed blockhouse in question. This rude and neglected building was one of those deserted works, which, having been thrown up on an emergency, had been abandoned with the disappearance of danger, and was now quietly crumbling in the solitude of the forest, neglected and nearly forgotten, like the circumstances which had caused it to be reared. Such memorials of the passage and struggles of man are yet frequent throughout the broad barrier of wilderness, which once separated the hostile provinces, and form a species of ruins that are intimately associated with the recollections of colonial history, and which are in appropriate keeping with the gloomy character of the surrounding scenery. The roof of bark had long since fallen, and mingled with the soil, but the huge logs of pine, which had been hastily thrown together, still preserved their relative positions, though one angle of the work had given way under the pressure, and threatened a speedy downfall to the remainder of the rustic edifice. While Hayward and his companions hesitated to approach a building so decayed, 
Hawkeye and the Indians entered within the low walls, not only without fear, but with obvious interest. While the former surveyed the ruins, both internally and externally, with the curiosity of one whose recollections were reviving at each moment, Chingachgook related to his son in the language of the Delawares, and with the pride of a conqueror, the brief history of the skirmish which had been fought in his youth in that secluded spot. A strain of melancholy, however, blended with his triumph, rendering his voice, as usual, soft and musical. In the meantime, the sisters gladly dismounted and prepared to enjoy their halt in the coolness of the evening, and in a security which they believed nothing but the beast of the forest could invade. "'Would not our resting-place have been more retired, my worthy friend?' demanded the more vigilant Duncan, perceiving that the scout had already finished his short survey. "'Had we chosen a spot less known, and one more rarely visited than this?' "'Few live who know the blockhouse was ever raised,' was the slow, amusing answer. "'Tis not often that books are made, and narratives written, of such a scrimmage as was fought between the Mohicans and Mohawks in a war of their own waging. I was then a Yonker, and went out with the Delawares, because I knowed they were a scandalized and wronged race. Forty days and forty nights did the imps crave our blood around this pile of logs, which I designed and partly reared. Being, as you'll remember, no Indian myself, but a man without a cross. The Delawares lent themselves to the work, and we made it good, ten to twenty, until our numbers were nearly equal, and then we sallied out upon the hounds, and not a man of them ever got back to tell the fate of his party. Yes, yes, I was then young and new to the sight of blood, and not relishing the thought that creatures who had spirits like myself should lay on the naked ground to be torn asunder by beast, or to bleach in the rains. I buried the dead with my own hands under that very little hillock where you have placed yourselves. And no bad seat does it make either, though it be raised by the bones of mortal men. Hayward and the sisters arose on the instant from the grassy sepulchre, nor could the two later, notwithstanding the terrific scenes they had so recently passed through, entirely suppress an emotion of natural horror when they found themselves in such familiar contact with the grave of the dead Mohawks. The gray light, the gloomy little area of dark grass, surrounded by its border of brush, beyond which the pines rose, in breathing silence, apparently into the very clouds, and the death-like stillness of the vast forest, were all in unison to deepen such a sensation. They are gone, and they are harmless, continued Hawkeye, waving his hand with a melancholy smile, at their manifest alarm. They'll never shout the war-hoop, nor strike a blow with the tomahawk again. And of all those who aided in placing them where they lie, Chingachgook and I only are living. The brothers and family of the Mohican formed our war party, and you see before you all that are now left of his race. The eyes of the listeners involuntarily sought the forms of the Indians, with a compassionate interest in their desolate fortune. Their dark persons were still to be seen within the shadows of the blockhouse, the son listening on the relation of his father with that sort of intenseness which would be created by a narrative that redounded so much to the honor of those whose names he had long revered for their courage and savage virtues. "'I had thought the Delawares a Pacific people,' said Duncan." and that they never waged war in person, trusting the defense of their hands to those very Mohawks that you slew. "'Tis true, in part,' returned the scout, "'and yet at the bottom tis a wicked lie. Such a treaty was made in ages gone by through the deviltries of the Dutchers, who wished to disarm the natives that had the best right to the country where they had settled themselves. The Mohicans though a part of the same nation, having to deal with the English, never entered into the silly bargain, but kept to their manhood, as in truth did the Delawares when their eyes were opened to their folly. You see before you, 
a chief of the great Mohican Sagamores. Once his family could chase their deer over tracts of country wider than which belongs to the Albany Pateroon, without crossing brook or hill that was not their own. But what is left of their descendant? He may find his six feet of earth when God chooses, and keep it in peace, perhaps, if he has a friend who will take the pains to sink his head so low that the plowshares cannot reach it. Enough, said Hayward, apprehensive that the subject might lead to a discussion that would interrupt the harmony so necessary to the preservation of his fair companions. We have journeyed far, and few among us are blessed with forms like that of yours, which seems not to know neither fatigue nor weakness. The sinews and bones of a man carry me through it all, said the hunter, surveying his muscular limbs with a simplicity that betrayed the honest pleasure the compliment afforded him. There are larger and heavier men to be found in the settlements, but you might travel many days in a city before you could meet one able to walk fifty miles without stopping to take breath, or who has kept the hounds within hearing during a chase of hours. However, as flesh and blood are not always the same, it is quite reasonable to suppose that the gentle ones are willing to rest after all they have seen and done this day. Uncas, clear out the spring while your father and I make a cover for their tender heads of these chestnut shoots and a bed of grass and leaves. The dialogue ceased while the hunter and his companions busied themselves in preparations for the comfort and protection of those they guided a spring which many long years before had induced the natives to select the place for their temporary fortification, was soon cleared of leaves, and a fountain of crystal gushed from the bed, diffusing its waters over the verdant hillock. A corner of the building was then roofed in such a manner as to exclude the heavy dew of the climate, and piles of sweet shrubs and dried leaves were laid beneath it for the sisters to repose on. While the diligent woodsmen were employed in this manner, Cora and Alice partook of that refreshment which duty required much more than inclination prompted them to accept. They then retired within the walls, and first offering up their thanksgiving for past mercies, and petitioning for continuance of the divine favor throughout the coming night, they laid their tender forms on the fragrant couch, and in spite of recollections and forebodings, soon sank into those slumbers which nature so imperiously demanded, and which were sweetened by hopes of the morrow. Duncan had prepared himself to pass the night in watchfulness near them, just without the ruin. But the scout, perceiving his intention, pointed toward Chingachgook, as he coolly disposed his own person on the grass, and said, The eyes of a white man are too heavy, and too blind for such a watch as this. The Mohican will be our sentinel. Therefore let us sleep. I proved myself a sluggard on my post during the past night, said Hayward, and have less need of repose than you, who did more credit to the character of a soldier. Let all the party seek their rest, then, while I hold the guard. If we lay among the white tents of the sixtieth, and in front of an enemy like the French, I could not ask for a better watchman, returned the scout, but in the darkness and among the signs of the wilderness, your judgment will be like the folly of a child, and your vigilance thrown away. Do then, like Uncas and myself, sleep, and sleep in safety. Hayward perceived, in truth, that the younger Indian had thrown his form on the side of the hillock while they were talking like one who sought to make the most of the time allotted to rest, and that his example had been followed by David, whose voice literally clove to his jaws with the fever of his wound, heightened as it was by their toilsome march. Unwilling to prolong a useless discussion, the young man affected to comply by posting his back against the logs of the blockhouse in a half-recumbent posture though resolutely determined in his own mind not to close an eye until he had delivered his precious charge into the arms of Monroe himself. Hawkeye, believing he had prevailed, soon fell asleep, and a silence 
as deep as the solitude in which they had found it, pervaded the retired spot. For many minutes Duncan succeeded in keeping his senses on the alert, and alive to every moaning sound that arose from the forest. His vision became more acute as the shades of evening settled on the place, and even after the stars were glimmering above his head, he was able to distinguish the recumbent forms of his companions, as they lay stretched on the grass, and to note the person of Chingachgook, who sat upright and motionless as one of the trees which formed the dark barrier on every side. He still heard the breathings of the sisters, who lay within a few feet of him, and not a leaf was ruffled by the passing air of which his ear did not detect the whispering sound. At length, however, the mournful notes of a whippoorwill became blended with the moanings of an owl. His heavy eyes occasionally sought the bright rays of the stars, and he then fancied he saw them through the fallen lids. At instants of momentary wakefulness, he mistook a bush for his associate sentinel. His head next sank upon his shoulder, which in its turn sought the support of the ground. And finally, his whole person became relaxed and pliant, and the young man sank into a deep sleep, dreaming that he was a knight of ancient chivalry, holding his midnight vigils before the tent of a recaptured princess, whose favor he did not despair of gaining by such a proof of devotion and watchfulness. How long the tired Duncan lay in this insensible state, he never knew himself. But his slumbering visions had been long lost in total forgetfulness, when he was awakened by a light tap on the shoulder. Aroused by this signal, slight as it was, he sprang upon his feet with a confused recollection of the self-imposed duty he had assumed with the commencement of the night. "'Who comes?' he demanded, feeling for his sword, at the place where it was usually suspended. Speak, friend or enemy. Friend, replied the low voice of Chinchgotchkook, who, pointing upward at the luminary, which was shedding its mild light through the opening in the trees directly above their bivouac, immediately added in his rude English, Moon comes, and white man's fort, far, far off. Time to move. When sleep shuts both eyes of the Frenchman. You say true. Call up your friends and bridle the horses, while I prepare my own companions for the march. We are awake, Duncan, said the soft silvery tones of Alice within the building, and ready to travel very fast after so refreshing a sleep. But you have watched through the tedious night in our behalf, after having endured so much fatigue the livelong day. Say, rather, I would have watched, but my treacherous eyes betrayed me. Twice have I proved myself unfit for the trust I bear. Nay, Duncan, deny it not, interrupted the smiling Alice, issuing from the shadows of the building into the light of the moon, in all the loveliness of her fresh and beauty. I know you to be a heedless one, when self is the object of your care but too vigilant in favor of others. Can we not tarry here a little longer while you find the rest you need? Cheerfully, most cheerfully, will Cora and I keep the vigils while you and all these brave men endeavor to snatch a little sleep? If shame could cure me of my drowsiness, I should never close an eye again, said the uneasy youth, gazing at the ingenuous countenance of Alice where, however, in its sweet solicitude. He read nothing to confirm his half-awakened suspicion. It is but true that after leading you into danger by my heedlessness, I have not even the merit of guarding your pillows, as should become a soldier. No one but Duncan himself should accuse Duncan of such a weakness. Go, then, and sleep, believe me. Neither of us weak girls as we are will betray our watch. The young man was relieved from the awkwardness of making any further protestations of his own demerits by an exclamation from Chinchgotchkook and the attitude of riveted attention assumed by his son. The Mohicans hear an enemy, whispered Hawkeye, who, by this time, 
in common with the whole party, was awake and stirring. They sent danger in the wind. God forbid, exclaimed Hayward. Surely we have had enough of bloodshed. While he spoke, however, the young soldier seized his rifle, and advancing toward the front, prepared to atone for his venial remissness, by freely exposing his life in defense of those he attended. "'Tis some creature of the forest, prowling around us, in quest of food," he said in a whisper. As soon as the low and apparently distant sounds, which had startled the Mohicans, reached his own ears, Psst! returned the attentive scout, "'Tis man! Even I can now tell his tread. Poor as my senses are when compared to an Indian's. That scampering Huron has fallen in with one of Montcalm's outlying parties, and they have struck upon our trail. I shouldn't like myself to spill more human blood in this spot, he added, looking around with anxiety in his features at the dim objects by which he was surrounded. But what must be, must. Lead the horses into the blockhouse. Uncas and friends, do you follow to the same shelter? Poor and old as it is, it offers a cover, and has rung with the crack of a rifle before tonight. He was instantly obeyed, the Mohicans leading the Narragansetts within the ruin, whither the whole party repaired with the most guarded silence. The sound of approaching footsteps were now too distinctly audible to leave any doubts as to the nature of the interruption. They were soon mingled with voices calling to each other in an Indian dialect, which the hunter, in a whisper, affirmed to Hayward was the language of the Hurons. When the party reached the point where the horses had entered the thicket which surrounded the blockhouse, they were evidently at fault having lost those mark which, until that moment, had directed their pursuit. It would seem by the voices that twenty men were soon collected at that one spot, mingling their different opinions and advice in noisy clamor. "'The knaves know our weaknesses,' whispered Hawkeye, who stood by the side of Hayward, in deep shade, looking through an opening in the logs. "'Or they wouldn't indulge their idleness in such a squall's march.' Listen to the reptiles. Each man among them seems to have two tongues, and but a single leg. Duncan, brave as he was in the combat, could not in such a moment of painful suspense make any reply to the cool and characteristic remark of the scout. He only grasped his rifle more firmly, and fastened his eyes upon the narrow opening through which he gazed upon the moonlight view with increasing anxiety. The deeper tones of one who spoke as having authority were next heard, amid a silence that denoted the respect with which his orders, or rather advice, was received, after which, by the rustling of leaves and crackling of dried twigs, it was apparent that the savages were separating in pursuit of the lost trail. Fortunately for the pursued, the light of the moon while it shed a flood of wild luster upon the little area about the ruin, was not sufficiently strong to penetrate the deep arches of the forest, where the objects still lay in deceptive shadow. The search proved fruitless, for so short and sudden had been the passage from the faint path the travelers had journeyed into the thicket, that every trace of their footsteps was lost in the obscurity of the woods. It was not long, however, before the restless savages were heard beating the brush, and gradually approaching the inner edge of that dense border of young chestnuts which encircled the little area. "'They are coming,' muttered Hayward, endeavoring to thrust his rifle through the chink in the logs. "'Let us fire upon their approach.' "'Keep everything in the shade,' returned the scout. "'The snapping of a flint, or even the smell of a single carnal of brimstone.' would bring the hungry varlets upon us in a body. Should it please God that we must give battle for the scalps, trust to the experience of men who know the ways of the savages, and who are not often backward when the war-hoop is howled. Duncan cast his eyes behind him, and saw that the trembling sisters were cowering 
in the far corner of the building, while the Mohicans stood in the shadow like two upright posts, ready and apparently willing to strike when the blow should be needed. Curbing his impatience, he again looked out upon the area and awaited the result in silence. At that instant the thicket opened, and a tall and armed Huron advanced a few paces into the open space. As he gazed upon the silent blockhouse, the moon fell upon his swarthy countenance, and betrayed its surprise and curiosity. He made the exclamation which usually accompanies the former emotion of an Indian, and, calling in a low voice, soon drew a companion to his side. These children of the woods stood together for several moments, pointing at the crumbling edifice, and conversing in the unintelligible language of their tribe. They then approached, though with slow and cautious steps, pausing every instant to look at the building, like startled deer whose curiosity struggled powerfully with their awakened apprehensions for the mastery. The foot of one of them suddenly rested on the mound, and he stopped to examine its nature. At this moment, Hayward observed that the scout loosened his knife in its sheath and lowered the muzzle of his rifle. Imitating these movements, the young man prepared himself for the struggle, which now seemed inevitable. The savages were so near that the least motion in one of the horses, or even a breath louder than common, would have betrayed the fugitives. But, in discovering the character of the mound, the attention of the Hurons appeared directed to a different object. They spoke together, and the sound of their voices were low and solemn, as if influenced by a reverence that was deeply blended with awe. Then they drew warily back, keeping their eyes riveted on the ruin as if they expected to see the apparitions of the dead issue from its silent walls, until, having reached the boundary of the area, they moved slowly into the thicket and disappeared. Hawkeye dropped the breech of his rifle to the earth, and, drawing a long free breath, exclaimed in an audible whisper, Aye, they respect the dead, and it has this time saved their own lives, and it may be, the lives of better men, too. Hayward lent his attention for a single moment to his companion, but without replying, he again turned toward those who had just then interested him more. He heard the two Hurons leave the bushes, and it was soon plain that all the pursuers were gathered about them, in deep attention of their report. After a few minutes of earnest and solemn dialogue, Altogether different from the noisy clamor with which they had first collected about the spot, the sounds grew fainter and more distant, and finally were lost in the depths of the forest. Hawkeye waited until a signal from the listening Chinchkochkuk assured him that every sound from the retiring party was completely swallowed by the distance, when he motioned to Hayward to lead forth the horses and to assist the sisters into their saddles. The instant this was done, they issued through the broken gateway, and stealing out by a direction opposite to the one by which they entered, they quitted the spot, the sisters casting furtive glances at the silent grave and crumbling ruin, as they left the soft light of the moon to bury themselves in the gloom of the woods. End of Chapter 13 this reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007. Chapter 14 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 14 Quote Qui est là? Puck Paisan, pauvre Jean de France. Unquote King Henry the Sixth. During the rapid movement from the blockhouse, 
and until the party was deeply buried in the forest, each individual was too much interested in the escape to hazard a word even in whispers. The scout resumed his post in advance, though his steps, after he had thrown a safe distance between himself and his enemies, were more deliberate than in their previous march, in consequence of his utter ignorance of the localities of the surrounding woods. More than once he halted to consult with his confederates, the Mohicans, pointing upward at the moon and examining the barks of the trees with care. In these brief pauses, Hayward and the sisters listened, with senses rendered doubly acute by the danger, to detect any symptoms which might announce the proximity of their foes. At such moments, it seemed as if the vast range of country lay buried in eternal sleep, not the least sound arising from the forest, unless it was the distant and scarcely audible rippling of a watercourse. Birds, beast, and man appeared to slumber alike, if indeed any of the latter were to be found in that wide tract of wilderness. But the sounds of the rivulet, feeble and murmuring as they were, relieved the guides at once from no trifling embarrassment, and toward it they immediately held their way. When the banks of the little stream were gained, Hawkeye made another halt, and taking the moccasins from his feet, he invited Hayward and Gamut to follow his example. He then entered the water, and for near an hour they traveled in the bed of the brook, leaving no trail. The moon had already sunk into an immense pile of black clouds, which lay impending above the western horizon, when they issued from the low and devious water course to rise again to the light and the level of the sandy but wooded plain. Here the scout seemed to be once more at home, for he held on his way with the certainty and the diligence of a man who moved in the security of his own knowledge. The path soon became more uneven, and the travelers could plainly perceive that the mountains drew nigher to them on each hand, and that they were, in truth, about entering one of their gorges. Suddenly Hawkeye made a pause, and waiting until he was joined by the whole party, he spoke, though in tones so low and cautious that they added to the solemnity of his words in the quiet and darkness of the place. It is easy to know the pathways and to find the licks and water courses of the wilderness, he said, but who that saw this spot could venture to say that a mighty army was at rest among yonder silent trees and barren mountains. We are then at no great distance from William Henry, said Hayward, advancing nigher to the scout. It is yet a long and weary path, and when and where to strike it is now our greatest difficulty. See, he said, pointing through the trees toward a spot where a little basin of water reflected the stars from its placid bosom. Here is the bloody pond, and I am on ground that I have not only often traveled, but over which I have fought the enemy from the rising to the setting of the sun. Ha! That sheet of dull and dreary water, then, is the sepulchre of the brave men who fell in the contest. I have heard it named, but never have I stood on its banks before. Three battles we did make with the Dutch Frenchmen in a day, continued Hawkeye, pursuing the train of his own thoughts rather than replying to the remark of Duncan. Footnote. Baron de Scal, a German in the service of France. A few years previously to the period of the tale, this officer was defeated by Sir William Johnson of Johnstown, New York, on the shores of Lake George. End footnote. He met us hard by in our outward march to ambush his advance, and scattered us like driven deer through the defile to the shores of Horican. Then we rallied behind our fallen trees, and made head against him, under Sir William, who was made Sir William for that very deed. And well did we pay him for the disgrace of the morning. Hundreds of Frenchmen saw the sun that day for the last time, and even their leader, Discal himself, fell into our hands, so cut and torn with the lead that he has gone back to his own country, unfit for further acts in war. "'Twas a noble repulse," exclaimed Hayward in the heat of his youthful ardor. "'The fame of it reached us early in our southern army.' 
Ay, but it did not end there. I was sent by Major Effingham at Sir William's own bidding to outflank the French and carry the tidings of their disaster across the portage to the fort on the Hudson. Just here away, where you see the trees rise into a mountain swell, I met a party coming down to our aid, and I led them where the enemy were taking their meal, little dreaming that they had not finished the bloody work of the day. And you surprised them? If death can be a surprise to men who are thinking only of the cravings of their appetites, we gave them but little breathing time, for they had borne hard upon us in the fight of the morning, and there were few in our party who had not lost friend or relative by their hands. When all was over, the dead, and some say the dying, were cast into that little pond. These eyes have seen its waters colored with blood as natural water never yet flowed from the bowels of the earth. It was a convenient, and I trust will prove a peaceful grave for a soldier. You have then seen much service on this frontier? I said the scout, erecting his tall person with an air of military pride. There are not many echoes among these hills that haven't rung with the crack of my rifle, nor is there the space of a square mile atwixt the hurricane and the river that Kildare hasn't dropped the living body on, be it an enemy or be it a brute beast. As for the grave there being as quiet as you mention, it is another matter. There are them in the camp who say and think, Man, to lie still, should not be buried, while the breath is in the body. And certain it is that in the hurry of that evening, the doctors had but little time to say who was living and who was dead. Hist! See you nothing walking on the shore of the pond? Tis not probable that any are as houseless as ourselves in this dreary forest, such as he may care but little for house or shelter, and night dew can never wet a body that passes its days in the water, returned the scout, grasping the shoulder of Hayward with such convulsive strength as to make the young soldier painfully sensible how much superstitious terror had got the mastery of a man usually so dauntless. By heaven, there is a human form, and it approaches. Stand to your arms, my friends, for we know not whom we encounter. Qui vive? demanded a stern, quick voice which sounded like a challenge from another world, issuing out from that solitary and solemn place. What says it? whispered the scout. It speaks neither Indian nor English. Qui vive? repeated the same voice, which was quickly followed by the rattling of arms and a menacing attitude. France! cried Hayward, advancing from the shadow of the trees to the shore of the pond, within a few yards of the sentinel. Du venez-vous? Où allez-vous, dear C. Bonard? demanded the grenadier, in the language and the accent of a man from old France. Je vends de la découverte, et je vais me coucher. Êtes-vous officier du roi? Sans doute, mon camarade. Des prince de pur un provincial? Je suis capitaine de Chessier. Hayward well knew that the other was a regiment of the line. J'ai ici, avec moi, des fils du commandant de la fortification. Aha, tu en es du palais. Je l'ai a fait prisonnier, pré à la foi, et je l'ai condis à général. Ma foi, madame, j'en suis fâché pour vous, exclaimed the young soldier, touching his cap with grace. My fortune de guerre, vous trouverez notre général un brave homme et bien poli avec la dame. C'est le caractère des gens de guerre, said Cora, with admirable self-possession. Adieu, mon ami, je vous souhaiterai un devoir. The soldier made a low and humble acknowledgment for her civility, and Hayward adding a, Bon nuit, mon camarade. They moved deliberately forward, leaving the sentinel pacing the banks of the silent pond, little suspecting an enemy of so much effrontery, and humming to himself those words which were recalled to his mind by the sight of women, and perhaps by recollections of his own distant, and beautiful friends. Vive le vent, vive l'amour, etc., etc. Tis well you understood the knave, whispered the scout, when they had gained a little distance from the place, and letting his rifle fall into the hollow of his arm again. I soon saw that he was one of them uneasy Frenchers, 
and well for him it was that his speech was friendly and his wishes kind, or a place might have been found for his bones among those of his countrymen. He was interrupted by a long and heavy groan, which arose from the little basin, as though in truth the spirits of the departed lingered about their watery sepulchre. Surely it was flesh, continued the scout. No spirit could handle its arm so steadily. It was a flesh, but whether the poor fellow still belongs to this world may well be doubted, said Hayward, glancing his eyes around him and missing Chinchgachkuk from their little band. Another groan, more faint than the former, was succeeded by a heavy and sullen plunge into the water, and all was still again, as if the borders of the dreary pool had never been awakened from the silence of creation. While they yet hesitated in uncertainty, the form of the Indian was seen gliding out of the thicket. As the chief rejoined them, with one hand he attached the reeking scalp of the unfortunate young Frenchman to his girdle, and with the other he replaced the knife and tomahawk that had drunk his blood. He then took his wanted station with the air of a man who believed he had done a deed of merit. The scout dropped one end of his rifle to the earth, and leaning his hands on the other, he stood musing in profound silence. Then shaking his head in a mournful manner, he muttered, "'Twould have been a cruel and unhuman act for a white skin, but tis the gift and nature of an Indian, and I suppose it should not be denied. I could wish, though, it had befallen an accursed Mingo, rather than that gay young boy from the old countries. Enough, said Hayward, apprehensive the unconscious sisters might comprehend the nature of the detention, and conquering his disgust by a train of reflections very much like that of the hunter. Tis done, and though better it were left undone, cannot be amended. You see, we are too obviously within the sentinels of the enemy. What course do you propose to follow? Yes, said Hawkeye, rousing himself again. Tis as you say. Too late to harbor further thoughts about it. I, the French, have gathered around the fort in good earnest, and we have a delicate needle to thread in passing them. And but little time to do it in, added Hayward, glancing his eyes upwards toward the bank of vapor that concealed the setting moon. And little time to do it in, repeated the scout. The thing may be done in two fashions, by the help of Providence, without which it may not be done at all. Name them quickly, for time presses. One would be to dismount the gentle ones, and let their beast range the plain. By sending the Mohicans in front, we might then cut a lane through their sentries, and enter the fort over the dead bodies. It will not do. It will not do interrupted the generous Hayward. A soldier might force his way in this manner, but never with such a convoy. T'would be, indeed, a bloody path for such tender feet to wade in, returned the equally reluctant scout. But I thought it befitting my manhood to name it. We must then turn in our trail and get without the line of their lookouts, when we will bend short to the west and enter the mountains where I can hide you so that the devil's hounds in Montcalm's pay will be thrown off the scent for months to come. Let it be done, and that instantly. Further words were unnecessary, for Hawkeye, merely uttering the mandate to follow, moved along the route by which they had just entered, their present critical and even dangerous situation. Their progress, like their late dialogue, was guarded, and without noise, for none knew at what moment a passing patrol or a crouching picket of the enemy might rise upon their path. As they held their silent way along the margin of the pond, again Hayward and the scout stole furtive glances at its appalling dreariness. They looked in vain for the form they had so recently seen stalking along in silent shores, while a low and regular wash of the little waves by announcing that the waters were not yet subsided, furnished a frightful memorial of the deed of blood they had just witnessed. 
Like all that passing and gloomy scene, the low basin, however, quickly melted in the darkness, and became blended with the mass of black objects in the rear of the travelers. Hawkeye soon deviated from the line of their retreat, and striking off towards the mountains which form the western boundary of the narrow plain, he led his followers with swift steps, deep within the shadows that were cast from their high and broken summits. The route was now painful, lying over ground ragged with rocks, and intersected with ravines, and their progress proportionately slow. Bleak and black hills lay on every side of them, compensating in some degree for the additional toil of the march by the sense of security they imparted. At length, the party began slowly to rise a steep and rugged ascent by a path that curiously wound among rocks and trees, avoiding the one and supported by the other, in a manner that showed it had been devised by men long practiced in the arts of the wilderness. As they gradually rose from the level of the valleys, the thick darkness which usually precedes the approach of day began to disperse, and objects were seen in the plain and palpable colors with which they had been gifted by nature. When they issued from the stunted woods which clung to the barren sides of the mountain, upon a flat and mossy rock that formed its summit, they met the morning as it came blushing above the green pines of a hill that lay on the opposite side of the valley of the Horican. The scout now told the sisters to dismount and taking the bridles from the mouths and the saddles off the backs of the jaded beast, he turned them loose to glean a scanty substance among the shrubs and meager herbage of that elevated region. Go, he said, and seek your food where nature gives it to you, and beware that you become not food to ravenous wolves yourselves among these hills. Have we no further need of them? demanded Hayward. See and judge with your own eyes, said the scout, advancing toward the eastern brow of the mountain, whither he beckoned for the whole party to follow. If it was as easy to look into the heart of man as it is to spy out the nakedness of Montcalm's camp from this spot, hypocrites would grow scarce, and the cunning of a Mingo might prove a losing game compared to the honesty of a Delaware. When the travelers reached the verge of the precipices, they saw at a glance the truth of the scout's declaration, and the admirable foresight with which he had led them to their commanding station. The mountain on which they stood, elevated perhaps a thousand feet in the air, was a high cone that rose a little in advance of that range, which stretches for miles along the western shores of the lake, until meeting its sisters miles beyond the water, it ran off toward the Canadas in confused and broken masses of rock, thinly sprinkled with evergreens. Immediately at the feet of the party, the southern shore of the Horican swept in a broad semicircle from mountain to mountain, making a wide strand that soon rose into an uneven and somewhat elevated plain. To the north stretched the limpid, and as it appeared from that dizzy height, the narrow sheet of the Holy Lake indented with numberless bays, embellished by fantastic headlands, and dotted with countless islands. At the distance of a few leagues, the bed of the water became lost among mountains, or was wrapped in the masses of vapor, that came slowly rolling along their bosom, before a light morning air. But a narrow opening between the crest of the hills pointed out the passage by which they found their way still further north to spread their pure and ample sheets again before pouring out their tribute into the distant Champlain. To the south stretched the defile or rather broken plain so often mentioned. For several miles in this direction the mountains appeared reluctant to yield their dominion, but within reach of the eye they diverged and finally melted into the level and sandy lands across which we have accompanied our adventurers in their double journey. Along both ranges of hills which bounded the opposite sides of the lake and valley, clouds of light vapor were rising in spiral wreaths from the uninhabited woods, looking like the smoke of hidden cottages, or rolled lazily down the declivities to mingle with the fogs of the lower land. A single solitary snow-white cloud 
floated above the valley, and marked the spot beneath which lay the silent pool of the bloody pond. Directly on the shore of the lake, and nearer to its western than its eastern margin, lay the extensive earthen ramparts and low buildings of William Henry. Two of the sweeping bastions appeared to rest on the water, which washed their bases, while a deep ditch and extensive morasses guarded its other sides and angles. The land had been cleared of wood for a reasonable distance around the work, but every other part of the scene lay in the green livery of nature, except where the limpid water mellowed the view, or the bold rocks thrust their black and naked heads above the undulating outline of the mountain ranges. In this front might be seen the scattered sentinels, who held a weary watch against their numerous foes, and within the walls themselves the travelers looked down upon men still drowsy with a night of vigilance. Toward the southeast, but in immediate contact with the fort, was an entrenched camp, posted on a rocky eminence that would have been far more eligible for the work itself, in which Hawkeye pointed out the presence of those auxiliary regiments that had so recently left the Hudson in their company. From the woods a little further to the south rose numerous dark and lurid smokes, which were easily to be distinguished from the purer exaltations of the springs, and which the scout also showed to Hayward, as evidences that the enemy lay in force in that direction. But the spectacle which most concerned the young soldier was on the western bank of the lake, though quite near to its southern termination. On a strip of land which appeared from this stand too narrow to contain such an army, but which in truth extended many hundreds of yards from the shores of the Horican to the base of the mountain, were to be seen the white tents and military engines of an encampment of ten thousand men. Batteries were already thrown up in their front, and even while the spectators above them were looking down, with such different emotions, on a scene which lay like a map beneath their feet, the roar of artillery rose from the valley and passed off in thundering echoes along the eastern hills. Morning is just touching them below, said the deliberate and musing scout, and the watchers have a mind to wake up the sleepers by the sound of cannon. We are a few hours too late. Montcalm has already filled the woods with his accursed Iroquois. The place is indeed invested, returned Duncan. But is there no expedient by which we may enter? Capture in the works would be far preferable to falling again into the hands of roving Indians. See, exclaimed the scout, unconsciously directing the attention of Cora to the quarters of her own father, how that shot has made the stones fly from the side of the commandant's house. Aye, these Frenchers will pull it to pieces faster than it was put together, solid and thick though it be. Hayward, I sickened at the sight of danger that I cannot share, said the undaunted but anxious daughter. Let us go to Montcalm, and demand admission. He dare not deny a child the boon. You would scarce find the tent of the Frenchman with the hair on your head, said the blunt scout. If I had but one of the thousand boats which lie among that shore, it might be done. Ha! Here will soon be an end of the firing, for yonder comes a fog that will turn day to night, and make an Indian arrow more dangerous than a molded cannon. Now, if you are equal to the work and will follow, I will make a push, for I long to get down into the camp, if it be only to scatter some Mingo dogs that I see lurking in the skirts of yonder thicket of birch. We are equal, said Cora firmly. On such an errand we will follow to any danger. The scout turned to her with a smile of honest and cordial approbation, as he answered, I would I had a thousand men of brawny limbs and quick eyes that fear death as little as you. I'd send them jabbering Frenchers back into their den again, before the week was ended, howling like so many fettered hounds or hungry wolves. But, sir, he added, turning from her to the rest of the party, the fall comes rolling down so fast. We shall have but just the time to meet it on the plain, and use it as a cover. Remember, if any accident should befall me, to keep the air blowing on your left cheeks, or rather, follow the Mohicans. 
they'd sent their way, be it in day or be it at night. He then waved his hand for them to follow, and threw himself down the steep declivity with free but careful footsteps. Hayward assisted the sisters to descend, and in a few minutes they were all far down a mountain, whose sides they had climbed with so much toil and pain. The direction taken by Hawkeye soon brought the travelers to the level of the plain, nearly opposite to a sally port in the western curtain of the fort, which lay itself at the distance of about half a mile from the point where he halted to allow Duncan to come up with his charge. In their eagerness, and favored by the nature of the ground, they had anticipated the fog which was rolling heavily down the lake, and it became necessary to pause until the mist had wrapped the camp of the enemy in their fleecy mantle. The Mohicans profited by the delay to steal out of the woods and to make a survey of surrounding objects. They were followed at a little distance by the scout, with a view to profit early by their report, and to obtain some faint knowledge for himself of the more immediate localities. In a very few moments he returned, his face reddened with vexation, while he muttered his disappointment in words of no very gentle import. Here has the cunning Frenchman been posting a picket, directly in our path, he said, redskins and whites, and we shall be as likely to fall into their midst as to pass them in the fog. Cannot we make a circuit to avoid the danger, asked Hayward, and come into our path again when it is past? Who that once bends from the line of his march in a fog can tell when or how to find it again? The mist of Horican are not like the curls of a peace pipe, or the smoke which settles above a mosquito fire. He was yet speaking when a crashing sound was heard, and a cannonball entered the thicket, striking the body of a sapling and rebounding to the earth, its force much expended by previous resistance. The Indians followed instantly, like busy attendants on the terrible messenger, and Uncas commenced speaking earnestly and with much action in the Delaware tongue. It may be so, lad, muttered the scout when he had ended, for desperate fevers are not to be treated like a toothache. Come, then. The fog is shutting in. Stop! cried Hayward. First explain your expectations. Tis soon done, and a small hope it is, but it is better than nothing. This shot that you see, added the scout, kicking the harmless iron with his foot, has plowed the earth in its road from the fort, and we shall hunt for the furrow it has made when all other signs may fail. No more words, but follow, or the fog may leave us in the middle of our path, a mark for both armies to shoot at. Hayward, perceiving that, in fact, a crisis had arrived, when acts were more required than words, placed himself between the sisters and drew them swiftly forward, keeping the dim figure of their leader in his eye. It was soon apparent that Hawkeye had not magnified the power of the fog, for before they had proceeded twenty yards, it was difficult for the different individuals of the party to distinguish each other in the vapor. They had made their little circuit to the left, and were already inclining again toward the right, having, as Hayward thought, got over nearly half the distance to the friendly works, when his ears were saluted with the fierce summons apparently within twenty feet of them of, Kivala! Push on, whispered the scout, once more bending to the left. Push on, repeated Hayward when the summons was renewed by a dozen voices, each of which seemed charged with menace. C'est moi, cried Duncan, dragging rather than leading those he supported swiftly onward. Bet, qui moi? Abi de la France. Two bas plus later, d'un ami de la France. Are au podu, j'ai te fait, ami du diable. Non, four camarade, four. The order was instantly obeyed and the fog was stirred by the explosion of fifty muskets. Happily, the aim was bad, and the bullets cut the air in a direction a little different from that taken by the fugitives, though still so nigh them that to the unpractised ears of David and the two females 
it appeared as if they whistled within a few inches of the organs. The outcry was renewed, and the order not only to fire again, but to pursue, was too plainly audible. When Hayward briefly explained the meaning of the words they heard, Hawkeye halted and spoke with quick decision and great firmness. Let us deliver our fire, he said. They will believe it a sortie and give way, or they will wait for reinforcements. The scheme was well conceived, but failed in its effects. The instant the French heard the pieces, it seemed as if the plain was alive with men, muskets rattling along its whole extent from the shores of the lake to the furthest boundary of the woods. "'We shall draw their entire army upon us and bring on a general assault,' said Duncan. "'Lead on, my friend, for your own life and ours.' The scout seemed willing to comply, but in the hurry of the moment, and in the change of position, he had lost the direction. In vain he turned either cheek toward the light air. They felt equally cool. In this dilemma, Uncas lighted on the furrow of the cannonball, where it had cut the ground in three adjacent anthills. "'Give me the range!' said Hawkeye, bending to catch a glimpse of the direction, and then instantly moving onward. Cries, oaths, voices calling to each other, and the reports of muskets which were now quick and incessant, and apparently on every side of them. Suddenly a strong glare of light flashed across the scene. The fog rolled upward in thick wreaths, and several cannons belched across the plain, and the roar was thrown heavily back from the bellowing echoes of the mountain. "'Tis from the fort!' exclaimed Hawkeye, turning short on his tracks. "'And we, like stricken fools, were rushing to the woods under the very knives of the Maquas. The instant their mistake was rectified, the whole party retraced the error with the utmost diligence. Duncan willingly relinquished the support of Cora to the arm of Uncas, and Cora as readily accepted the welcome assistance. Men, hot and angry in pursuit, were evidently on their footsteps, and each instant threatened their capture, if not their destruction. Pont de Cantia, Uncle cried an eager pursuer, who seemed to direct the operations of the enemy. "'Stand firm, and be ready, my gallant sixtieths!' suddenly exclaimed the voice above them. "'Wait to see the enemy! Fire low, and sweep the glossies!' "'Father! Father!' exclaimed a piercing cry from out the mist. "'It is high, Alice! Thine own Elsie! Spare! Oh, save your daughters!' "'Hold!' shouted the former speaker in the awful tones of paternal agony, the sound reaching even to the woods and rolling back in solemn echo. "'Tis she! God has restored me to my children! Throw open the sally-port in the field, sixtieths! To the field! Pull not a trigger, lest ye kill my lambs! Drive off these dogs of France with your steel!' Duncan heard the grating of the rusty hinges, and darting to the spot directed by the sound, he met a long line of dark red warriors passing swiftly toward the glossies. He knew them from his own battalion of the Royal Americans, and flying to their head, soon swept every trace of his pursuers from before the works. For an instant, Cor and Alice stood trembling and bewildered by this unexpected desertion, but before either had leisure for speech, or even thought, an officer of gigantic frame, whose locks were bleached with years of service, but whose air of military grandeur had been rather softened than destroyed by time, rushed out of the body of mist and folded them to his bosom, while large scalding tears rolled down his pale and wrinkled cheeks, and he exclaimed in the peculiar accent of Scotland, For this I thank thee, Lord. Let danger come as it will. Thy servant is now prepared. End chapter 14 this reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the autumn of 2007. Chapter 15 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15 Quote, Then go we in to know his embassy, which I could with ready guess declare, 
before the Frenchmen speak a word of it. Unquote. From King Henry V. A few succeeding days were passed amid the privations, the uproar, and the dangers of the siege, which was vigorously pressed by a power against whose approaches Monroe possessed no competent means of resistance. It appeared as if Webb, with his army which lay slumbering on the banks of the Hudson, had utterly forgotten the strait to which his countrymen were reduced. Montcalm had filled the woods of the portage with his savages, every yell and hoop of whom rang through the British encampment, chilling the hearts of men who were already but too much disposed to magnify the danger. Not so, however, with the besieged. Animated by the words, and stimulated by the examples of their leaders, they had found their courage, and maintained their ancient reputation with a zeal that did justice to the stern character of their commander. As if satisfied with the toil of marching through the wilderness to encounter his enemy, the French general, though of approved skill, had neglected to seize the adjacent mountains, whence the besieged might have been exterminated with impunity, and which, in the more modern warfare of the country, would not have been neglected for a single hour. This sort of contempt for eminences, or rather dread of the labor of ascending them, might have been termed the besetting weakness of the warfare of the period. It originated in the simplicity of the Indian contest, in which from the nature of the combats and the density of the forest, fortresses were rare, and artillery next to useless. The carelessness engendered by these usages descended even to the war of the Revolution, and lost the states the important fortress of Ticonderoga, opening a way for the army of Burgoyne into what was then the bosom of the country. We look back at this ignorance, or infatuation, whichever it may be called, with wonder, knowing that the neglect of an eminence, whose difficulties like those of Mount Defiance, have been so greatly exaggerated, would at the present time prove fatal to the reputation of the engineer who had planned the works at their base, or to that general whose lot it was to defend them. The tourist, the valetudinarian, or the amateur of the beauties of nature, who, in the train of his foreign hand, now rolls through the scenes we have attempted to describe, in quest of information, health, or pleasure, or floats steadily toward his object on those artificial waters, which have sprung up under the administration of a statesman, who has dared to stake his political character on the hazardous issue, is not to suppose that his ancestors traversed those hills, or struggled with the same currents with equal facility. Footnote. Evidently, the late DeWitt Clinton, who died governor of New York in 1828. End footnote. The transportation of a single heavy gun was often considered equal to a victory gained, if, happily, the difficulties of the passage had not so far separated from its necessary concomitant, the ammunition, as to render it no more than a useless tube of unwieldy iron. The evils of this state of things pressed heavily on the fortunes of the resolute Scotsman, who now defended William Henry. Though his adversary neglected the hills, he had planted his batteries with judgment on the plain, and caused them to be served with vigor and skill. Against this assault, the besieged could only oppose the imperfect and hasty preparations of a fortress in the wilderness. It was on the afternoon of the fifth day of the siege, and the fourth of his own service in it, that Major Hayward profited by a parley that had just been beaten, by repairing to the ramparts of one of the water bastions to breathe the cool air from the lake, and to take a survey of the progress of the siege. He was alone, if the solitary sentinel who paced the mound be accepted, for the artillerist had hastened also to profit by the temporary suspension of their arduous duties. The evening was delightfully calm, and the light air from the limpid water fresh and soothing. It seemed as if, with the termination of the roar of artillery, and the plunging of shot, nature had also seized the moment to assume her mildest and most captivating form. The sun poured down his parting glory on the scene, without the oppression of those fierce rays that belong to the climate and the season. The mountains looked green and fresh and lovely, tempered with the milder light, 
were softened in shadow, as thin vapors floated between them and the sun. The numerous islands rested on the bosom of the hurricane, some low and sunken, as if embedded in the waters, and others appearing to hover above the element, in little hillocks of green velvet, among which the fishermen of the beleaguering army peacefully rowed their skiffs, or floated at rest on the glassy mirror, in pursuit of their employment. The scene was at once animated and still. All that pertained to nature was sweet or simply grand, while those parts which depended on the temper and movements of man were lively and playful. Two little spotless flags were abroad, the one on a salient angle of the fort, and the other on the advanced battery of the besiegers. Emblems of the truth which existed, not only to the axe, but it would seem also to the enmity of the combatants. Behind these again swung, heavily opening and closing in silken folds, the rival standards of England and France. A hundred gay and thoughtless young Frenchmen were drawing a net to the pebbly beach, within dangerous proximity to the sullen but silent cannon of the fort, while the eastern mountain was sending back the loud shouts and gay merriment that attended their sport. Some were rushing eagerly to enjoy the aquatic games of the lake, and others were already toiling their way up the neighboring hills with the restless curiosity of their nation. To all these sports and pursuits, those of the enemy who watched the besieged, and the besieged themselves, were, however, merely the idle, though sympathizing, spectators. Here and there a picket had indeed raised a song or mingled in a dance, which had drawn the dusky savages around them from their lairs in the forest. In short, everything wore rather the appearance of a day of pleasure than of an hour stolen from the dangers and toil of a bloody and vindictive warfare. Duncan had stood in a musing attitude, contemplating this scene a few minutes, when his eyes were directed to the glossy in front of the sally port already mentioned by the sounds of approaching footsteps. He walked to an angle of the bastion, and beheld the scout advancing under the custody of a French officer to the body of the fort. The countenance of Hawkeye was haggard and careworn, and his air dejected, as though he felt the deepest degradation at having fallen into the power of his enemies. He was without his favorite weapon, and his arms were even bound behind him with thongs made of the skin of a deer. The arrival of flags to cover the messengers of summons had occurred so often of late that when Hayford first drew his careless glance on this group, he expected to see another of the officers of the enemy charged with a similar office. But the instant he recognized the tall person and the still sturdy though downcast features of his friend the woodsman, he started with surprise and turned to descend from the bastion into the bosom of the work. The sounds of other voices, however, caught his attention, and for a moment caused him to forget his purpose. At the inner angle of the mound he met the sisters, walking along the parapet in search, like himself, of air and relief from confinement. They had not met from that painful moment when he deserted them on the plain, only to assure their safety. He had parted with them, worn with care and jaded with fatigue. He now saw them refreshed and blooming, though timid and anxious. Under such an inducement it will cause no surprise that the young man lost sight of a time of other objects in order to address them. He was, however, anticipated by the voice of the ingenious and youthful Alice. Oh, you tyrant! You recreant knight! He who abandons his damsels in the fairy list, she cried. Here have we been days, they ages, expecting you at our feet, imploring mercy and forgetfulness of your craven backsliding, or I should rather say, back running, for verily you fled in the matter that no stricken deer, as our worthy friend the scout would say, could be equal. You know that Alice means our thanks and our blessings, added the graver and more thoughtful Cora. In truth, we have a little wonder why you should so rigidly absent yourself from a place where the gratitude of the daughters might receive the support of a parent's thanks. 
your father himself could tell you that though absent from your presence, I have not been altogether forgetful of your safety, returned the young man. The mastery of yonder village of huts, pointing to the entrenched camp, has been keenly disputed, and he who holds it is sure to be possessed of this fort and that which it contains. My days and nights have all been passed there since we separated, because I thought that duty called me thither. But, he added with an air of chagrin, which he endeavored, though unsuccessfully, to conceal, had I been aware that what I then believed a soldier's conduct could be so construed, shame would have added to the list of reasons. Hayward Duncan! exclaimed Alice, bending forward to read his half-averted countenance, until a lock of her golden hair rested on her flushed cheek, and nearly concealed the tear that had started to her eye. Did I think this idle tongue of mine had pain you? I would silence it forever. Cora can say, if Cora would, how justly we have prized your services, and how deep, I had almost said, how fervent, is our gratitude. And will Cora attest the truth of this? cried Duncan, suffering the cloud to be chased from his countenance, by a smile of open pleasure. What says the graver sister? Will she find an excuse for the neglect of the knight in the duty of a soldier? Cora made no immediate answer, but turned her face toward the water as if looking on the sheet of the hurricane. When she did bend her eyes on the young man, they were yet filled with an expression of anguish that at once drove every thought but that of kind solitude from his mind. "'You are not well, dearest Miss Monroe,' he exclaimed. We have trifled while you are in suffering. "'Tis nothing,' she answered, refusing his support with feminine reserve, "'that I cannot see the sunny of a picture of life like this artless but ardent enthusiast,' she added, laying her hand lightly but affectionately on the arm of her sister. "'Is the penalty of experience, and perhaps the misfortune of my nature? See?' she continued, as if determined to shake off infirmity in a sense of duty. Look around you, Major Hayward, and tell me what a prospect it is for the daughter of a soldier whose greatest happiness is his honor and his military renown. Neither ought nor shall be tarnished by circumstances, over which he has had no control, Duncan warmly replied. But your words recall me to my own duty. I go now to your gallant father, to hear his determination in manners of the last moment of the defense. God bless you in every fortune, noble, Cora, I may and must call you. She frankly gave him her hand, though her lip quivered, and her cheeks gradually became of ashy paleness. In every fortune, I know, you will be an ornament and honor to your sex. Alice? Adieu. His voice changed from admiration to tenderness. Adieu, Alice. We shall soon meet again, as conquerors, I trust, and amid rejoicings. Without waiting for an answer from either, the young man threw himself down the grassy steps of the bastion, and moving rapidly across the parade, he was quickly in the presence of their father. Monroe was pacing his narrow apartment, with a disturbed air and gigantic strides as Duncan entered. "'You have anticipated my wishes, Major Hayward,' he said. "'I was about to request this favor. "'I am sorry to see, sir, that the messenger I so warmly recommended "'has returned in custody of the French. "'I hope there is no reason to distrust his fidelity. "'The fidelity of the long rifle is well known to me,' returned Monroe and is above suspicion, though his usual good fortune seems at last to have failed. Montcalm has got him, and with the accursed politeness of his nation, he has sent him with a doleful tale of, knowing how I valued the fellow, he could not think of retaining him, a Jesuitical way that, Major Duncan Hayward, of telling a man of his misfortunes. But the general and his succor? 
Did ye look to the south as he entered? And could ye not see them? said the old soldier, laughing bitterly. Hoot, hoot! You are an impatient boy, sir, and cannot give the gentlemen leisure for their march. They are coming, then? The scout has said as much? When and by what path? For the dunces omitted to tell me this. There is a letter, it would seem, too, and the only agreeable part of the matter. For the customary attentions of your Marquis of Montcalm, I warrant me, Duncan, that he of Lothonian would buy a dozen such marquisettes. But if the news of the letter were bad, the gentility of this French monsieur would certainly compel him to let us know it. He keeps the letter, then, while he releases the messenger? Aye, that does he, and all for the sake of what you call your bon ami. I would venture, if the truth was known, the fellow's grandfather taught the noble science of dancing. But what says the scout? He has eyes and ears and a tongue. What verbal report does he make? Oh, sir! He is not wanting in natural organs, and he is free to tell all that he has seen and heard. The whole amount is this. There is a fort of his majesty's on the banks of the Hudson called Edward. In honor of his gracious highness of York, you'll know, and it is well filled with armed men, as such a work should be. But was there no movement, no signs of any intention to advance to our relief? There were the morning and evening parades, and when one of the provincial looms, you'll know, Duncan, you're half a Scotsman yourself, when one of them dropped his powder over his porridge, if it touched the coals, it just burned. Then, suddenly changing his bitter and ironical manner to one more grave and thoughtful, he continued, And yet there might, and there must be, something in that letter which it would be well to know. Our decision should be speedy, said Duncan, gladly availing himself of this change of humor to press the more important objects of their interview. I cannot conceal from you, sir, that the camp will not be much longer tenable, and, I am sorry to add, that things appear no better in the fort. More than half the guns are bursted. And how should it be otherwise? And how should it be otherwise? Some were fished from the bottom of the lake. Some have been rusting in wood since the discovery of the country. And some were never guns at all, mere privateersmen's playthings. Do you think, sir, you can have Woolwich Warren in the midst of a wilderness, three thousand miles from Great Britain? The walls are crumbling about our ears, and provisions begin to fail us, continued Hayward without regarding the new burst of indignation. Even the men show signs of discontent and alarm. Major Hayward, said Monroe, turning to his youthful associate with the dignity of his years and superior rank, I should have served His Majesty for half a century, and earned these gray hairs in vain, were I ignorant of all you say, and of the pressing nature of our circumstances. Still, there is everything due to honor of the king's arms, and something to ourselves. While there is hope of succor, this fortress will I defend, though it be done with pebbles gathered on the lake shore. It is a sight of the letter, therefore, that we want, that we may know the intentions of the Earl of Luden has left among us as his substitute. And can I be of service in that matter? Sir, you can. The Marquis of Montcalm has, in addition to his other civilities, invited me to a personal interview between the works and his own camp, in order, as he says, to impart some additional information. Now I think it would not be wise to show any undue solitude to meet him. And I would employ you, an officer of rank, as my substitute, for it would but ill comport with the honor of Scotland to let it be said one of her gentlemen was outdone 
in civility, by a native of any other country on earth. Without assuming the supererogatory task of entering into a discussion of the comparative merits of national courtesy, Duncan cheerfully assented to supply the place of the veteran in the approaching interview. A long and confidential communication now succeeded, during which the young men received some additional insight into his duty, from the experience and native acuteness of his commander, and then the former took his leave, as Duncan could only act as the representative of his, were of course dispersed with. The truce still existed and with a roll and beat of the drum, and covered by a little white flag, Duncan left the sally-port within ten minutes after his instructions were ended. He was received by the French officer in advance, with the usual formalities, and immediately accompanied to a distant marquis of the renowned soldier who led the forces of France. The general of the enemy received the youthful messenger surrounded by his principal officers, and by a swarthy band of the native chiefs, who had followed him to the field, with the warriors of their several tribes. Hayward paused short, when, in glancing his eyes rapidly over the dark group of the later, he beheld the malignant countenance of Maqua, regarding him with the calm but sullen attention which marked the expression of that subtle savage. A slight exclamation of surprise even burst from the lips of the young man. But instantly, recollecting his errand, and the presence in which he stood, he suppressed every appearance of emotion, and turned to the hostile leader, who had already advanced a step to receive him. The Marquis of Montcalm was, at that period of which we write, in the flower of his age, and, it may be added, in the zenith of his fortunes. But even in that enviable situation he was affable and distinguished as much for his attention to the forms of courtesy, as for that chivalrous courage which, only two short years afterwards, induced him to throw away his life on the plains of Abraham. Duncan, in turning his eyes from the malign expression of Maqua, suffered them to rest with pleasure on the smiling and polished features, and the noble military air of the French general. Monsieur, said the latter, J'ai beaucoup de plaisir à... Bah, où est interprète? Je crois, monsieur, qu'il ne serait pas nécessaire. Hayward modestly replied, J'ai pardon pour français. Ah, oh, je suis bien ici, said Montcalm, taking Duncan familiarly by the arm, and leading him deep into the marquee, a little out of earshot. Tu je déteste ces prouveurs-là. On s'en jamais sur quel pied elle a vécu. Eh bien, monsieur. He continued, still speaking in French, Though I should have been proud of receiving your commandant, I am very happy that he has seen proper to employ an officer so distinguished, and who, I am sure, is so amiable as yourself. Duncan bowed low, pleased with the compliment, in spite of a most heroic determination to suffer no artifice to allure him into forgetfulness of the interest of his prince and Montcalm, after a pause of a moment, as if to collect his thoughts, proceeded. Your commandant is a brave man, and well qualified to repel my assault. My monsieur, is it not time to make more counsel of humanity, and less of your courage? The one has strongly characterized the hero as the other. We consider the qualities as inseparable, returned Duncan, smiling. But while we find in the vigor of your excellency every motive to stimulate the one, we can as yet see no particular call for the exercise of the other. Montcalm in his turn slightly bowed, but it was with the air of a man too practiced to remember the language of flattery. After musing a moment, he added, It is possible my glasses have deceived me, and that your works resist our cannon better than I had supposed? You know our force? Our accounts vary, said Duncan carelessly. The highest, however, has not exceeded twenty thousand men. The Frenchman bit his lip, and fastened his eyes keenly on the other, as if to read his thoughts. Then, 
with a readiness peculiar to himself, he continued, as if assenting to the truth of an enumeration which quite doubled his army. It is a poor compliment to the vigilance of us soldiers, Monsieur, that do what we will, we never can conceal our numbers. If it were to be done at all, one would believe it might succeed in these woods. Though you think it too soon to listen to the calls of humanity, he added, smiling archly, I may be permitted to believe that gallantry is not forgotten by one so young as yourself. The daughters of the Commandant, I learn, have passed into the fort since it was invested? It is true, Monsieur, but so far from weakening our efforts, they set us an example of courage in their own fortitude, were nothing but resolution necessary to repel so accomplished a soldier as M. de Macomb. I would gladly trust the defense of William Henry to the elder of those ladies. We have a wise ordinance in our Salique laws which says, The crown of France shall never degrade the lance of the distaff, said Montcalm dryly and with a little hauteur, but instantly adding with his former frank and easy air, As all the nobler qualities are hereditary, I can easily credit you, though, as I said before, courage has its limits, and humanity must not be forgotten. I trust, Monsieur, you come authorized to treat for a surrender of the place? Has your Excellency found our defense so feeble as to believe the measure necessary? I would be sorry to have the defense protracted in such a manner as to irritate my red friends there, continued Montcalm, glancing his eyes at the group of grave and attentive Indians, without attending to the other's questions. I find it difficult, even now, to limit them to the usages of war. Hayward was silent, for a painful recollection of the dangers he had so recently escaped came over his mind, and recalled the images of those defenseless beings who had shared in all his sufferings. "'C'est monsieur là,' said Montcalm, following up the advantage which he conceived he had gained, "'are most formidable when baffled, and it is unnecessary to tell you with what difficulty they are restrained in their anger. Eh bien, monsieur, shall we speak of the terms? I fear your excellency has been deceived as to the strength of William Henry and the resources of its garrison. I have not sat down before Quebec but an earthenwork that is defended by twenty-three hundred gallant men, was the laconic reply. Our mounds are earthen, certainly, nor are they seated on the rocks of Cape Diamond. But they stand on that shore which proved so destructive to Descau and his army. There is also a powerful force within a few hours' march of us, which we account upon as part of our means. Some six or eight thousand men, returned Montcalm, with much apparent indifference, whom their leader wisely judges to be safer in their works than in the field. It was now Hayward's turn to bite his lip with vexation as the other so coolly alluded to a force which the young man knew to be overrated. Both mused a little while in silence, when Montcalm renewed the conversation in a way that showed he believed the visit of his guest was solely to propose terms of capitulation. On the other hand, Hayward began to throw sundry inducements in the way of the French general, to betray the discoveries he had made through the intercepted letter. The artifice of neither, however, seceded, and after a protracted and fruitless interview, Duncan took his leave, favorably impressed with an opinion of the courtesy and talents of the enemy's captain, but as ignorant of what he came to learn as when he arrived. Montcalm followed him as far as the entrance of the Marquis, renewing his invitations to the Commandant of the Fort to give him an immediate meeting in the open ground between the two armies. There they separated, and Duncan returned to the advanced post of the French, accompanied as before, whence he instantly proceeded to the fort and to the quarters of his own commander. End of chapter 15 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the autumn of 2007.
Chapter 16 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 16 Quote EDG Before you fight the battle, Ope this letter. Unquote. From Lear. Major Hayward found Monroe attended only by his daughters. Alice sat upon his knee, parting the gray hairs of the forehead of the old man with her delicate fingers, and whenever he affected to frown on her trifling, appeasing his assumed anger by pressing her ruby lips fondly on his wrinkled brow. Cora was seated nigh them a calm and amused looker-on, regarding the wayward movements of her more youthful sister with that species of maternal fondness which characterized her love for Alice. Not only the dangers through which they had passed, but those which still impended above them, appeared to be momentarily forgotten in the soothing indulgence of such a family meeting. It seemed as if they had profited by the short truce to devote an instant to the purest and best affection, the daughters forgetting their fears, and the veteran his cares, in the security of the moment. Of this scene Duncan, who in his eagerness to report his arrival, had entered unannounced, stood many moments an unobserved and a delighted spectator. But the quick and dancing eyes of Alice soon caught a glimpse of his figure, reflected from a glass, and she sprang blushing from her father's knee exclaiming aloud, "'Major Hayward! What of the lad?' demanded her father. "'I have sent him to crack a little with the Frenchman. "'Ah, sir, you are young, and you are nimble. "'Away with ye, ye baggage, "'as if there were not troubles enough for a soldier "'without having his camp filled with such prattling hussies as yourself.' "'Alice laughingly followed her sister.' who instantly led the way from an apartment where she perceived their presence was no longer desirable. Monroe, instead of demanding the result of the young man's mission, paced the room for a few moments with his hands behind his back and his head inclined toward the floor, like a man lost in thought. At length he raised his eyes, glistening with a father's fondness, and exclaimed, "'They are a pair of excellent girls, Hayward!' and such as any one may boast of. You are not now to learn my opinion of your daughters, Colonel Monroe. True, lad, true, interrupted the impatient old man. You were about opening your mind more fully on that matter the day you got in, but I did not think it becoming in an old soldier to be talking of nuptial blessings and wedding jokes when the enemies of his king were likely to be unbidden guests at the feast. But I was wrong, Duncan, boy. I was wrong there, and I am now ready to hear what you have to say. Notwithstanding the pleasure your assurance gives me, dear sir, I have just now a message from Montcalm. Let the Frenchman and all his host go to the devil, sir, exclaimed the hasty veteran. He is not yet master of William Henry, nor shall he ever be provided Webb proves himself the man he should. No, sir, thank heaven we are not yet in such a strait that it can be said Monroe is too much pressed to discharge the little domestic duties of his own family. Your mother was the only child of my bosom friend, Duncan, and I'll just give you a hearing, though all the knights of St. Louis were in a body at the sally port with the French saint at their head, crying to speak a word under favor. A pretty degree of knighthood, sir, is that which can be brought with sugar hogsheads. And then your two-penny marquisates? The thistle is the order for dignity and antiquity. The veritable Nemo may impun la cite of chivalry. Ye had ancestors in that degree, Duncan, and they were an ornament to the nobles of Scotland. Hayward, who perceived that his superior took a malicious pleasure 
in exhibiting his contempt for the message of the French general, was fain to humor a spleen that he knew would be short-lived. He therefore replied with as much indifference as he could assume on such a subject. My request, as you know, sir, went so far as to presume the honor of being your son. Ah, boy! You found words to make yourself very plainly comprehended. But let me ask ye, sir, have you been as intelligible to the girl? Oh, my honor, no! exclaimed Duncan warmly. There would have been an abuse of a confided trust had I taken advantage of my situation for such a purpose. Your notions are those of a gentleman, Major Hayward, and well enough in their place. But Cora Monroe is a maiden too discreet, and of a mind too elevated and improved, to need the guardianship even of a father. Cora? I, Cora. We are talking of your pretensions to Miss Monroe, are we not, sir? I, I, I was not conscious of having mentioned her name, said Duncan, stammering. And to marry whom, then? Did you wish my consent, Major Hayward? demanded the old soldier, erecting himself in the dignity of offended feeling. You have another, and not less lovely, child. Alice? exclaimed the father, in an astonishment equal to that with which Duncan had just repeated the name of her sister. Such was the direction of my wishes, sir. The young man waited in silence. The result of the extraordinary effect produced by a communication, which as it now appeared was so unexpected. For several minutes, Monroe paced the chamber with long and rapid strides, his rigid features working convulsively, and every faculty seemingly absorbed in the musings of his own mind. At length, he paused directly in front of Hayward, and riveting his eyes upon those of the other, he said, with a lip that quivered violently, Duncan Hayward, I have loved you for the sake of him whose blood is in your veins. I have loved you for your own good qualities, and I have loved you because I thought you would contribute to the happiness of my child. But all this love would turn to hatred, were I assured that what I so much apprehend is true. God forbid that any act or thought of mine should lead to such a change, exclaimed the young man, whose eye never quailed under the penetrating look it encountered, without adverting to the impossibility of the other's comprehending those feelings which were hid in his own bosom. Monroe suffered himself to be appeased by the unaltered countenance he met, and with a voice sensibly softened, he continued, "'Ye would be my son, Duncan, and you're ignorant of the history the man you wish to call your father?' Sit ye down, young man, and I will open to you the wounds of a sacred heart, in as few words as may be suitable. By this time the message of Montcalm was as much forgotten by him who bore it as by the man for whose ears it was intended. Each drew a chair, and while the veteran communed a few moments with his own thoughts, apparently in sadness, the youth suppressed his impatience in a look and attitude of respectful attention. At length the former spoke. You know already, Major Hayward, that my family was both ancient and honorable, commenced the Scotsman, though it might not altogether be endowed with that amount of wealth that should correspond with its degree. I was, maybe, such an one as yourself, when I plighted my faith to Alice Graham, the only child of a neighboring laird of some estate. But the connection was disagreeable to her father, on more accounts than my poverty. I did, therefore, what an honest man should, restored the maiden her troth, and departed the country in the service of my king. I had seen many regions and had shed much blood in different lands, before duty called me to the islands of the West Indies. There it was my lot to form a connection with one who in time 
became my wife, and the mother of Cora. She was the daughter of a gentleman of those isles, by a lady whose misfortune it was, if you will, said the old man proudly, to be descended remotely from that unfortunate class who are so basely enslaved to administer to the wants of a luxurious people. I, sir, that is a curse entailed on Scotland by her unnatural union with a foreign and trading people. But could I find a man among them who would dare to reflect on my child? He should feel the weight of a father's anger. Ha! Major Hayward, you are yourself born at the South where these unfortunate beings are considered of a race inferior to your own. "'Tis most unfortunately true, sir," said Duncan, unable any longer to prevent his eyes from sinking to the floor in embarrassment. "'And you cast it on my child as a reproach? You scorn to mingle the blood of the Haywards with one so degraded, lovely and virtuous though she be? fiercely demanded the jealous parent. "'Heaven protect me from a prejudice so unworthy of my reason,' returned Duncan, at the same time conscious of such a feeling, and that as deeply rooted as if it had been engrafted in his nature. "'The sweetness, the beauty, the witchery of your younger daughter, Colonel Monroe, might explain my motives, without imputing to me this injustice.' "'Ye are right, sir,' returned the old man, again changing his tones to those of gentleness, or rather softness. "'The girl is the image of what her mother was at her years, and before she had become acquainted with grief. When death deprived me of my wife, I returned to Scotland, enriched by the marriage. And would you think it, Duncan? The suffering angel had remained— in the heartless state of celibacy, twenty long years, and that for the sake of a man who could forget her. She did more, sir. She overlooked my want of faith, and all difficulties being now removed, she took me for her husband. And became the mother of Alice, exclaimed Duncan with an eagerness that might have proved dangerous at a moment when the thoughts of Monroe were less occupied than at present. She did indeed, said the old man, and dearly did she pay for the blessing she bestowed. But she is a saint in heaven, sir, and it ill becomes one whose foot rests on the grave to mourn a lot so blessed. I had her but a single year, though, a short term of happiness for one who had seen her youth fade in hopeless pining. There was something so commanding in the distress of the old man that Hayward did not dare to venture a syllable of consolation. Monroe sat utterly unconscious of the other's presence, his features exposed and working with the anguish of his regrets, while heavy tears fell from his eyes and rolled unheeded from his cheeks to the floor. At length he moved, and as if suddenly recovering his recollection, when he arose, and taking a single turn across the room, he approached his companion with an air of military grandeur and demanded, "'Have ye not, Major Hayward, some communication that I should hear from the Marquis de Malcolm?' Duncan started in his turn and immediately commenced in an embarrassed voice the half-forgotten message. It is unnecessary to dwell upon the evasive though polite manner with which the French general had eluded every attempt of Hayward to worm from him the purport of the communication he had proposed making or on the decided though still polished message by which he now gave his enemy to understand that unless he chose to receive it in person, he should not receive it at all. As Munro listened to the detail of Duncan, the excited feelings of the father gradually gave way before the obligations of his station, and when the other was done, he saw before him nothing but the veteran, swelling with the wounded feelings of a soldier. 
"'Ye have said enough, Major Hayward," exclaimed the angry old man. "'Enough to make a volume of commentary on French civility. "'Here has this gentleman invited me to a conference, "'and when I sent him a capable substitute, "'figure all that, Duncan, though your years be but few. "'He answers me with a riddle.' "'Ye may have thought less favorably of the substitute, my dear sir, "'and you will remember that the invitation, which he now repeats, "'was to the commandant of the works, and not to his second. "'Well, sir, is not a substitute clothed with all the power and dignity "'of him who grants the commission? "'He wishes to confer with Monroe? "'Faith, sir, I have much inclination to indulge the man.' if it should only be to let him behold the firm countenance we maintain, in spite of his numbers and his summons. There might not be bad policy in such a stroke, young man. Duncan, who believed it of the last importance, that they should speedily come to the contents of the letter borne by the scout, gladly encouraged this idea. Without a doubt, he could gather no confidence by witnessing our indifference he said. You never said a truer word. I could wish, sir, that he would visit the works in open day, and in the forum of a storming party. That is the least failing method of proving the countenance of an enemy, and would be far preferable to the battering system he has chosen. But the beauty and manliness of warfare has been much deformed, Major Hayward, by the arts of Monsieur Vauban. Our ancestors were far above such scientific cowardice. It may be very true, sir, but we are now obliged to repel art by art. What is your pleasure in the matter of the interview? I will meet the Frenchman, and that without fear or delay. Promptly, sir as becomes a servant of my royal master. Go, Major Hayward, and give them a flourish of the music, and send out a messenger, to let them know who is coming. We will follow with a small guard, for such respect is due to one who holds the honor of his king in keeping. And harky, Duncan, he added in a half-whisper, though they were alone, it may be prudent to have some aid at hand in case there should be treachery at the bottom of it all. The young man availed himself of this order to quit the apartment, and as the day was fast coming to a close, he hastened, without delay, to make the necessary arrangements. A very few minutes, only where necessary to pray to few files, and to dispatch an orderly with a flag to announce the approach of the commandant of the fort. When Duncan had done both these, he led the guard to the sally port, near which he found his superior, ready, waiting his appearance. As soon as the usual ceremonials of a military departure were observed, the veteran and his more youthful companion left the fortress, attended by the escort. They had proceeded only a few hundred yards from the works, when the little array which attended the French general to the conference was seen issuing from a hollow way which formed the bed of a brook, that ran between the batteries of the besiegers and the fort. From the moment that Monroe left his own works to appear in front of his enemies, his air had been grand, and his step and countenance highly military. The instant he caught a glimpse of the white plume that waved in the hat of Montcalm, his eye lighted, and age no longer appeared to possess any influence over his vast, and steel muscular person. "'Speak to the boys to be watchful, sir,' he said in an undertone to Duncan, "'and to look well to their flints and steel, "'for one is never safe with a servant of these Louis. "'At the same time we shall show them the front of men in deep security. "'You'll understand me, Major Hayward.' "'He was interrupted by the clamor of a drum from the approaching Frenchman which was immediately answered when each party pushed an orderly in advance, bearing a white flag, and the wary Scotsman halted with his guard close at his back. As soon as this slight salutation had passed, 
Montcalm moved toward them with a quick but graceful step, bearing his head to the veteran, and dropping his spotless plume neatly to the earth in courtesy. If the air of Monroe was more commanding and manly, it wanted both the ease and insinuating polish of that of the Frenchman. Neither spoke for a few moments, each regarding the other with curious and interested eyes. Then, as became his superior rank and the nature of the interview, Montcalm broke the silence. After uttering the usual words of greeting, he turned to Duncan, and continued with a smile of recognition, speaking always in French. "'I am rejoiced, Monsieur, that you have given us the pleasure of your company on this occasion. There will be no necessity to employ an ordinary interpreter, for in your hands I feel the same security as if I spoke your language myself.' Duncan acknowledged the compliment, when, Montcalm turning to his guard, which in imitation of that of their enemies, pressed close upon him, continued. And Henri, my savants, il fall child, retirez, bo on peu. Before Major Hayward could imitate this proof of confidence, he glanced his eyes around the plain, and beheld with uneasiness the numerous dusky groups of savages, who looked out from the margin of the surrounding woods, curious spectators of the interview. Monsieur de Montcalm, will readily acknowledge the difference in our situation, he said with some embarrassment, pointing at the same time toward those dangerous foes, who were to be seen in almost every direction. Were we to dismiss our guard, we should stand here at the mercy of our enemies. Monsieur, you have the plighted faith of un gentle home francais. For your safety, returned Montcalm, laying his hand impressively on his heart. It should suffice. It shall fall back, Duncan added to the officer who led the escort. Fall back, sir, beyond hearing, and wait for orders. Monroe witnessed this movement with manifest uneasiness. Nor did he fail to demand an instant explanation. Is it not our interest, sir, to betray distrust? retorted Duncan. Monsieur de Montcalm pledges his word for our safety and I have ordered the men to withdraw a little, in order to prove how much we depend on his assurance. It may be all right, sir, but I have no overwhelming reliance on the faith of these Marquesas, or Marquises as they tell themselves. Their patents of nobility are too common to be certain that they bear the seal of true honor. You forget, dear sir, that we confer with an officer, distinguished alike in Europe and America for his deeds. From a soldier of his reputation, we can have nothing to apprehend. The old man made a gesture of resignation, though his rigid features still betrayed his obstinate adherence to a distrust which he derived from a sort of hereditary contempt of his enemy, rather than from any present signs which might warrant so uncharitable a feeling. Montcalm waited patiently until this little dialogue in demi-voice was ended, when he drew nigher and opened the subject of their conference. "'I have solicited this interview from your superior, Monsieur,' he said, "'because I believe he will allow himself to be persuaded that he has already done everything which is necessary for the honour of his prince, and will now listen to the admonitions of humanity. I will forever bear testimony that his resistance has been gallant, and has continued as long as there was hope. When this opening was translated to Monroe, he answered with dignity, but with sufficient courtesy, However I may prize such testimony from Monsieur Montcalm, it will be more valuable when it shall be better merited. The French general smiled, as Duncan gave him the purport of his reply, and observed, What is so freely accorded to approve courage may be refused to useless obstinacy. Monsieur would wish to see my camp, and witness for himself our numbers, and the impossibility of his resisting them with success. 
I knew that the King of France is well served, returned the unmoved Scotsman, as soon as Duncan ended his translation. But my own royal master has as many and as faithful troops, though not at hand, fortunately for us, said Montcalm, without waiting in his ardor for the interpreter. There is destiny in war, to which a brave man knows how to submit, with the same courage that he faces his foes. Had I been conscious that Monsieur Montcalm was master of the English, I should have spared myself the trouble of so awkward a translation, said the vexed Duncan dryly, remembering instantly his recent by-play with Monroe. Your pardon, Monsieur, rejoined the Frenchman, suffering a slight color to appear in his dark cheek. There is a vast difference between understanding and speaking a foreign tongue. You will, therefore, please to assist me still? Then, after a short pause, he added, These hills afford us every opportunity of reconnoitering your works, messieurs, and I am possibly as well acquainted with their weak condition as you can be yourselves. Ask the French general if he has glasses to reach the Hudson, said Monroe proudly, and if he knows when and where to expect the army of Webb. Let General Webb be his own interpreter, returned the politic Montcalm, suddenly extending an open letter toward Monroe as he spoke. You will there learn, Monsieur, that his movements are not likely to prove embarrassing to my army. The veteran seized the offered paper, without waiting for Duncan to translate the speech, and with an eagerness that betrayed how important he deemed its contents. As his eyes passed hastily over the words, his countenance changed from its look of military pride to one of deep chagrin. His lip began to quiver, and suffering the paper to fall from his hand, his head dropped upon his chest, like that of a man whose hopes were withered in a single blow. Duncan caught the letter from the ground, and without apology for the liberty he took, he read at a glance its cruel purport. Their common superior, so far from encouraging them to resist, advised a speedy surrender, urging in the plainest language as a reason the utter impossibility of his sending a single man to their rescue. "'Here is no deception!' exclaimed Duncan, examining the billet both inside and out. This is the signature of Webb, and must be the captured letter. The man has betrayed me, Monroe at length bitterly exclaimed. He has brought dishonor to the door of one where disgrace has never before known to dwell, and shame has he reaped heavily on my gray hairs. Say not so, cried Duncan. We are yet masters of the fort, and of our honor. Let us then sell our lives at such a rate as shall make our enemies believe the purchase too dear. Boy, I thank thee, exclaimed the old man, rousing himself from his stupor. You have for once reminded Monroe of his duty. We will go back and dig our graves behind those ramparts. Messieurs, said Montcalm, advancing toward them a step in generous interest. You little know, Louis de Saint. Velan, if you believe him capable of profiting by this letter to humble brave men, or to build up a dishonest reputation for himself, listen to my terms before you leave me. What says the Frenchman? demanded the veteran sternly. Does he make a merit of having captured a scout with a note from headquarters? Sir, he had better raise this siege to go and sit before Edward, if he wishes to frighten his enemy with words. Duncan explained the other's meaning. Monsieur Montcalm, we will hear you, the veteran added more calmly as Duncan ended. To retain the fort is now impossible, said his liberal enemy. It is necessary, in the interest of my master, that it should be destroyed. But as for yourself and your brave comrades, there is no privilege, dear a soldier, that shall be denied. Our colors? demanded Hayward. 
carry them to England, and show them to your king. Our arms? Keep them. None can use them better. Our march? The surrender of the place? Shall be done in a way most honorable to yourselves. Duncan now turned to explain these proposals to his commander, who heard them with amazement, and a sensibility that was deeply touched by so unusual and unexpected generosity. "'Go, you, Duncan,' he said. "'Go with this Marquis, as indeed Marquis he should be. Go to his Marquis and arrange it all. I have lived to see two things in my old age that never did I expect to behold.' An Englishman, afraid to support a friend, and a Frenchman, too honest to profit by his advantage. So saying, the veteran again dropped his head to his chest, and returned slowly toward the fort, exhibiting by the dejection of his air to the anxious garrison, a harbinger of evil tidings. From the shock of this unexpected blow, the haughty feelings of Monroe never recovered. But from that moment there commenced a change in his determined character, which accompanied him to a speedy grave. Duncan remained to settle the terms of the capitulation. He was seen to re-enter the works during the first watches of the night, and immediately, after a private conference with the commandant, to leave them again. It was then openly announced that hostilities must cease. Monroe having signed a treaty by which the place was to be yielded to the enemy with the morning, the garrison to retain their arms, the colors, and their baggage, and consequently, according to military opinion, their honor. End of chapter 16 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the autumn of 2007 Chapter 17 of the Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 17 Quote, Weave the woof, the thread is spun, the web is wove, the work is done. Unquote, by Gray. The hostile armies which lay in the wilds of the Horican passed the night of the ninth of August, 1757, much in the manner they would had they encountered on the fairest field of Europe, while the conquered were still, sullen, and dejected. The victors triumphed. But there are limits alike to grief and joy. And long before the watches of the morning came, the stillness of those boundless woods was only broken by a gay call from some exulting young Frenchman of the advanced pickets, or a menacing challenge from the fort, which sternly forbade the approach of any hostile footsteps before the stipulated moment. Even these occasional threatening sounds ceased to be heard in that dull hour which precedes the day at which period a listener might have sought in vain any evidence of the presence of those armed powers that then slumbered on the shores of the holy lake. It was during these moments of deep silence that the canvas which concealed the entrance to a spacious marquee in the French encampment was shoved aside, and a man issued from beneath a drapery into the open air. He was enveloped in a cloak which might have been intended as a protection from the chilling damps of the woods, but which served equally well as a mantle to conceal his person. He was permitted to pass the grenadier, who watched over the slumbers of the French commander, without interruption, the man making the usual salute which betokens military deference, as the other passed swiftly through the little city of tents, in the direction of William Henry. Whenever this unknown individual encountered one of the numberless sentinels who crossed his path. His answer was prompt, and, as it appeared, satisfactory, for he was uniformly allowed to proceed without further interrogation. With the exception of such repeated but brief interruptions, 
he had moved silently from the center of the camp to its most advanced outpost, when he drew nigh the soldier who held his watch nearest to the works of the enemy. As he approached, he was received with the usual challenge. Que vivez? Francais, was the reply. Le mot d'ordre. Le victory, said the other, drawing so nigh as to be heard in a loud whisper. C'est bien, returned the sentinel, throwing his musket from the charge to his shoulder. Vos promenades bien mentit, monsieur. Il est nécessaire d'être vigilant, mon enfant, the other observed, dropping a fold of his cloak, and looking the soldier close in the face as he passed him, still continuing his way toward the British fortification. The man started. His arms rattled heavily as he threw them forward in the lowest and most respectful salute, and when he had again recovered his peace, he turned to walk his post, muttering between his teeth, Fant de traitor vigilant in verite, je crois que nous avons la old corporal qui ne dort jamais. The officer proceeded without affecting to hear the words which escaped the sentinel in his surprise. Nor did he again pause until he had reached the low strand and in a somewhat dangerous vicinity to the western water bastion of the fort. The light of an obscure moon was just sufficient to render objects, though dim, perceptible in their outlines. He therefore took the precaution to place himself against the trunk of a tree, where he leaned for many minutes, and seemed to contemplate the dark and silent mounds of the English works in profound attention. His gaze at the ramparts was not that of a curious or idle spectator but his looks wandered from point to point, denoting his knowledge of military usages, and betraying that his search was not unaccompanied by distrust. At length he appeared satisfied, and having cast his eyes impatiently upward toward the summit of the eastern mountain, as if anticipating the approach of the morning, he was in the act of turning on his footsteps, when a light sound on the nearest angle of the bastion caught his ear, and induced him to remain. Just then, a figure was seen to approach the edge of the rampart, where it stood, apparently contemplating in its turn the distant tents of the French encampment. Its head was then turned toward the east, as though equally anxious for the appearance of light, when the form leaned against the mound, and seemed to gaze upon the glassy expanse of the waters, which, like a submarine firmament, glittered with its thousand mimic stars. The melancholy air, the hour, together with the vast frame of the man who thus leaned, musing against the English ramparts, left no doubt as to his person in the mind of the observant spectator. Delicacy, no less than prudence, now urged him to retire, and he had moved cautiously round the body of the tree for that purpose, when another sound drew his attention and once more arrested his footsteps. It was a low and almost inaudible movement of the water, and was succeeded by a grating of pebbles, one against the other. In a moment he saw a dark form rise, as it were, out of the lake, and steal without further noise to the land, within a few feet of the place where he himself stood. A rifle next slowly rose between his eyes and the watery mirror. But before it could be discharged, his own hand was on the lock. Who? <gasps> exclaimed the savage, whose treacherous aim was so singularly and unexpectedly interrupted. Without making any reply, the French officer laid his hand on the shoulder of the Indian, and led him in profound silence to a distance from the spot, where their subsequent dialogue might have proved dangerous, and where it seemed that one of them, at least, sought a victim. Then, throwing open his cloak, so as to expose his uniform and the cross of St. Louis, which was suspended at his breast, Montcalm sternly demanded, What means this? Does my son not know that the hatchet is buried between the English and his Canadian father? What can the Hurons do? returned the savage, speaking also, though imperfectly, in the French language. Not a warrior has a scalp 
and the pale faces make friends? Ha, oh, le Renard subtil. Methinks this is an excess of zeal for a friend, who was so late an enemy. How many suns have set since Le Renard struck the war post of the English? Where is that sun? demanded the sullen savage. Behind the hill, and it is dark and cold, but when he comes again it will be bright and warm. Le Subtil is the son of his tribe. There have been clouds and many mountains between him and his nation. But now he shines, and it is a clear sky. The Renard has power with his people, I well know, said Montcalm. For yesterday he hunted for their scalps, and today they hear him at the council fire. Magua is a great chief. Let him prove it by teaching his nation how to conduct themselves toward our new friends. Why did the chief of the Canadas bring this young man into the woods and fire his cannon at the earthen house? demanded the subtle Indian. To subdue it. My master owns the land, and your father was ordered to drive off these English squatters. They have consented to go, and now he calls them enemies no longer. Tis well Marqua took the hatchet to color it with blood. It is now bright. When it is red, it shall be buried. But Mokwe is pledged not to sully the lilies of France. The enemies of the great king across the salt lake are his enemies. His friends, the friends of the Hurons. Friends? repeated the Indian in scorn. Let his father give Mokwe a hand. Montcalm, who felt that his influence over the warlike tribes he had gathered, was to be maintained by concession rather than by power, complied reluctantly with the other's request. The savage placed the fingers of the French commander on a deep scar in his bosom, and then exultantly demanded, Does my father know that? What warrior does not? Tis where a leaden bullet has cut. And this, continued the Indian, who had turned his naked back to the other, his body being without its usual calico mantle. This, my son, has been sadly injured here. Who has done this? Magua slept hard in the English wigwams, and the sticks have left their mark, returned the savage with a hollow laugh, which did not conceal the fierce temper which nearly choked him. Then, recollecting himself with a sullen and native dignity, he added, Go teach your young man at his peace. Le Renard Subtil knows how to speak to a Huron warrior. Without deigning to bestow further words, or to wait for any answer, the savage cast his rifle in, into the hollow of his arm, and moved silently through the encampment toward the woods where his own tribe was known to lie. Every few yards as he proceeded, he was challenged by the sentinels, but he stalked sullenly onward utterly disregarding the summons of the soldiers, who only spared his life because they knew the air and tread no less than the obstinate daring of an Indian. Montcalm lingered long and melancholy on the stand where he had been left by his companion, brooding deeply on the temper which his ungovernable ally had just discovered. Already had his fair fame been tarnished by one horrid scene, and in circumstances fearfully resembling those under which he now found himself. As he mused, he became keenly sensible of the deep responsibility they assume, who disregard the means to attain an end, and of all the danger of setting in motion an engine which exceeds human power to control. Then, shaking off a train of reflection, which he accounted a weakness in such a moment of triumph, he retraced his steps toward his tent, giving the order as he passed to make the signal that should arouse the army from its slumbers. The first tap of the French drums was echoed from the bosom of the fort, and presently the valley was filled with the strains of martial music, rising long, thrilling, and lively above the rattling accompaniment. The horns of the victors sounded merry and cheerful flourishes until the last laggard of the camp was at his post. But the instant 
the British fifes had blown their shrill signal, they became mute. In the meantime the day had dawned, and when the line of the French army was ready to receive its general, the rays of a brilliant sun were glancing along the glittering array. Then that success, which was already so well known, was officially announced. The favored band who were selected to guard the gates of the fort were detailed, and defiled before their chief. The signal of their approach was given, and all the usual preparations for a change of masters were ordered and executed, directly under the guns of the contested works. A very different scene presented itself within the lines of the Anglo-American army. As soon as the warning signal was given, it exhibited all the signs of a hurried and forced departure. The sullen soldiers shouldered their empty tubes and fell into their places, like men whose blood had been heated by the past contest, and who only desired the opportunity to revenge an indignity which was still wounding to their pride, concealed, as it was, under the observances of military etiquette. Women and children ran from place to place, some bearing the scanty remnants of their baggage, and others searching in the ranks for those countenances they looked up to for protection. Monroe appeared among his silent troops, firm but dejected. It was evident that the unexpected blow had struck deep into his heart, though he struggled to sustain his misfortune with the port of a man. Duncan was touched at the quiet and impressive exhibition of his grief. He had discharged his own duty, and he now pressed to the side of the old man to know in what particular he might serve him. "'My daughters,' was the brief but expressive reply. "'Good heavens! Are not arrangements already made for their convenience?' "'Today I am only a soldier, Major Hayward,' said the veteran. "'All that you see here?' Claim I like to be my children. Duncan had heard enough. Without losing one of those moments, which had now become so precious, he flew toward the quarters of Monroe in quest of the sisters. He found them on the threshold of the low edifice, already prepared to depart, and surrounded by a clamorous and weeping assemblage of their own sex, who had gathered about the place with a sort of instinctive consciousness that it was the point most likely to be protected. Though the cheeks of Cora were pale, and her countenance anxious, she had lost none of her firmness. But the eyes of Alice were inflamed, and betrayed how long and bitterly she had wept. They both, however, received the young man with undisguised pleasure, the former, for a novelty, being the first to speak. "'The fort is lost,' she said with a melancholy smile. Though our good name, I trust, remains. "'Tis brighter than ever. But, dearest Miss Monroe, it is time to think less of others, and to make some provision for yourself. Military usage, pride, that pride on which you so much value yourself, demands that your father and I should for a little while continue with the troops. Then, where to seek a proper protector for you, against the confusion and chances of such a scene? None is necessary, returned Cora. Who would dare to injure or insult the daughter of such a father at a time like this? I would not leave you alone, continued the youth, looking about him in a hurried manner, for the command of the best regiment in the pay of the king. Remember. Our Alice is not gifted with all your firmness, and God only knows the terrors she might endure. You may be right, Cora replied, smiling again, but far more sadly than before. Listen, chance has already sent us a friend when he is most needed. Duncan did listen, and on the instant comprehended her meaning. The low and serious sounds of the sacred music so well known to the eastern provinces, caught his ear, and instantly drew him to an apartment in an adjacent building, which had already been deserted by its customary tenants. There he found David pouring out his pious feelings through the only medium in which he ever indulged. Duncan waited 
until by the cessation of the movement of the hand he believed the strain was ended, when, by touching his shoulder, he drew the attention of the other to himself, and in a few words explained his wishes. "'Even so,' replied the single-minded disciple of the King of Israel, when the young man had ended, "'I have found much that is comely and melodious in the maidens, and it is fitting that we who have consorted in so much peril should abide together in peace. I will attend them, when I have completed my morning praise, to which nothing is now wanting but the doxology. Will thou bear a part, friend? The meter is common, and the tune south well. Then extending the little volume, and giving the pitch of the air anew, with considerate attention, David then extending the little volume, and giving the pitch of the air anew, with considerate attention, David recommenced and finished his strains, with a fixedness of manner that is not easy to interrupt. Hayward was fain to wait until the verse was ended, when seeing David relieving himself from the spectacles, and replacing the book, he continued, It will be your duty to see that none dare approach the ladies with any rude intention or to offer insult, or to taunt at the misfortune of their brave father. In this task you will be seconded by the domestics of their household. Even so, it is possible that the Indians and stragglers of the enemy may intrude, in which case you will remind them of the terms of the capitulation, and threaten to report their conduct to Montcalm. A word will suffice. If not... I have that here which shall, returned David, exhibiting his book with an air in which meekness and confidence were singularly blended. Here are words which uttered, or rather thundered, with proper emphasis, and in measured time, shall quiet the most unruly temper. Why rage the heathen furiously? Enough, said Hayward, interrupting the burst of his musical invocation. We understand each other. It is time that we should now assume our respective duties. Camut cheerfully assented, and together they sought the females. Cora received her new and somewhat extraordinary protector courteously, at least, and even the pallid features of Alice lighted again with some of their native archness, as she thanked Hayward for his care. Duncan took occasion to assure them he had done the best that circumstances permitted, and, as he believed, quite enough for the security of their feelings. Of danger there was none. He then spoke gladly of his intention to rejoin them the moment he had led the advance a few miles toward the Hudson, and immediately took his leave. By this time the signal for departure had been given, and the head of the English column was in motion. The sisters started at the sound, and glancing their eyes around, they saw the white uniforms of the French grenadiers, who had already taken possession of the gates of the fort. At that moment an enormous cloud seemed to pass suddenly above their heads, and looking upward, they discovered they stood beneath the wide folds of the standard of France. "'Let us go,' said Cora. "'This is no longer a fit place for the children of an English officer.' Alice clung to the arm of her sister, and together they left the parade, accompanied by the moving throng that surrounded them. As they passed the gates, the French officers who had learned their rank bowed often and low, forbearing, however, to intrude those attentions, which they saw with peculiar tact, might not be agreeable. As every vehicle and each beast of burden was occupied by the sick and wounded. Cora had decided to endure the fatigues of a foot-march, rather than interfere with their comforts. Indeed, many a maimed and feeble soldier was compelled to drag his exhausted limbs in the rear of the columns, for the want of the necessary means of conveyance in that wilderness. The whole, however, was in motion, the weak and wounded groaning and in suffering, their comrades silent and sullen, and the woman and children in terror, they knew not of what. As the confused and timid throng left the protecting mounds of the fort, 
and issued on the open plain. The whole scene was at once presented to their eyes. At a little distance on the right, and somewhat in the rear, the French army stood to their arms, Montcalm having collected his party so soon as his guard had possession of the works. They were attentive but silent observers of the proceedings of the vanquished, failing in none of the stipulated military honors, and offering no taunt or insult in their success to the less fortunate foes. Living masses of the English, to the amount in the whole of near three thousand, were moving slowly across the plain, toward the common center, and gradually approached each other, as they converged to the point of their march, a vista cut through the lofty trees, where the road to the Hudson entered the forest. Along the sweeping borders of the woods hung a dark cloud of savages, eyeing the passage of their enemies, and hovering at a distance like vultures, who are only kept from swooping on their prey by the presence and restraint of a superior army. A few had straggled among the conquered columns, where they stalked in sullen discontent, attentive though, as yet, passive observers of the moving multitude. The advance, with Hayward at its head, had already reached the defile, and was slowly disappearing when the attention of Cora was drawn to a collection of stragglers by the sounds of contention. A truant provincial was paying the forfeit of his disobedience by being plundered of those very effects which had caused him to desert his place in the ranks. The man was of powerful frame, and too avaricious to part with his goods without a struggle. Individuals from either party interfered, the one side to prevent, and the other to aid in the robbery. Voices grew loud and angry, and a hundred savages appeared, as it were, by magic, where a dozen only had been seen a minute before. It was then that Cora saw the form of Magua, gliding among his countrymen, and speaking with his fatal and artful eloquence. The mass of women and children stopped, and hovered together like alarmed and fluttering birds. But the cupidity of the Indian was soon gratified and the different bodies again moved slowly onward. The savages now fell back, and seemed content to let their enemies advance, without further molestation. But as the female crowd approached them, the gaudy colors of a shawl attracted the eyes of a wild and untutored Huron. He advanced to seize it without the least hesitation. The woman, more in terror than through love of the ornament, wrapped her child in the coveted article, and folded both more closely to her bosom. Cora was in the act of speaking, with an intent to advise the woman to abandon the trifle, when the savage relinquished his hold on the shawl, and tore the screaming infant from her arms. Abandoning everything to the greedy grasp of those around her, the mother darted, with distraction of her mien, to reclaim her child. The Indian smiled grimly and extended one hand in sign of a willingness to exchange, while with the other he flourished the babe over his head, holding it by the feet, as if to enhance the value of the ransom. "'Here, here, there, oh, any, everything!' exclaimed the breathless woman, tearing the lighter articles of dress from her person with ill-directed and trembling fingers. "'Take all, but give me my babe!' The savage spurned the worthless rags, and perceiving that the shawl had already become a prize to another, his bantering but sullen smile, changing to a gleam of ferocity, he dashed the head of the infant against a rock and cast its quivering remains to our very feet. For an instant the mother stood, like a statue of despair, looking wildly down at the unseemly object which had so lately nestled in her bosom and smiled in her face. And then she raised her eyes and countenance toward heaven, as if calling on God to curse the perpetrator of the foul deed. She was spared the sin of such a prayer, for maddened at his disappointment and excited at the sight of blood, the Huron mercifully drove his tomahawk into her own brain. The mother sank under the blow and fell, grasping at her child in death, with the same engrossing love that had caused her to cherish it when living. 
At that dangerous moment, Malqua placed his hands to his mouth and raised the fatal and appalling hoop. The scattered Indians started at the well-known cry, as coursers bound at the signal to quit the goal, and directly there arose such a yell along the plain and through the arches of the wood as seldom burst from human lips before. They who heard it listened with a curdling horror at the heart, little inferior to that dread which may be expected to attend the blast of the final summons. More than two thousand raving savages broke from the forest at the signal, and threw themselves across the fatal plain with instinctive alacrity. We shall not dwell on the revolting horrors that succeeded. Death was everywhere, and in his most terrific and disgusting aspects. Resistance only seemed to inflame the murderers, who inflicted their furious blows long after their victims were beyond the power of their resentment. The flow of blood might be likened to the outbreaking of a torrent, and as the natives became heated and maddened by the sight, many among them even kneeled to the earth and drank freely, exultingly, hellishly of the crimson tide. The trained bodies of the troops threw themselves quickly into solid masses, endeavoring to awe their assailants by the imposing appearance of a military front. The experiment in some measure succeeded though far too many suffered their unloaded muskets to be torn from their hands in the vain hope of appeasing the savages. In such a scene, none had leisure to note the fleeting moments. It might have been ten minutes. It seemed an age that the sisters had stood riveted to one spot, horror-stricken and nearly hopeless. When the first blow was struck, their screaming companions had pressed upon them in a body, rendering flight impossible. And now that fear of death had scattered most, if not all, from around them, they saw no avenue open but such as conducted to the tomahawks of their foes. On every side arose shrieks, groans, exhortations, and curses. At this moment Alice caught a glimpse of the vast form of her father moving rapidly across the plain in the direction of the French army. He was in truth proceeding to Montcalm, fearless of any danger, to claim the tardy escort for which he had before conditioned. Fifty glittering axes and barbed spears were offered unheeded at his life, but the savages respected his rank and calmness, even in their fury. The dangerous weapons were brushed aside by the still nervous arm of the veteran, or fell of themselves after menacing an act that it would seem no one had courage to perform. Fortunately, the vindictive Mockle was searching for his victim in the very band the veteran had just quitted. "'Father! Father! We are here!' shrieked Alice as he passed at no great distance, without appearing to heed them. "'Come to us, Father, or we die!' The cry was repeated, and in terms and tones that might have melted a heart of stone. But it was unanswered. Once, indeed, the old man appeared to catch the sound, for he paused and listened but Alice had dropped senseless on the earth, and Cora had sunk at her side, hovering in untiring tenderness over her lifeless form. Monroe shook his head in disappointment and proceeded, bent on the high duty of his station. Lady, said Gamut, who, helpless and useless as he was, had not yet dreamed of deserting his trust. It is the jubilee of the devils, and this is not a meet place for Christians to tarry in. Let us up and fly. Go, said Cora, still gazing at her unconscious sister. Save thyself. To me thou canst not be of further use. David comprehended the unyielding character of her resolution by the single but expressive gesture that accompanied her words. He gazed for a moment at the dusky forms that were acting their hellish rites on every side of him, and his tall person grew more erect while his chest heaved and every feature swelled and seemed to speak with the power of the feelings by which he was governed. If the Jewish boy might tame the spirit of soul by the sound of his harp and the words of sacred song, it may not be amiss, he said, to try the potency of music here. Then raising his voice to its highest tone, he poured out a strain so powerful as to be heard even amid the din of that bloody field. More than one savage rushed toward them, thinking to rifle the unprotected sisters of their attire, 
and bear away their scalps. But when they found this strange and unmoved figure riveted to his post, they paused to listen. Astonishment soon changed to admiration, and they passed on to other and less courageous victims, openly expressing their satisfaction at the firmness with which the white warrior sang his death song. Encouraged and deluded by his success, David exerted all his power to extend what he believed so holy an influence. The unwanted sounds caught the ears of a distant savage, who flew raging from group to group like one who, scorning to touch the vulgar herd, hunted for some victim more worthy of his renown. It was Magua who uttered a yell of pleasure when he beheld his ancient prisoners again at his mercy. Come, he said, laying his soiled hands on the dress of Cora. The wigwam of the Huron is still open. Is it not better than this place? Away, cried Cora, veiling her eyes from his revolting aspect. The Indian laughed tauntingly as he held up his reeking hand and answered, It is red, but it comes from white veins. Monster, there is blood. Oceans of blood upon thy soul. Thy spirit has moved this scene. Magua is a great chief, returned the exulting savage. Will the hair go to his tribe? Never strike if thou wilt and complete thy revenge. He hesitated a moment, and then catching the light and senseless form of Alice in his arms, the subtle Indian moved swiftly across the plain toward the woods. Hold! shrieked Cora, following wildly in on his footsteps. Release the child wretch! What is it you do? But Makwa was deaf to her voice, or rather, he knew his power, and was determined to maintain it. Stay, lady, stay, called Gamut after the unconscious Cora. The holy charm is beginning to be felt, and soon shall thou see this horrid tumult stilled. Perceiving that, in his turn, he was unheeded, the faithful David followed the distracted sister, raising his voice again in sacred song and sweeping the air to measure with his long arm, in diligent accompaniment. In this manner they traversed the plain through the flying and wounded of the dead. The fierce Huron was at any time sufficient for himself and the victim that he bore, though Cora would have fallen more than once under the blows of her savage enemies, but for the extraordinary being who stalked in her rear and who now appeared to the astonished natives, gifted with the protected spirit of madness. Makwa, who knew how to avoid the more pressing dangers, and also to elude pursuit, entered the woods through a low ravine, where he quickly found the Narragansetts, which the travelers had abandoned so shortly before, awaiting his appearance in custody of a savage as fierce and malign in expression as himself. Laying Alice on one of the horses, he made a sign to Cora to mount the other. Notwithstanding the horror excited by the presence of her captor, there was a present relief of escaping from the bloody scene enacting on the plain, to which Cora could not be altogether insensible. She took her seat and held forth her arms for her sister, with an air of entreaty and love that even the Huron could not deny. Placing Alice, then, on the same animal with Cora, he seized the bridle, and commenced his route by plunging deeper into the forest. David, perceiving that he was left alone, utterly disregarded as a subject too worthless even to destroy, threw his long limb across the saddle of the beast they had deserted, and made such progress in the pursuit as the difficulty of the path permitted. They soon began to ascend, but as the motion had a tendency to revive the dormant faculties of her sister, the attention of Cora was too much divided between the tenderest solicitude in her behalf and in listening to the cries which were still too audible on the plain to note the direction which they journeyed. When, however, they gained the flattened surface of the mountain top and approached the eastern precipice, she recognized the spot to which she had once before been led under the more friendly auspices of the scout. Here Mokwa suffered them to dismount, and notwithstanding their own captivity, the curiosity which seems inseparable from horror induced them to gaze at the sickening sight below. The cruel work was still unchecked, 
On every side the captured were flying before the relentless persecutors, while the armed columns of the Christian king stood afast in an apathy which has never been explained, and which has left an immovable blot on the otherwise fair escutcheon of their leader. Nor was the sword of death stayed until cupidity got the mastery of revenge. Then, indeed, the shrieks of the wounded and the yells of their murderers grew less frequent, until finally the cries of horror were lost to their ear, or were drowned in the loud, long, and piercing hoops of the triumphant savages. End of chapter 17 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the autumn of 2007. Chapter 18 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 18 Quote, Why anything? An honorable murderer, if you will. For not I did in hate, but all in honor. Unquote. From Othello The bloody and inhuman scene, rather incidentally mentioned than described in the preceding chapter, is conspicuous in the pages of colonial history by the merited title of The Massacre of William Henry. It so far deepened the stain which a previous and very similar event had left upon the reputation of the French commander that it was not entirely erased by his early and glorious death. It is now becoming obscured by time, and thousands who know that Mount Calm died like a hero on the plains of Abraham have yet to learn how much he was deficient in that moral courage without which no man can be truly great. Pages might yet be written to prove from his illustrious example the defects of human excellence, to show how easy it is for generous sentiments, high courtesy, and chivalrous courage to lose their influence beneath the chilling blight of selfishness, and to exhibit to the world a man who was great in all the minor attributes of character, but who was found wanting when it became necessary to prove how much principle is superior to policy. But the task would exceed our prerogatives, and... As history, like love, is so apt to surround her heroes with an atmosphere of imaginary brightness, it is probable that Louis de saint Véran will be viewed by posterity only as the gallant defender of his country, while his cruel apathy on the shores of the Oswego and of the Horican will be forgotten. Deeply regretting this weakness on the part of a sister muse, we shall at once retire from her sacred precincts within the proper limits of our own humble vocation. The third day from the capture of the fort was drawing to a close, but the busyness of the narrative must still detain the reader on the shores of the holy lake. When last seen, the environs of the works were filled with violence and uproar. They were now possessed by stillness and death. The bloodstained conquerors had departed, and their camp, which had so lately rung with the merry rejoicings of a victorious army, lay a silent and deserted city of huts. The fortress was a smoldering ruin. Charred rafters, fragments of exploded artillery, and rent mason work, covering its earthen mounds in confused disorder. A frightful change had also occurred in the season. The sun had hid its warmth behind an impenetrable mass of vapor, and hundreds of human forms, which had blackened beneath the fierce heats of August, were stiffening in their deformity before the blast of a premature November. The curling and spotless mist, which had been sailing above the hills toward the north, were now returning to an interminable dusky sheet, which was urged along by the fury of a tempest. The crowded mirror of the hurricane was gone, and in its place the green and angry waters lashed the shores 
as if indignantly casting back its impurities to the polluted strand. Still, the clear fountain retained a portion of its charmed influence, but it reflected only the somber gloom that fell from the impending heavens. That humid and congenial atmosphere which commonly adorned the view, veiling its harshness and softening its asperities, had disappeared. The northern air poured across the waste of water so harsh and unmingled that nothing was left to be conjectured by the eye. The fiercer element had cropped the vendure of the plain, which looked as though it were scathed by a consuming lightning. But here and there a dark green tuft arose in the midst of the desolation, the earliest fruits of a soil that had been fattened with human blood. The whole landscape, which seen by a favoring light and in a genial temperature, had been so lovely, appeared now like some pictured allegory of life, in which objects were arrayed in their harshest but truest colors, and without the relief of any shadowing. The solitary and arid blades of grass arose from the passing gust, fearfully perceptible. The bold and rocky mountains were too distinct in their barrenness, and the eye even sought relief in vain by attempting to pierce the illimitable void of heaven, which was shut to its gaze by the dusky sheet of ragged and driving vapor. The wind blew unequally, sometimes sweeping heavily along the ground, seeming to whisper its moanings in the cold ears of the dead. Then, rising in a shrill and mournful whistling, it entered the forest with a rush that filled the air with the leaves and branches it scattered in its path. Amid the unnatural shower, a few hungry ravens struggled with the gale. But no sooner was the green ocean of woods which stretched beneath them passed, than they gladly stopped, at random, to their hideous bank. In short, it was a scene of wildness and desolation, and it appeared as if all who had profanely entered it had been stricken, at a blow, by the relentless arm of death. But the prohibition had ceased, and for the first time since the perpetrators of those foul deeds which had assisted to disfigure the scene were gone, living human beings had now presumed to approach the place. About an hour before the setting of the sun, on the day already mentioned, the forms of five men might have been seen issuing from the narrow vista of trees, where the path through the Hudson entered the forest, and advancing in the direction of the ruined works. At first their progress was slow and guarded, as though they entered with reluctance amid the horrors of the post or dreaded the renewal of its frightful incidents. A light figure preceded the rest of the party, with the caution and activity of a native, ascending every hillock to reconnoiter, and indicating by gestures to his companions the route he deemed it most prudent to pursue. Nor were those in the rear wanting in every caution and foresight known to forest warfare. One among them, he also was an Indian, moved a little on one flank, and watched the margin of the woods, with eyes long accustomed to read the smallest sign of danger. The remaining three were white, though clad in vestments adapted both in quality and color to their present hazardous pursuit, that of hanging on the skirts of a retiring army in the wilderness. The effects produced by the appalling sights that constantly arose in their path to the lake shore were as different as the characters of the respective individuals who composed the party. The youth in front threw serious but furtive glances at the mangled victims as he stepped lightly across the plain, afraid to exhibit his feelings, and yet too inexperienced to quell entirely their sudden and powerful influence. His red associate, however, was superior to such a weakness. He passed the groups of dead with a steadiness of purpose, and an eye so calm that nothing but long and inveterate practice could enable him to maintain. The sensations produced in the minds of even the white men were different, though uniformly sorrowful. One, whose gray locks and furrowed lineaments, blending with a martial air and tread, betrayed in spite of the disguise of a woodsman's dress a man long experienced in scenes of war was not ashamed to groan aloud whenever a spectacle of more than usual horror came under his view. 
the young man at his elbow shuddered, but seemed to suppress his feelings and tenderness to his companion. Of them all, the straggler who brought up the rear appeared alone to betray his real thoughts, without fear of observation or dread of consequences. He gazed on the most appalling sight, with eyes and muscles, that knew not how to waver, but with execrations so bitter and deep as to denote how much he denounced the crime of his enemies. The reader will perceive at once in these respective characters, the Mohicans and their white friend, the scout, together with Monroe and Hayward. It was, in truth, the father in quest of his children, attended by the youth who felt so deep a stake in their happiness, and those brave and trusty foresters who had already proved their skill and fidelity through the trying scenes related. When Uncas, who moved in front, had reached the center of the plain, he raised a cry that drew his companions in a body to the spot. The young warrior had halted over a group of females who lay in a cluster, a confused mass of dead. Notwithstanding the revolting horror of the exhibition, Monroe and Hayward flew toward the festering heap, endeavoring, with a love that no uneasiness could extinguish, to discover whether any vestiges of those they sought were to be seen among the tattered and many-colored garments. The father and the lover found instant relief in the search, though each was condemned again to experience the misery of an uncertainty that was hardly less insupportable than the most revolting truth. They were standing silent and thoughtful around the melancholy pile when the scout approached. Eyeing the sad spectacle with an angry countenance, the sturdy woodsman, for the first time since his entering the plain, spoke intelligibly and aloud. I have been on many a shocking field, and have followed a trail of blood for weary miles, he said. But never have I found the head of the devil so plain as it is here to be seen. Revenge is an Indian feeling, and all who know me know that there is no cross in my veins. But this much will I say here, in the face of heaven, and with the power of the Lord so manifest in this howling wilderness, that should these Frenchers ever trust themselves again within the rage of a ragged bullet, there is one rifle which shall play its part so long as flint will fire or powder burn. I leave the tomahawk and knife to such as have a natural gift to use them. What say you, Chingachgook, he added in Delaware? Shall the Hurons boast of this to their women when the deep snows come? A gleam of resentment flashed across the dark lineaments of the Mohican chief. He loosened his knife in his sheath, and then, turning calmly from the sight, his countenance settled into a repose as deep as if he knew the instigation of passion. Montcalm, Montcalm, continued the deeply resentful and less self-restrained scout. They say a time must come when all the deeds done in the flesh will be seen at a single look, and that by eyes cleared from mortal infirmities. Woe betide the wretch who is born to behold this plain, with the judgment hanging about his soul. Has, I am a man of white blood, Yonder lies a redskin without the hair of his head, where nature rooted it. Look to him, Delaware. It may be one of your missing people, and he should have burial like a stout warrior. I see it in your eye, Sagamore. A Huron pays for this, afore the fall winds have blown away the scent of the blood. Chingachgook approached the mutilated form, and turning it over, he found the distinguishing marks of one of those six allied tribes, or nations as they were called, who, while they fought in the English ranks, were so deadly hostile to his own people. Spurning the loathsome object with his foot, he turned from it with the same difference he would have quitted a brute carcass. The scout comprehended the action, and very deliberately pursued his own way, continuing, however, his denunciations against the French commander in the same resentful strain. Nothing but vast wisdom and unlimited power should dare to sweep off men in multitudes, he added, for it is only the one that can know the necessity of the judgment, 
and what is there short of the other that can replace the creatures of the Lord? I hold it a sin to kill the second buck before the first is eaten, unless a march in front or an ambushment be contemplated. It is a different matter for a few warriors in open and rugged fight, for tis their gift to die with the rifle or the tomahawk in hand, according as their natures may happen to be, red or white. Uncas, come this way, lad, and let the raven settle upon the mingo. I know, from often seeing it, that they are craving for the flesh of an anida, and it is well to let the bird follow the gift of its natural appetite. Oh! exclaimed the young Mohican, rising on the extremities of his feet and gazing intently in his front, frightening the ravens to some other prey by the sound of the action. "'What is it, boy?' whispered the scout, lowering his tall form into a crouching attitude, like a panther about to take his leap. "'God send it be a tardy Frencher sulking for plunder. I do believe Kildeer would have uncommon range to-day.' Uncas, without making any reply, bounded away from the spot, and in the next instant he was seen tearing from a bush, and waving in triumph, a fragment from the green riding veil of Cora. The movement, the exhibition, and the cry which again burst from the lips of the young Mohican, instantly drew the whole party about him. "'My child!' said Monroe, speaking quickly and wildly. "'Give me my child!' "'Uncas will try,' was the short and touching answer. The simple but meaning assurance was lost on the father, who seized the piece of gauze and crushed it in his hand while his eyes roamed fearfully among the bushes, as if he equally dreaded and hoped for the secrets they might reveal. "'Here are no dead,' said Hayward. "'The storm seems not to have passed this way.' "'That's manifest and clearer than the heavens above our heads,' returned the undisturbed scout." But either she or they that have robbed her have passed the bush, for I remember the rag she wore to hide a face that all did love to look upon. Uncas, you are right. The wood. None who could fly would remain to be murdered. Let us search for the mark she left. For, to Indian eyes, I sometimes think a hummingbird leaves his trail in the air. The young Mohican darted away at the suggestion and the scout had hardly done speaking before the former raised a cry of success from the margin of the forest. On reaching the spot, the anxious party perceived another portion of the veil fluttering on the lower branch of a beech. "'Softly, softly,' said the scout, extending his long rifle in front of the eager Hayward. "'We know now our work, but the beauty of the trail must not be deformed. A step too soon,' may give us hours of trouble. We have them, though. That much is beyond denial. Bless ye, bless ye, worthy man, exclaimed Monroe. Whither then have they fled? And where are my babes? The path they have taken depends on many chances. If they have gone alone, they are quite as likely to move in a circle as straight, and they may be within a dozen miles of us. But if the Hurons or any of the French Indians have laid hands on them. Tis probably they are now near the borders of the Canadas. But what matters that? Continued the deliberate scout, observing the powerful anxiety and disappointment the listeners exhibited. Here are the Mohicans, and I on one end of the trail. And rely on it. We find the other, though they should be a hundred leagues asunder. Gently, gently, Uncas. You are as impatient as a man in the settlements. You forget that light feet leave but faint marks. Oh! exclaimed Chinchachkuk, who had been occupied in examining an opening that had been evidently made through the low underbrush which skirted the forest, and who now stood erect as he pointed downward in the attitude with an air of a man who beheld a disgusting serpent. Here is the palpable impression of the footstep of a man, cried Hayward, bending over the indicated spot. He is trod in the margin of this pool, and the mark cannot be mistaken. They are captives. Better so than left to starve in the wilderness, returned the scout. And they will leave a wider trail. I would wager fifty beaver skins 
against as many flints that the Mohicans and I enter their wigwams within the month. Stoop to it, Uncas, and try what you can make of the moccasin, for moccasin it plainly is, and no shoe. The young Mohican bent over the track, and removing the scattered leaves from around the place, he examined it with much of that sort of scrutiny that a money dealer in these days of pecuniary doubts would bestow on a suspected due bill. At length he arose from his knees, satisfied with the result of the examination. "'Well, boy,' demanded the attentive scout, "'what does it say? Can you make anything of the tell-tale? "'Le Renard Subtil! Ha! That rampaging devil again! "'There will never be an end of his loping till Kildeer has said a friendly word to him.' Hayward reluctantly admitted the truth of this intelligence, and now expressed rather his hopes than his doubts by saying— one moccasin is so much like another. It is probable there is some mistake. One moccasin like another? You may as well say that one foot is like another, though we all know that some are long and others short, some broad and others narrow, some with high and some with low insteps, some in-toed and some out. One moccasin is no more like another than one book is like another though they who can read in one are seldom able to tell the marks of the other, which is all ordered for the best, giving to every man his natural advantages. Let me go down to it, Uncas. Neither book nor moccasin is the worse for having two opinions instead of one. The scout stooped to the task and instantly added, You are right, boy. Here is the patch we saw so often in the other chase. And the fellow will drink when he can get an opportunity. Your drinking Indian always learns to walk with a wider toe than the natural savage, it being the gift of a drunkard to straddle, whether of white or red skin. Tis just the length and bread, too. Look at it, Sagamore. You measured the prints more than once when we hunted the varmints from the glens to the health springs. Chingachgook complied, and after finishing his short examination, he arose, and with a quiet demeanor, he merely pronounced the word. Makwa. Ay, tis a settled thing. Here, then, have passed the dark hair and Makwa. And not Alice? demanded Hayward. Of her we have not yet seen the signs, returned the scout, looking closely around the trees, the bushes, and the ground. What have we there? Uncas, bring hither the thing you see dangling from yonder thorn bush. When the Indian had complied, the scout received the prize and holding it on high, he laughed in his silent but heartfelt manner. "'Tis the tooting weapon of the singer. Now we shall have a trail a priest might travel, he said. Uncas, look for the marks of a shoe that is long enough to uphold six feet two of tottering human flesh. I begin to have some hopes of the fellow, since he has given up squalling to follow some better trade. "'At least he has been faithful to his trust,' said Hayward and Cora and Alice are not without a friend. Yes, said Hawkeye, dropping his rifle, and leaning on it with an air of visible contempt. He will do their singing. Can he slay a buck for their dinner? Journey by the moss on the beaches? Or cut the throat of a Huron? If not, the first catbird he meets is the cleverer of the two. Footnote. The powers of the American mockingbird are generally known. But the true mockingbird is not found so far north as the state of New York, where it has, however, two substitutes of inferior excellence. The catbird so often named by the scout, and the bird vulgarly called ground thresher. Either of these last two birds is superior to the nightingale or the lark, though in general the American birds are less musical than those of Europe. End footnote. Well, boy, any signs of such a foundation? Here is something like the footstep of one who has worn a shoe. Can that be our friend? Touch the leaves lightly, or you'll disconcert the formation. That, that is the print of a foot. But tis the dark hairs, and small it is, too. For one of such a noble height and grand appearance, the singer would cover it with his heel. But where? Let me look on the footsteps of my child said Monroe, shoving the bushes aside and bending fondly over the nearly obliterated impression. 
though the tread which had left the mark had been light and rapid, it was still plainly visible. The aged soldier examined it with eyes that grew dim as he gazed, nor did he rise from his stooping posture till Hayward saw that he had watered the trace of his daughter's passage with a scalding tear. Willing to divert a distress which threatened each moment to break through the restraint of appearances, by giving the veteran something to do, the young man said to the scout, "'As we now possess these infallible signs, let us commence our march. A moment at such a time will appear an age to the captives. "'It is not the swiftest leaping deer that gives the longest chase,' returned Hawkeye, without moving his eye from the different marks that had come under his view. "'We know that the rampaging Huron has passed, and the dark hair and the singer.' But where is she of the yellow locks and blue eyes? Though little and far from being as bold as her sister, she is fair to the view, and pleasant in discourse. Has she no friend that none care for her? God forbid she should ever want hundreds. Are we not now in their pursuit? For one, I will never cease the search till she be found. In that case, we may have to journey by different paths for here she has not passed, light and little, as her footsteps would be. Hayward drew back, all his ardor to proceed seeming to vanish on the instant. Without attending to this sudden change in the other's humor, the scout, after musing a moment, continued, There is no woman in this wilderness could leave such a print as that but the dark hair or her sister. We know that the first has been here, but where are the signs of the other? Let us push deeper on the trail, and if nothing offers, we must go back to the plain and strike another scent. Move on, Uncas, and keep your eyes on the dried leaves. I will watch the bushes, while your father shall run with a low nose to the ground. Move on, friends. The sun is getting behind the hills. Is there nothing that I can do? demanded the anxious Hayward. You? repeated the scout who with his red friends was already advancing in the order he had prescribed. Yes, you can keep in our rear, and be careful not to cross the trail. Before they had proceeded many rods, the Indians stopped and appeared to gaze at some signs on the earth with more than their usual keenness. Both father and son spoke quick and loud, now looking at the object of their mutual admiration, and now regarding each other with the most unequivocal pleasure. "'They have found the little foot!' exclaimed the scout, moving forward without attending further to his own portion of the duty. "'What have we here? An ambush has been planted in the spot. No, by the truest rifle of the frontiers, here have been them one-sided horses again. Now the whole secret is out, and all is plain as the North Star at midnight. Yes, here they have mounted.' There the beasts have been bound to a sapling in waiting, and yonder runs the broad path away to the north, in full sweep for the Canadas. But still there are no signs of Alice, of the younger Miss Moreau, said Duncan, unless the shining bauble of Uncas has just lifted from the ground should prove one. Pass it this way, lad, that we may look at it. Hayward instantly knew it for a trinket that Alice was fond of wearing and which he recollected with the tenacious memory of a lover to have seen on the fatal morning of the massacre, dangling from the fair neck of his mistress. He seized the highly prized jewel, and as he proclaimed the fact, it vanished from the eyes of the wandering scout, who in vain looked for it on the ground, long after it was warmly pressed against the beating heart of Duncan. Pshaw! said the disappointed Hawkeye, ceasing to rake the leaves with the breech of his rifle, "'Tis a sign of age when the sight begins to weaken. "'Such a glittering gigaw, and not to be seen. "'Well, well, I can squint along a clouded barrel yet, "'and that is enough to settle all disputes between me and the Mingos. "'I should like to find the thing, too, "'if it were only to carry it to the right owner, "'and that would be bringing the two ends of what I call a long trail together. "'For by this time the broad St. Lawrence, "'or perhaps the Great Lakes themselves, between us. So much the more reason why we should not delay our march, returned Hayward. Let us proceed. Young blood and hot blood, they say, are much the same thing. 
we are not about to start on a squirrel hunt or to drive a deer into the hurricane, but to outlie for days and nights and to stretch across a wilderness where the feet of men seldom go and where no bookish knowledge would carry you through harmless. An Indian never starts on such an exhibition without smoking over his council fire, and, though a man of white blood, I honor their customs in this particular, seeing that they are deliberate and wise. We will therefore go back and light our fire tonight in the ruins of the old fort, and in the morning we shall be fresh and ready to undertake our work like men, and not like babbling women or eager boys. Hayward saw by the manner of the scout that altercation would be useless. Monroe had again sunk into that sort of apathy which had beset him since his late overwhelming misfortunes, and from which he was apparently to be roused only by some new and powerful excitement. Making a merit of necessity, the young man took the veteran by the arm and followed in the footsteps of the Indians and the scout, who had already begun to retrace the path which conducted them to the plain. End of chapter 18 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in the autumn of 2007. Chapter 19 of The Last of the Mohicans A Narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 19 Quote, Salar Why, I am sure if he forfeit, thou will not take his flesh. What's that good for? Shy To bait fish withal. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. Unquote. From the Merchant of Venice the shades of evening had come to increase the dreariness of the place when the party entered the ruins of William Henry. The scout and his companions immediately made their preparations to pass the night there, but with an earnestness and sobriety of demeanor that betrayed how much the unusual horrors they had just witnessed worked on even their practiced feelings. A few fragments of rafters were reared against the blackened wall, and when Uncas had covered them slightly with brush, the temporary accommodations were deemed sufficient. The young Indian pointed toward this rude hut when his labor was ended, and Hayward, who understood the meaning of the silent gestures, gently urged Monroe to enter, leaving the bereaved old man alone with his sorrows. Duncan immediately returned into the open air, too much excited himself to seek the repose he had recommended to his veteran friend. While Hawkeye and the Indians lighted their fire and took their evening's repast, a frugal meal of dried bear's meat, the young man paid a visit to that curtain of the dilapidated fort which looked out on the sheet of the hurricane. The wind had fallen, and the waves were already rolling on the sandy beach beneath him in a more regular and tempered succession. The clouds, as if tired of their furious chase, were breaking asunder, the heavier volumes gathering in black masses about the horizon, while the lighter scud still hurried above the water, or eddied among the tops of the mountains, like broken flights of birds, hovering around their roost. Here and there, a red and fiery star struggled through the drifting vapor, furnishing a lurid gleam of brightness to the dull aspect of the heavens. Within the bosom of the encircling hills, an impenetrable darkness had already settled, and the plain lay like a vast and deserted charnel house, without omen or whisper to disturb the slumbers of its numerous and hapless tenants. On this scene, so chillingly in accordance with the past, Duncan stood for many minutes a rapt observer. His eyes wandered from the bosom of the mound, where the foresters were seated around their glimmering fire, to the fainter light which still lingered in the skies and then rested long and anxiously on the embodied gloom, which lay like a dreary void on that side of him where the dead reposed. He soon fancied that inexplicable sounds arose from the place, 
though so indistinct and stolen as to render not only their nature, but even their existence uncertain. Ashamed of his apprehensions, the young man turned toward the water, and strove to divert his attention to the mimic stars that dimly glimmered on its moving surface. Still, his two conscious ears performed their ungrateful duty, as if to warn him of some lurking danger. At length, a swift trampling seemed quite audibly to rush athwart the darkness. Unable any longer to quiet his uneasiness, Duncan spoke in a low voice to the scout, requesting him to ascend the mound to the place where he stood. Hawkeye threw his rifle across his arm and complied, but with an air so unmoved and calm as to prove how much he counted on the security of their position. Listen, said Duncan, when the other placed himself deliberately at his elbow. There are suppressed noises on the plain, which may show Montcalm has not yet entirely deserted his conquest. Then ears are better than eyes, said the undisturbed scout, who, having just deposited a portion of bear between his grinders, spoke thick and slow, like one whose mouth was doubly occupied. I myself saw him caged in tie with all his host, for your Frenchers, when they have done a clever thing, like to get back and have a dance or a merry-making with the women over their success. I know not. An Indian seldom sleeps in war, and plunder may keep a Huron here after his tribe has departed. It would be well to extinguish the fire and have a watch. Listen. You hear the noise, I mean. An Indian more rarely lurks about the graves. Though ready to slay, and not over-regardful of the means, he is commonly content with the scalp, unless when blood is hot and temper up. But after spirit is once fairly gone, he forgets his enmity, and is willing to let the dead find their natural rest. Speaking of spirits, Major, are you of opinion that the heaven of a redskin and us whites will be of one and the same? No doubt, no doubt. I thought I heard it again. Or was it the rustling of the leaves in the top of the beach? For my own part, continued Hawkeye, turning his face for a moment in the direction indicated by Hayward, but with a vacant and careless manner, I believe that paradise is ordained for happiness and that men will be indulged in it according to their dispositions and gifts. I therefore judge that a redskin is not far from the truth when he believes he is to find them glorious hunting grounds, of which his traditions tell. Nor, for that matter, do I think it would be any disparagement to a man without a cross to pass his time. You hear it again? interrupted Duncan. Ay, ay, when food is scarce, and when food is plenty. A wolf grows bold, said the unmoved scout. There would be picking, too, among the skins of the devils, if there was light and time for the sport. But concerning the life that is to come, Major, I have heard preachers say in the settlements that heaven was a place of rest. Now men's minds differ as to their ideas of enjoyment. For myself, and I say it with reverence to the ordering of providence, it would be no great indulgence to be kept shut up in those mansions of which they preach, having a natural longing for motion and the chase. Duncan, who was now made to understand the nature of the noise he had heard, answered with more attention to the subject, which the humor of the scout had chosen for discussion, by saying, It is difficult to account for the feelings that may attend the last great change. It would be a change indeed for a man who has passed his days in the open air, returned the single-minded scout, and who has so often broken his fast on the headwaters of the Hudson to sleep within sound of the roaring Mohawk. But it is a comfort to know we serve a merciful master, though we do it each after his fashion, and with great tracts of wilderness atween us. What goes there? Is it not the rushing of the wolves you have mentioned? Hawkeye slowly shook his head and beckoned for Duncan to follow him to a spot to which the glare of the fire did not extend. When he had taken this precaution, the scout placed himself in an attitude of intense attention, and listened long and keenly for a repetition of the low sound that had so unexpectedly startled him. 
His vigilance, however, seemed exercised in vain, for after a fruitless pause, he whispered to Duncan, We must give a call to Uncas. The boy has Indian senses, and he may hear what is hid from us, for, being a white skin, I will not deny my nature. The young Mohican, who was conversing in a low voice with his father, started as he heard the moaning of an owl, and, springing to his feet, he looked toward the black mounds, as if seeking the place whence the sounds proceeded. The scout repeated the call, and within a few moments Duncan saw the figure of Uncas stealing cautiously along the rampart to the spot where they stood. Hawkeye explained his wishes in very few words, which were spoken in the Delaware tongue. As soon as Uncas was in possession of the reason why he was summoned, he threw himself flat on the turf, where to the eyes of Duncan he appeared to lie quiet and motionless. Surprised at the immovable attitude of the young warrior, and curious to observe the manner in which he employed his faculties to obtain the desired information, Hayward advanced a few steps, and bent over the dark object on which he had kept his eye riveted. Then it was he discovered that the form of Uncas vanished, and that he beheld only the dark outline of an inequality in the embankment. "'What has become of the Mohican?' he demanded of the scout, stepping back in amazement. "'It was here that I saw him fall, and could have sworn that here he yet remained.' "'Sst! Speak lower, for we know not what ears are open, and the Mingos are a quick-witted breed. As for Uncas, he is out on the plain, and the Maquas, if any such are about us, will find him their equal.' You think that Montcalm has not called off all his Indians? Let us give the alarm to our companions, that we may stand to our arms. Here are five of us, who are not unused to meet an enemy. Not a word to either, as you value your life. Look at the Sagamore, how like a grand Indian chief he sits by the fire. If there are any skulkers out in the darkness, they will never discover by his countenance that we suspect danger at hand. But they may discover him and it will prove his death. His person can be too plainly seen by the light of that fire, and he will become the first and most certain victim. It is undeniable that now you speak the truth, returned the scout, betraying more anxiety than was usual. Yet what can be done? A single suspicious look might bring on an attack before we are ready to receive it. He knows by the call I gave Uncas, that we have struck a scent. I will tell him that we are on the trail of the Mingos. His Indian nature will tell him how to act. The scout applied his fingers to his mouth and raised a low hissing sound that caused Duncan at first to start aside, believing that he had heard a serpent. The head of Chingachgook was resting on a hand as he sat musing by himself. But the moment he had heard the warning of the animal whose name he bore, he arose to an upright position, and his dark eyes glanced swiftly and keenly on every side of him. With his sudden and perhaps involuntary movement, every appearance of surprise or alarm ended. His rifle lay untouched, and apparently unnoticed within reach of his hand. The tomahawk that he had loosened in his belt for the sake of ease was even suffered to fall from its usual situation to the ground, and his form seemed to sink, like that of a man whose nerves and sinews were suffered to relax for the purpose of rest. Cunningly resuming his former position, though with a change of hands, as if the movement had been made merely to relieve the limb, the native awaited the result with a calmness and fortitude that none but an Indian warrior would have known how to exercise. But Hayward saw that while to a less instructed eye the Mohican chief appeared to slumber, his nostrils were expanded, his head was turned a little to one side as if to assist the organs of hearing, and that his quick and rapid glances ran incessantly over every object within the power of his vision. "'See the noble fellow,' whispered Hawkeye, pressing the arm of Hayward. "'He knows that a look of motion might disconcert our schemes.' and put us at the mercy of them imps. He was interrupted by the flash and report of a rifle. 
the air was filled with sparks of fire around that spot where the eyes of Hayward were still fastened with admiration and wonder. A second look told him that Chingachgook had disappeared in the confusion. In the meantime, the scout had thrown forward his rifle like one prepared for service and awaited impatiently the moment when an enemy might rise to view. But, with the solitary and fruitless attempt made on the life of Chingachgook, the attack appeared to have terminated. Once or twice the listeners thought they could distinguish the distant rustling of bushes, as bodies of some unknown description rushed through them. Nor was it long before Hawkeye pointed out the scampering of the wolves, as they fled precipitately before the passage of some intruder on their proper domains. After an impatient and breathless pause, a plunge was heard in the water, and it was followed by the report of another rifle. "'There it goes, Uncas,' said the scout. "'The boy bears a smart piece. I know its crack, as well as the father knows the language of his child, for I carried the gun myself until I better offered.' "'What can this mean?' demanded Duncan. "'We are watched, and, as it would seem, marked for destruction.' "'Yonder scattered brand can witness that no good was intended, "'and this Indian will testify that no harm has been done,' returned the scout, "'dropping his rifle across his arm again, "'and following Chingachgook, who just then reappeared within the circle of light, "'into the bosom of the work. "'How is it, Sagamore? Are the Mingos upon us in earnest?' Or is it only one of those reptiles who hang upon the skirts of a war party to scalp the dead, go in, and make their boast among the squaws of the valiant deeds done on the pale faces? Chingachgook very quietly resumed his seat, nor did he make any reply until after he had examined the firebrand, which had been struck by the bullet that had nearly proved fatal to himself, after which he was content to reply, after which he was content to reply, holding a single finger up to view, with the English monosyllable, One. I thought as much, returned Hawkeye, seating himself, and as he had got the cover of the lake afore Uncas pulled upon him, I thought as much, returned Hawkeye, seating himself, and as he had got the cover of the lake afore Uncas pulled upon him, it is more than probable the knave will sing his lies, about some great ambushment in which he was outlying on the trail of two Mohicans and a white hunter. For the officers can be considered as little better than idlers in such a scrimmage. Well, let him. Let him. There are always some honest men in every nation, though heaven knows, too, that they are scarce among the Maquas. To look down an upstart when he brags again the face of reason. The varlet sent his lead within whistle of your ear, Sagamore. Chingachgook turned a calm and incurious eye toward the place where the ball had struck, and then resumed his former attitude, with a composure that could not be disturbed by so trifling an incident. Just then Uncas glided into the circle, and seated himself at the fire with the same appearance of indifference, as was maintained by his father. Of these several moments, Hayward was a deeply interested and wondering observer. It appeared to him as though the foresters had some secret means of intelligence, which had escaped the vigilance of his own faculties. In place of that eager and garrulous narration, which a white youth would have endeavored to communicate, and perhaps exaggerate that which had passed out in the darkness of the plain, the young warrior was seemingly content to let his deeds speak for themselves. It was, in fact, neither the moment nor the occasion for an Indian to boast of his exploits. And it is probably that, had Hayward neglected to inquire, not another syllable, just then, had been uttered on the subject. "'What has become of our enemy, Uncas?' demanded Duncan. "'We heard your rifle, and hoped that you had not fired in vain.' The young chief removed a fold of his hunting skirt, and quietly exposed the fatal tuft of hair which he bore as the symbol of victory. Chingachgook laid his hand on the scalp and considered it for a moment with deep attention. Then, dropping it with disgust depicted in his strong features, he ejaculated, Oneida! Oneida! repeated the scout, who was fast losing his interest in the scene, in an apathy nearly assimilated 
to that of his red associates, but who now advanced in uncommon earnestness to regard the bloody badge. By the Lord, if the Uniteds are outlying on the trail, we shall be flanked by devils on every side of us. Now to white eyes there is no difference between this bit of skin and that of any other Indian, and yet the Sagamore declares it came from the pole of a Mingo. Nay, he even names the tribe of the poor devil, with as much ease as if the scalp was a leaf of a book, and each hair a letter. What right have Christian whites to boast of their learning when a savage can read a language that would prove too much for the wisest man of them all? What say you, lad? Of what people was the knave? Uncas raised his eyes to the face of the scout and answered in his soft voice, Oneida. Oneida again. When one Indian speaks a declaration, it is commonly true. But when he is supported by his people, set it down as gospel. The poor fellow has mistaken us for French, said Hayward, or he would not have tempted the life of a friend. He mistake a Mohican in his paint for a Huron? You would be as likely to mistake the white-coated grenadiers of Montcalm for the scarlet jackets of the Royal Americans, returned the scout. No, no, the serpent knew his errand. Nor was there any great mistake in the matter, for there is but little love between a Delaware and a Mingo. Let their tribes go out to fight for whom they may in a white quarrel, for that matter. Though the Oneidas do serve his sacred majesty, who is my sovereign lord and master, I should not have deliberated long about letting off Kildare the imp myself, had luck thrown him in my way. That would have been an abuse of our treaties, and unworthy of your character. When a man consort much with a people, continued Hawkeye, if they are honest, and he no knave, love will grow up atwixt them. It is true that white cunning has managed to throw the tribes into great confusion, as respects friends and enemies, so that the Hurons and the Oneidas, who speak the same tongue, or what may be called the same, take each other's scalps, and the Delawares are divided among themselves, a few hanging about their great council fire on their own river, and fighting on the same side with the Mingos, while the greater part are in the Canadas, out of natural enmity to the Maquas thus throwing everything into disorder, and destroying all the harmony of warfare. Yet a red nature is not likely to alter with every shift of policy, so that the love atwixt a Mohican and a Mingo is much like the regard between a white man and a serpent. I regret to hear it, for I had believed that those natives who dwelt within our boundaries found us too just and liberal, not to identify themselves fully with our quarrels. Why, I believe it is nature to give a preference to one's own quarrels before those of strangers. Now for myself, I do love justice, and therefore I will not say I hate a Mingo, for that may be unsuitable to my color and my religion. Though I will just repeat, it may have been owing to the night that Kildare had no hand in the death of this sulking Oneida. Then, as if satisfied with the force of his own reasons, whatever may be their effect on the opinions of the other disputant, the honest but implacable woodsman turned from the fire, content to let the controversy slumber. Hayward withdrew to the rampart, too uneasy and too little accustomed to the warfare of the woods to remain at ease under the possibility of such insidious attacks. Not so, however, with the scout and the Mohicans, those acute and practiced senses, whose powers so often exceeded the limits of all ordinary credulity, after having detected the danger, had enabled them to ascertain its magnitude and duration. Not one of the three appeared in the least to doubt their perfect security, as was indicated by the preparations that were soon made to sit in council over their future proceedings. The confusion of nations, and even of tribes to which Hawkeye alluded, existed at that period in the fullest force. The great tie of language, and of course of a common origin, was severed in many places, and it was one of its consequences that the Delaware, 
and the Mingo, as the people of the Six Nations were called, were found fighting in the same ranks, while the latter sought the scalp of the Huron, though believed to be the root of his own stock. The Delawares were even divided among themselves, though love for the soil which had belonged to his ancestors kept the Sagamore of the Mohicans, with a small band of followers who were serving at Edward under the banners of the English king, by far the largest portion of his nation were known to be in the field as allies of Montcalm. The reader probably knows, if enough has not already been gleaned from this narrative, that the Delaware or Lenape claimed to be the progenitors of that numerous people, who once were masters of most of the eastern and northern states of America, of whom the community of the Mohicans was an ancient and highly honored member. It was, of course, with a perfect understanding of the minute and the intricate interest which had armed friend against friend, and brought natural enemies to combat by each other's side, that the scout and his companions now disposed themselves to deliberate on the measures that were to govern their future movements, amid so many jarring and savage races of men. Duncan knew enough of Indian customs to understand the reason that the fire was replenished, and why the warriors, not excepting Hawkeye, took their seats within the curl of its smoke, with so much gravity and decorum. Placing himself at an angle of the works, where he might be a spectator of the scene without, he awaited the result with as much patience as he could summon. After a short and impressive pause, Chinchgochcook lighted a pipe whose bowl was curiously carved in one of the soft stones of the country, and whose stem was a tube of wood, commenced smoking. When he had inhaled enough of the fragrance of the soothing weed, he passed the instrument into the hands of the scout. In this manner the pipe had made its round three several times, amid the most profound silence, before either of the party opened his lips. Then the Sagamore, as the oldest and highest in rank, in a few calm and dignified words, proposed the subject for deliberation. He was answered by the scout, and Chinchgochcook rejoined when the other objected to his opinions. But the youthful Uncas continued a silent and respectful listener, until Hawkeye, in complacence, demanded his opinion. Hayward gathered from the manners of the different speakers that the father and son espoused one side of a disputed question, while the white man maintained the other. The contest gradually grew warmer, until it was quite evident the feelings of the speakers began to be somewhat enlisted in the debate. Notwithstanding the increasing warmth of the amicable contest, the most decorous Christian assembly, not even excepting those in which its reverend ministers are collected, might have learned a wholesome lesson of moderation from the forbearance and courtesy of the disputants. The words of Uncas were received with the same deep attention as those which fell from the mature wisdom of his father, and so far from manifesting any impatience, neither spoke in reply until a few moments of silent meditation were seemingly bestowed in deliberating on what had already been said. The language of the Mohicans was accompanied by gestures so direct and natural that Hayward had but little difficulty in following the thread of their argument. On the other hand, the scout was obscure, because from the lingering pride of color he rather affected the cold and artificial manner which characterizes all classes of Anglo-Americans when unexcited. By the frequency with which the Indians described the marks of a forest trail, it was evident they urged pursuit by land, while the repeated sweep of Hawkeye's arm toward the hurricane denoted that he was for a passage across its waters. The latter was to every appearance fast losing ground, and the point was about to be decided against him when he arose to his feet, and shaking off his apathy he suddenly assumed the manner of an Indian, and adopted all the arts of native eloquence. Elevating an arm he pointed out the track of the sun, repeating the gesture for every day that was necessary to accomplish their objects. Then he delineated a long and painful path amid rocks and watercourses. The age 
and weakness of the slumbering and unconscious Moreau were indicated, by signs too palpable to be mistaken. Duncan perceived that even his own powers were spoken lightly of, as the scout extended his palm and mentioned him by the appellation of Open Hand, a name his liberality had purchased of all the friendly tribes. Then came a representation of the light and graceful movements of a canoe, set in forcible contrast to the tottering steps of one enfeebled and tired. He concluded by pointing to the scalp of the Oneida, and apparently urging the necessity of their departing speedily and in a manner that should leave no trail. The Mohicans listened gravely, and with countenances that reflected the sentiments of the speaker. Conviction gradually wrought its influence, and toward the close of Hawkeye's speech, his sentences were accompanied by the customary exclamation of commendation. In short, Uncas and his father became converts to his way of thinking, abandoning their own previously expressed opinions with a liberality and candor that, had they been the representatives of some great and civilized people, would have infallibly worked their political ruin by destroying forever their reputation for consistency. The instant the matter in discussion was decided, the debate and everything connected with it except the result appeared to be forgotten. Hawkeye, without looking round to read his triumph in applauding eyes, very composedly stretched his tall frame before the dying embers, and closed his own organs in sleep. Left now in a measure to themselves, the Mohicans, whose time had been so much devoted to the interest of others, seized the moment to devote some attention to themselves. Casting off at once the grave and austere demeanor of an Indian chief, Chinchgachko commenced speaking to his son in the soft and playful tones of affection. Uncas gladly met the familiar air of his father, and before the hard breathing of the scout announced that he slept, a complete change was effected in the manner of his two associates. It is impossible to describe the music of their language, while thus engaged in laughter and endearments, in such a way as to render it intelligible to those whose ears have never listened to its melody. The compass of their voices, particularly that of the youth, was wonderful, extending from the deepest bass to tones that were even feminine in softness. The eyes of the father followed the plastic and ingenious movements of the son with open delight, and he never failed to smile in reply to the other's contagious but low laughter. While under the influence of these gentle and natural feelings, no trace of ferocity was to be seen in the softened features of the Sagamore. His figured panoply of death looked more like a disguise assumed in mockery than a fierce denunciation of a desire to carry destruction in his footsteps. After an hour had passed in the indulgence of their better feelings, Chingachgook abruptly announced his desire to sleep by wrapping his head in his blanket and stretching his form on the naked earth. The merriment of Uncas instantly ceased, and carefully raking the coals in such a manner that they should impart their warmth to his father's feet, the youth sought his own pillow among the ruins of the place. Imbibing renewed confidence from the security of these experienced foresters, Hayward soon imitated their example, and long before the night had turned, they who lay in the bosom of the ruined work seemed to slumber as heavily as the unconscious multitude whose bones were already beginning to bleach on the surrounding plain. End of chapter 19 this reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the autumn of 2007. Chapter 20 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 20 Quote, Land of Albania, let me bend mine eyes on thee, thou rugged nurse of savage men. Unquote. 
by Child Harold. The heavens were still studded with stars when Hawkeye came to arouse the sleepers. Casting aside their cloaks, Monroe and Hayward were on their feet, while the woodsman was still making his low calls at the entrance of the rude shelter where they had passed the night. When they issued from beneath its concealment, they found the scout awaiting their appearance nigh by, and the only salutation between them was the significant gesture of silence made by their sagacious leader. "'Think over your prayers,' he whispered as they approached him, "'for he to whom you make them knows all tongues, that of the heart, as well as those of the mouth. But speak not a syllable. It is rare for a white voice to pitch itself properly in the woods, as we have seen by the example of that miserable devil, the singer. Come, he continued, turning toward a curtain of the works. Let us get into the ditch on this side, and be regardful to step on the stones and fragments of wood as you go. His companions complied, though to two of them the reasons for this extraordinary precaution were yet a mystery. When they were in the low cavity that surrounded the earthen fort on three sides, they found that passage nearly choked by the ruins. With care and patience, however, they succeeded in clambering after the scout, until they reached the sandy shore of the Horican. "'That's a trail that nothing but a nose can follow,' said the satisfied scout, looking back along their difficult way. "'Grass is a treacherous carpet for a flying party to tread on, but wood and stone take no print from a moccasin. Had you worn your arm boots, there might indeed have been something to fear. But with the deerskin suitably prepared, a man may trust himself, generally, on rocks with safety.' Shove in the canoe nigher to the land, Uncas. This sand will take a stamp as easily as the butter of the Germans on the Mohawk. Softly, lad, softly. It must not touch the beach, or the knaves will know by what road we have left the place. The young man observed the precaution, and the scout, laying a board from the ruins to the canoe, made a sign for the two officers to enter. When this was done... Everything was studiously restored to its former disorder, and then Hawkeye succeeded in reaching his little birchen vessel, without leaving behind any of those marks which he appeared so much to dread. Hayward was silent until the Indians had cautiously paddled the canoe some distance from the fort, and with the broad and dark shadows that fell from the eastern mountain on the glassy surface of the lake, then he demanded— what need have we for this stolen and hurried departure? If the blood of an Oneida could stain such a sheet of pure water as this we float on, returned the scout, your two eyes would answer your own question. Have you forgotten the skulking reptile Uncas slew? By no means. But he was said to be alone. And dead men give no cause for fear. Aye, he was alone in his deviltry. But an Indian whose tribe counts so many warriors need seldom fear his blood will run without the death shriek coming speedily from some of his enemies. But our presence, the authority of Colonel Monroe, would prove sufficient protection against the anger of our allies, especially in a case where the wretch so well merited his fate. I trust in heaven you have not deviated a single foot from the direct line of our course, with so slight a reason? Do you think the bullet of that varlet's rifle would have turned aside, though his sacred majesty the king had stood in its path? returned the stubborn scout. Why did not the grand Frencher, he who is Captain General of the Canadas, bury the tomahawk of the Hurons, if a word from a white can work so strongly on the nature of an Indian. The reply of Hayward was interrupted by a groan from Monroe. But after he had paused a moment, in deference to the sorrow of his aged friend, he resumed the subject. The Marquis of Montcalm can only settle that air with his God, said the young man solemnly. Aye, aye, 
Now there is reason in your word, for they are bottomed on religion and honesty. There is a vast difference between throwing a regiment of white coats, atwixt the tribes and the prisoners, and coaxing an angry savage to forget he carries a knife and rifle, with words that must begin with calling him your son. No, no, continued the scout, looking back at the dim shore of William Henry, which was now fast receding, and laughing in his own silent but heartfelt manner. I have put a trail of water between us, and unless the imps can make friends with the fishes, and hear who has paddled across their basin, this fine morning shall throw the length of the hurricane behind us, before they have made up their minds which path to take. With foes in front and foes in our rear, our journey is like to be one of danger. Danger, repeated Hawkeye calmly. No, not absolutely of danger, for with vigilant ears and quick eyes, we can manage to keep a few hours ahead of the knaves. Or if we must try the rifle. There are three of us who understand its gifts, as well as any you can name on the borders. No, not of danger. But that we shall have what you may call a brisk push of it is probable. And it may happen, a brush, a scrimmage, or some such diversion, but always where covers are good and ammunition abundant. It is possible that Hayward's estimate of danger differed in some degree from that of the scout, for instead of replying he now sat in silence while the canoe glided over several miles of water. Just as the day dawned, they entered the narrows of the lake, and stole swiftly and cautiously among their numberless little islands. Footnote. The beauties of Lake George are well known to every American tourist. In the height of the mountains which surround it, and in artificial accessories, it is inferior to the finest of the Swiss and Italian lakes, while, in outline and purity of water, it is fully their equal and, in the number and disposition of its isles and islets, much superior to them altogether. There are said to be some hundreds of islands in a sheet of water less than thirty miles long. The narrows, which connect what may be called in truth two lakes, are crowded with islands to such a degree as to leave passages between them frequently of only a few feet in width. The lake itself varies in breadth, from one to three miles. End footnote. It was by this road that Montcalm had retired with his army, and the adventurers knew not but he had left some of his Indians in ambush to protect the rear of his forces and collect the stragglers. They therefore approached the passage with the customary silence of their guarded habits. Chingachgook laid aside his paddle, while Uncas and the scout urged the light vessel through crooked and intricate channels, where every foot that they advanced exposed them to the danger of some sudden rising on their progress. The eyes of the Sagamore moved warily from islet to islet and copse to copse. As the canoe proceeded, and when a clear sheet of water permitted, his keen vision was bent along the bald rocks and impending forests that frowned upon the narrow strait. Hayward, who was a doubly interested spectator, as well from the beauties of the place as from the apprehension natural to his situation, was just believing that he had permitted the later to be excited without sufficient reason, when the paddle ceased moving in obedience to a signal from Chinchgachkok. Huh! exclaimed Uncas, nearly at the moment that the light tap his father had made on the side of the canoe notified them of the vicinity of danger. What now? asked the scout. The lake is as smooth as if the winds had never blown, and I can see along its sheet for miles. There is not so much as the black head of a loon dotting the water. The Indian gravely raised his paddle and pointed in the direction in which his own steady look was riveted. Duncan's eyes followed the motion. A few rods in their front lay another of the wooded islets. But it appeared as calm and peaceful as if solitude had never been disturbed by the foot of man. "'I see nothing,' he said, "'but land and water. And a lovely scene it is. 
Psst, interrupted the scout. I, Sagamore, there is always a reason for what you do. Tis but a shade, and yet it is not natural. You see the mist, Major, that is rising above the island? You can't call it a fog, for it is more like a streak of thin cloud. It is vapor from the water. That a child could tell. But what is the edging of blacker smoke that hangs on its lower side, and which you may trace down into the thicket of hazel? Tis from a fire, but one that in my judgment has been suffered to burn low. Let us then push for the place and relieve our doubts, said the impatient Duncan. The party must be small that can lie on such a bit of land. If you judge of Indian cunning by the rules you find in books, or by white sagacity, they will lead you astray if not to your death, returned Hawkeye, examining the signs of the place with that acuteness which distinguished him. If I may be permitted to speak in this matter, it will be to say that we have but two things to choose between. The one is to return and give up all thoughts of following the Hurons. Never! exclaimed Hayward in a voice far too loud for their circumstances. Well, well, continued Hawkeye, making a hasty sign to repress his impatience. I am much of your mind myself, though I thought it becoming my experience to tell the whole. We must then make a push, and if the Indians or Frenchers are in the narrows, run the gauntlet through these toppling mountains. Is there reason in my words, Sagamore? The Indian made no answer other than by dropping his paddle into the water and urging forward the canoe. As he held the office of directing its course, his resolution was sufficiently indicated by the movement. The whole party now plied their paddles vigorously, and in a very few moments they had reached a point whence they might command an entire view of the northern shore of the island, the side that had hitherto been concealed. There they are! By all the truth of signs, whispered the scout. Two canoes and a smoke. The knaves haven't got their eyes out of the mist, or we should hear the accursed hoop. To the gather, friends, we are leaving them, and we are already nearly out of whistle of a bullet. The well-known crack of a rifle whose ball came skipping along the placid surface of the strait and a shrill yell from the island interrupted his speech, and announced that their passage was discovered. In another instant several savages were seen rushing into canoes, which were soon dancing over the water in pursuit. These fearful precursors of a coming struggle produced no change in the countenances and movements of his three guides so far as Duncan could discover, except that the strokes of the paddle were longer and more in unison and caused the little bark to spring forward like a creature possessing life and volition. "'Hold them there, Sagmore,' said Hawkeye, looking coolly backward over his left shoulder, while he still plied his paddle. "'Keep them just there. Them Hurons have never a piece in their nation that will ex execute at this distance. But Kildare has a barrel on which a man may calculate.' The scout, having ascertained that the Mohicans were sufficient of themselves, to maintain the requisite distance, deliberately laid aside his paddle and raised the fatal rifle. Three several times he brought the piece to his shoulder, and when his companions were expecting its report, he as often lowered it, to request the Indians would permit their enemies to approach a little nigher. At length his accurate and fastidious eye seemed satisfied, and throwing out his left arm on the barrel, he was slowly elevating the muzzle, when an exclamation from Uncas, who sat at the bow, once more caused him to suspend the shot. "'What now, lad?' demanded Hawkeye. "'You save a Huron from the death shriek by that word. "'Have you reason for what you do?' Uncas pointed toward a rocky shore a little in their front, whence another war canoe was darting directly across their course. It was too obvious now that their situation was imminently perilous to need the aid of language to confirm it. The scout laid aside his rifle and resumed the paddle, while Chinchgotchkook inclined the bows of the canoe 
a little toward the western shore, in order to increase the distance between them and this new enemy. In the meantime, they were reminded of the presence of those who pressed upon their rear, by wild and exulting shouts. The stirring scene awakened even Monroe from his apathy. "'Let us make for the rocks on the main,' he said, with the mien of a tired soldier, "'and give battle to the savages. God forbid that I or those attached to me and mine should ever trust again to the faith of any servant of the Louis. "'He who wishes to prosper in Indian warfare,' returned the scout, "'must not be too proud to learn from the wit of a native. "'Lay her more along the land, Sagamore. "'We are doubling on the varlets, "'and perhaps they may try to strike our trail on the long calculation.' "'Hawkeye was not mistaken, "'for when the Huron found their course was likely to throw them behind their chase, "'they rendered it less direct, until by gradually bearing more and more obliquely, the two canoes were ere long gliding on parallel lines within two hundred yards of each other. It now became entirely a trial of speed. So rapid was the progress of the light vessels that the lake curled in their front in miniature waves, and their motion became undulating by its own velocity. It was perhaps, owing to this circumstance, in addition to the necessity of keeping every hand employed at the paddles, that the Hurons had not immediate recourse to their firearms. The exertions of the fugitives were too severe to continue long, and the pursuers had the advantage of numbers. Duncan observed with uneasiness that the scout began to look anxiously about him, as if searching for some further means of assisting their flight. "'Edge her a little more from the sun, Sagamore,' said the stubborn woodsman. I see the knaves are sparing a man to the rifle. A single broken bone might lose us our scalps. Edge more from the sun, and we will put the island between us. The expedient was not without its use. A long, low island lay at a little distance before them. And, as they closed with it, the chasing canoe was compelled to take a side opposite to that on which the pursued passed. The scout and his companions did not neglect this advantage, but the instant they were hid from observation by the bushes, they redoubled efforts that before had seemed prodigious. The two canoes came round the last low point like two coursers at the top of their speed, the fugitives taking the lead. This change had brought them nigher to each other, however, while it altered their relative position. You showed knowledge in the shaping of a birchen bark, Uncas, when you chose this from among the Huron canoes, said the scout, smiling, apparently more in satisfaction of their superiority in the race than from a prospect of final escape, which now began to open a little upon them. The imps have put all their strength again at the paddles, and we are to struggle for our scalp with bits of flattened wood instead of clouded barrels and true eyes. A long stroke and together, friends. They are preparing for a shot, said Hayward, and as we are in line with them, it can scarcely fail. Get you then into the bottom of the canoe, returned the scout, you and the colonel. It will be so much taken from the size of the mark. Hayward smiled as he answered. It would be an ill example for the highest in rank to dodge, while the warriors were under fire. "'Lord, Lord, that is now a white man's courage!' exclaimed the scout, and like too many of his notions, not to be maintained by reason. "'Do you think the Sagamore, or Ancus, or even I, who am a man without a cross, would deliberate upon finding a cover in the scrimmage, when an open body would do no good? For what have the Frenchers reared up their Quebec, if fighting is always to be done in the clearings?' "'All that you say is very true, my friend,' replied Hayward. "'Still, our customs must prevent us from doing as you wish.' A volley from the Hurons interrupted the discourse, and as the bullets whistled about them, Duncan saw the head of Uncas turned looking back at himself and Monroe. Notwithstanding the nearness of the enemy and his own great personal danger, the countenance of the young warrior expressed no other emotion as the former was compelled to think than amazement at finding men so willing to encounter so useless an exposure. 
Chinchgachkuk was probably better acquainted with the notions of white men, for he did not even cast a glance aside from the riveted look his eye maintained on the object by which he governed their course. A ball soon struck the light and polished paddle from the hands of the chief and drove it through the air far in the advance. A shout arose from the Hurons who seized the opportunity to fire another volley. Uncas described an arc in the water with his own blade, and as the canoes passed swiftly on, Chingachgook recovered his paddle, and flourishing it on high he gave the war-hoop of the Mohicans, and then lent his strength and skill again to the important task. The clamorous sounds of Le Gros Serpent, Le Long Carabine, Le Serpent Gil burst at once from the canoes behind and seemed to give new zeal to the pursuers. The scout seized Kildeer in his left hand, and elevating above his head, he shook it in triumph at his enemies. The savages answered the insult with a yell, and immediately another volley seceded. The bullets pattered along the lake, and one even pierced the bark of their little vessel. No perceptible emotion could be discovered in the Mohicans during this critical moment, their rigid features expressing neither hope nor alarm. But the scout again turned his head, and laughing in his own silent manner, he said to Hayward, The knaves love to hear the sound of their pieces, but the eye is not to be found among the Mingos that can calculate a true range in a dancing canoe. You see the dumb devils have taken off a man to charge, and by the smallest measurement that can be allowed, we move three feet to their two. Duncan, who was not altogether as easy under this nice estimate of distances as his companion, was glad to find, however, that owing to their superior dexterity and the diversion among their enemies, they were very sensibly obtaining the advantage. The Hurons soon fired again, and a bullet struck the blade of Hawkeye's paddle without injury. "'That will do,' said the scout, examining the slight indentation with a curious eye. It would not have cut the skin of an infant, much less of men who, like us, have been blown upon by the heavens in their anger. Now, Major, if you will try to use this piece of flattened wood, I'll let Kildeer take part in the conversation. Hayward seized the paddle and applied himself to the work with an eagerness that supplied the place of skill, while Hawkeye was engaged in inspecting the priming of his rifle. The later then took a swift aim and fired. The Huron in the bows of the leading canoe had risen with a similar object, and he now fell backward, suffering his gun to escape from his hands into the water. In an instant, however, he recovered his feet, though his gestures were wild and bewildered. At the same moment his companions suspended their efforts, and the chasing canoes clustered together and became stationary. Chinchgachkuk and Uncas profited by the interval to regain their wind though Duncan continued to work with the most persevering industry. The father and son now cast calm but inquiring glances at each other, to learn if either had sustained any injury by the fire, for both well knew that no cry or exclamation would in such a moment of necessity have been permitted to betray the accident. A few large drops of blood were trickling down the shoulder of the sagamore, who, when he perceived the eyes of Uncas dwelt too long on the sight, raised some water in the hollow of his hand, and washing off the stain, was content to manifest in this simple manner the slightness of the injury. Softly, softly, Major, said the scout, who by this time had reloaded his rifle. We are a little too far already for a rifle to put forth its beauties, and you see yonder yimps are holding a council. Let them come within striking distance. My eye may well be trusted in such a matter, and I will trail the varlets the length of the hurricane, guaranteeing that not a shot of theirs shall at the worst more than break the skin, while Kildeer shall touch the life twice in three times. We forget our errand, returned the diligent Duncan. For God's sake, let us profit by this advantage and increase our distance from the enemy. Give me my children, said Monroe hoarsely. Trifle no longer with a father's agony, but restore me, my babes. Long and habitual deference to the mandates of his superiors had taught the scout the virtue of obedience. Throwing a last and lingering glance at the distant canoes, he laid aside his rifle, and relieving the weary Duncan, resumed the paddle, which he wielded with sinews that never tired. His efforts were seconded by those of the Mohicans, 
and a very few minutes served to place such a sheet of water between them and their enemies, that Hayward once more breathed freely. The lake now began to expand, and their route lay along a wide reach that was lined, as before, by high and ragged mountains. But the islands were few and easily avoided. The strokes of the paddles grew more measured and regular, while they who plied them continued their labor after the close and deadly chase from which they had just relieved themselves, with as much coolness as though their speed had been tried in sport, rather than under such pressing, nay, almost desperate circumstances. Instead of following the western shore, whither their errand led them, the wary Mohican inclined his course more toward those hills behind which Montcalm was known to have led his army into the formidable fortress of Ticonderoga. As the Hurons, to every appearance, had abandoned the pursuit, there was no apparent reason for this excess of caution. It was, however, maintained for hours, until they had reached a bay nigh the northern termination of the lake. Here the canoe was driven upon the beach, and the whole party landed. Hawkeye and Hayward ascended an adjacent bluff, where the former, after considering the expanse of water beneath him, pointed out to the latter a small black object, hovering under a headland, at the distance of several miles. "'Do you see it?' demanded the scout. "'Now what would you account that spot, were you left alone to white experience to find your way through this wilderness?' "'But for its distance and its magnitude—' I would suppose it a bird. Can it be a living object? Tis a canoe of birch and bark, and paddled by fierce and crafty mingos. Though providence has lent to those who inhabit the woods, eyes that would be needless to men in the settlements, where there are inventions to assist the sight, yet no human organs can see all the dangers which at this moment circumvent us. These varlets pretend to be bent chiefly on their sundown meal, but the moment it is dark they will be on our trail as true as hounds on the scent. We must throw them off, or our pursuit of Le Renard Subtil may be given up. These lakes are useful at times, especially when the game take to the water, continued the scout, gazing about him with a countenance of concern. But they give no cover, except it be to the fishes. God knows what the country would be if the settlement should spread far from the two rivers. Both hunting and war would lose their beauty. Let us not delay a moment without some good and obvious cause. I little like that smoke which you may see warming up along the rock above the canoe, interrupted the abstracted scout. My life on it. Other eyes than ours see it and know its meaning. Well, Words will not mend the matter, and it is time that we were doing. Hawkeye moved away from the lookout and descended, musing profoundly to the shore. He communicated the result of his observations to his companions in Delaware, and a short and earnest consultation succeeded. When it terminated, the three instantly set about executing their new resolutions. The canoe was lifted from the water and borne on the shoulders of the party. They proceeded into the wood, making as broad and obvious a trail as possible. They soon reached the watercourse, which they crossed, and continuing onward until they came to an extensive and naked rock. At this point, where their footsteps might be expected to be no longer visible, they retraced their route to the brook, walking backward with the utmost care. They now followed the bed of the little stream to the lake, into which they immediately launched their canoe again. A low point concealed them from the headland, and the margin of the lake was fringed for some distance with dense and overhanging bushes. Under the cover of these natural advantages, they toiled their way with patient industry, until the scout pronounced that he believed it would be safe once more to land. The halt continued until evening rendered objects indistinct and uncertain to the eye. Then they resumed their route, and, favored by the darkness, pushed silently and vigorously toward the western shore. Although the rugged outline of a mountain to which they were steering presented no distinctive marks to the eyes of Duncan, the Mohican entered the little haven he had selected with the confidence and accuracy 
of an experienced pilot. The boat was again lifted and borne into the woods, where it was carefully concealed under a pile of brush. The adventurers assumed their arms and packs, and the scout announced to Monroe and Hayward that he and the Indians were at least in readiness to proceed. End of chapter 20 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in the autumn of 2007Chapter 21 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 21 Quote, If you find a man there, he shall die a flea's death. Unquote. From Merry Wives of Windsor. The party had landed on the border of a region that is even to this day less known to the inhabitants of the states than the deserts of Arabia or the steppes of Tartary. It was the sterile and rugged district which separates the tributaries of Champlain from those of the Hudson, the Mohawk, and the St. Lawrence. Since the period of our tale, the active spirit of the country has surrounded it with a belt of rich and thriving settlements, though none but the hunter or the savage is ever known, even now, to penetrate its wild recesses. As Hawkeye and the Mohicans had, however, often traversed the mountains and valleys of this vast wilderness, they did not hesitate to plunge into its depth, with the freedom of men accustomed to its privations and difficulties. For many hours the travelers toiled on their laborious way, guided by a star or following the direction of some watercourse, until the scout called a halt, and holding a short consultation with the Indians, they lighted their fire and made the usual preparations to pass the remainder of the night where they then were. Imitating the example and emulating the confidence of their more experienced associates, Monroe and Duncan slept without fear, if not without uneasiness. The dews were suffered to exhale, and the sun had dispersed the mist, and was shedding a strong and clear light in the forest, when the travelers resumed their journey. After proceeding a few miles, the progress of Hawkeye, who led the advance, became more deliberate and watchful. He often stopped to examine the trees. Nor did he cross a rivulet without attentively considering the quantity, the velocity, and the color of its waters distrusting his own judgment, his appeals to the opinion of Chingachgook were frequent and earnest. During one of these conferences, Hayward observed that Uncas stood a patient and silent, though, as he imagined, an interested listener. He was strongly tempted to address the young chief, and demand his opinion of their progress. But the calm and dignified demeanor of the native induced him to believe that, like himself, the other was wholly dependent on the sagacity and intelligence of the seniors of the party. At last, the scout spoke in English, and at once explained the embarrassment of their situation. When I found that the home path of the Hurons run north, he said, it did not need the judgment of many long years to tell that they would follow the valleys and keep between the waters of the Hudson and the Horican until they might strike the springs of the Canadian streams which would lead them into the heart of the country of the Frenchers. Yet here are we, within a short range of the Saccaroons, and not a sign of a trail have we crossed. Human nature is weak, and it is possible we may have not taken the proper scent. "'Heaven protect us from such an error!' exclaimed Duncan. "'Let us retrace our steps and examine as we go with keener eyes.' Has Uncas no counsel to offer in such a strait? The young Mohican cast a glance at his father, but, maintaining his quiet and reserved mien, he continued silent. Chingachgook had caught the look, and motioning with his hand, he bade him speak. The moment this permission was accorded, the countenance of Uncas changed from its grave composure to a gleam of intelligence and joy. 
bounding forward like a deer, he sprang up the side of a little acclivity a few rods in advance and stood exultingly over a spot of fresh earth that looked as though it had been recently upturned by the passage of some heavy animal. The eyes of the whole party followed the unexpected movement and read their success in the air of triumph that the youth assumed. "'Tis the trail!' exclaimed the scout, advancing to the spot. "'The lad is quick of sight and keen of wit for his years. "'Tis extraordinary that he should have withheld his knowledge for so long,' muttered Duncan at his elbow. "'It would have been more wonderful had he spoken without a bidding. "'No, no, your young white who gathers his learning from books "'and can measure what he knows by the page "'may conceit that his knowledge, like his legs,' outruns that of his father's. But where experience is the master, the scholar is made to know the value of years and respects them accordingly. See, said Uncas, pointing north and south at the evident marks of the broad trail on either side of him, the dark hair has gone toward the forest. How never ran on a more beautiful scent, responded the scout, dashing forward at once on the indicated route. We are favored greatly favored, and can follow with high noses. Aye, here are both your waddling beasts. This Huron travels like a white general. The fellow is stricken with a judgment and is mad. Look sharp for wheels, Sagamore, he continued, looking back and laughing in his newly awakened satisfaction. We shall soon have the fool journeying in a coach, and that— with three of the best pair of eyes on the borders in his rear. The spirits of the scout, and the astonishing success of the chase, in which a circuitous distance of more than forty miles had been passed, did not fail to impart a portion of hope to the whole party. Their advance was rapid, and made with as much confidence as a traveler would proceed along a wide highway. If a rock or a rivulet, or a bit of earth harder than common, severed the links of the clue they followed, the true eye of the scout recovered them at a distance, and seldom rendered the delay of a single moment necessary. Their progress was much facilitated by the certainty that Magua had found it necessary to journey through the valleys, a circumstance which rendered the general direction of the route sure. Nor had the Huron entirely neglected the arts uniformly practiced by the natives when retiring in front of an enemy. False trails and sudden turnings were frequent, wherever a brook or the formation of the ground rendered them feasible, but his pursuers were rarely deceived, and never failed to detect their error, before they had lost either time or distance on the deceptive track. By the middle of the afternoon they had passed the saccaroons, and were following the route of the declining sun. After descending an eminence to a low bottom through which a swift stream glided, they suddenly came to a place where the party of Le Renard had made a halt. Extinguished brands were laying around a spring. The offals of a deer were scattered about the place, and the trees bore evident marks of having been browsed by the horses. At a little distance, Hayward discovered and contemplated with tender emotion the small bower under which he was fain to believe that Cora and Alice had reposed. But while the earth was trodden and the footsteps of both man and beast were so plainly visible around the place, the trail appeared to have suddenly ended. It was easy to follow the tracks of the Narragansetts, but they seemed only to have wandered without guides or any other object than the pursuit of food. At length, Uncas, who with his father had endeavored to trace the route of the horses, came upon a sign of their presence that was quite recent. Before following the queue, he communicated his success to his companions, and while the latter were consulting on the circumstances, the youth reappeared leading the two fillies, with their saddles broken and the housing soiled, as if they had been permitted to run at will for several days. "'What would this prove?' said Duncan, turning pale and glancing his eyes around him, as if he feared the brush and leaves were about to give him some horrid secret. "'That our march is come to a quick end.' and that we are in an enemy's country, returned the scout. Had the knave been pressed and the gentle ones wanted horses to keep up with the party, he might have taken their scalps. But without an enemy at his heels, and with such rugged beasts as these, 
he would not hurt a hair on their heads. I know your thoughts, and shame be it to our color that you have reason for them. But he who thinks that even a Mingo would ill-treat a woman, unless it be to tomahawk her, knows nothing of Indian nature, or the laws of the woods. No, no, I have heard that the French Indians had come into these hills to hunt the moose, and we are getting within scent of their camp. Why should they not? The morning and evening guns of Ty may be heard any day among these mountains, for the Frenchers are running a new line between the provinces of the King and the Canadas. It is true that the horses are here, but the Hurons are gone. Let us, then, hunt for the path by which they parted. Hawkeye and the Mohicans now applied themselves to their task in good earnest. A circle of a few hundred feet in circumference was drawn, and each of the party took a segment for his portion. The examination, however, resulted in no discovery. The impressions of footsteps were numerous, but they all appeared like those of men who had wandered about the spot without any design to quit it. Again the scout and his companions made the circuit of the halting place, each slowly following the other, until they assembled in the center once more, no wiser than when they had started. "'Such cunning is not without its deviltry,' exclaimed Hawkeye, when he met the disappointed looks of his assistants. "'We must get down to it, Sagamore, beginning at the spring and going over the ground by inches.' The Huron shall never brag in his tribe that he has a foot which leaves no print. Setting the example himself, the scout engaged in the scrutiny with renewed zeal. Not a leaf was left unturned. The sticks were removed, and the stones lifted, for Indian cunning was known frequently to adopt these objects as cover, laboring with the utmost patience and industry to conceal such footstep as they proceed. Still no discovery was made. At length Uncas, whose activity had enabled him to achieve his portion of the task the soonest, raked the earth across the turbid little rill which ran from the spring, and diverted its course into another channel. As soon as its narrow bed below the dam was dry, he stooped over it with a keen and curious eye. A cry of exultation immediately announced the success of the young warrior. The whole party crowded to the spot, where Uncas pointed out the impression of a moccasin in the moist alluvian. "'This lad will be an honor to his people,' said Hawkeye, regarding the trail with as much admiration as a naturalist would expend on the tusk of a mammoth or the rib of a mastodon. "'I and a thorn in the side of the Hurons. Yet that is not the footstep of an Indian. The weight is too much on the heel, and the toes are squared as though one of the French dancers had been in pigeon-winging his tribe. Run back, Uncas, and bring me the size of the singer's foot. You will find a beautiful print of it just opposite yon rock again the hillside. While the youth was engaged in this commission, the scout and Chingachgook were attentively considering the impressions. The measurements agreed, and the former unhesitatingly pronounced that the footstep was that of David who had once more been made to exchange his shoes for moccasin. I can now read the whole of it as plainly as if I had seen the arts of lips of teal, he added. The singer, being a man whose gifts lay chiefly in his throat and feet, was made to go first, and the others have trod in his steps, imitating their formation. But, cried Duncan, I see no signs of— The gentle ones, interrupted the scout. The varlet has found a way to carry them, until he supposed he had thrown any followers off the scent. My life on it, we see their pretty little feet again before many rods go by. The whole party now proceeded, following the course of the reel, keeping anxious eyes on the regular impressions. The water soon flowed into its bed again, but watching the ground on either side, the foresters pursued their way content in knowing that the trail lay beneath. More than half a mile was passed before the rill rippled close around the base of an extensive and dry rock. Here they paused to make sure that the Hurons had not quitted the water. It was fortunate they did so, for the quick and active Uncas soon found the impression of a foot on a bunch of moss, where it would seem an Indian had inadvertently trodden. Pursuing the direction given by this discovery, 
he entered the neighboring thicket, and struck the trail as fresh and obvious as it had been before they reached the spring. Another shout announced the good fortune of the youth to his companions, and at once terminated the search. Ay, it has been planned with Indian judgment, said the scout, when the party was assembled around the place, and would have blinded white eyes. Shall we proceed? demanded Hayward. Softly, softly, we know our path, but it is good to examine the formation of things. This is my schooling major, and if one neglects the book, there is little chance of learning from the open land of Providence. Always plain but one thing. Which is the manner that the knave contrived to get the gentle ones along the blind trail? Even a Huron would be too proud to let their tender feet touch the water. Will this assist in explaining the difficulty? said Hayward, pointing toward the fragments of a sort of hand-barrow that had been rudely constructed of boughs and bound together with withes and which now seemed carelessly cast aside as useless. "'Tis explained!' cried the delighted Hawkeye. "'If them varlets have passed a minute, they have spent hours in striving to fabricating a lying end to their trail. Well, I've known them to waste the day in the same manner to his little purpose. Here we have three pair of moccasins and two of little feet. It is amazing that any mortal beings can journey on limbs so small.' Pass me the thong of buckskin, Uncas, and let me take the length of this foot. By the Lord, it is no longer than a child's, and yet the maidens are tall and comely. That Providence is partial in its gifts for its own wise reasons, the best and most contented of us must allow. The tender limbs of my daughters are unequal to these hardships, said Monroe, looking at the light footsteps of his children with a parent's love. We shall find their fainting forms in this desert. Of that there is little cause for fear, returned the scout, slowly shaking his head. This is a firm and straight, though a light step, and not over long. See the heel has hardly touched the ground, and there the dark hair has made a little jump from root to root. No, no. My knowledge of it, neither of them was nigh fainting hereaway. Now the singer was beginning to be footsore and leg-weary, as is plain by his trail. There, you see, he slipped. Here he has traveled wide and tottered. And there again it looks as though he journeyed on snowshoes. Ay, ay, a man who uses his throat altogether can hardly give his legs a proper training. From such undeniable testimony did the practiced woodsman arrive at the truth, with nearly as much certainty and precision as if he had been a witness of all those events which his ingenuity so easily elucidated. Cheered by these assurances, and satisfied by a reasoning that was so obvious while it was so simple, the party resumed its course, after making a short halt to take a hurried repast. When the meal was ended, the scout cast a glance upward at the setting sun, and pushed forward with a rapidity which compelled Hayward and the still vigorous Monroe, to exert all of their muscles to equal. Their route now lay along the bottom, which has already been mentioned. As the Hurons had made no further efforts to conceal their footsteps, the progress of the pursuers was no longer delayed by uncertainty. Before an hour had elapsed, however, the speed of Hawkeye sensibly abated, and his head, instead of maintaining its former direct and forward look, began to turn suspiciously from side to side, as if he were conscious of approaching danger. He soon stopped again, and waited for the whole party to come up. "'I sent the Hurons,' he said, speaking to the Mohicans. "'Yonder is open sky through the treetops, and we are getting too nigh their encampment. Sagamore, you will take the hillside to the right. Uncas will bend along the brook to the left, while I will try the trail. If anything should happen—' The call will be three croaks of a crow. I saw one of the birds fanning himself in the air just beyond the dead oak. Another sign that we are approaching an encampment. The Indians departed their several ways without reply, while Hawkeye cautiously proceeded with the two gentlemen. Hayward soon pressed to the side of their guide, eager to catch any glimpse of those enemies he had pursued with so much toil and anxiety. 
his companion told him to steal to the edge of the wood, which as usual was fringed with a thicket, and wait his coming, for he wished to examine certain suspicious signs a little on one side. Duncan obeyed, and soon found himself in a situation to command a view, which he found as extraordinary as it was novel. The trees of many acres have been felled, and the glow of a mild summer's evening had fallen on the clearing in beautiful contrast to the gray light of the forest. A short distance from the place where Duncan stood, the stream had seemingly expanded into a little lake, covering most of the lowland from mountain to mountain. The water fell out of this wide basin in a cataract so regular and gentle that it appeared rather to be the work of human hands than fashioned by nature. A hundred earthen dwellings stood on the margin of the lake, and even in its waters, as though the later had overflowed its usual banks. Their rounded roofs, admirably molded for defense against the weather, denoted more of industry and foresight than natives were wont to bestow on their regular habitations, much less on those occupied for the temporary purposes of hunting and war. In short, the whole village or town, whichever it might be termed, possessed more of method and neatness of execution than the white men had been accustomed to believe belonged ordinarily to the Indian habits. It appeared, however, to be deserted. At least, so thought Duncan for many minutes. But at length he fancied he discovered several human forms advancing toward him on all fours, and apparently dragging in the train some heavy and he was quick to apprehend, some formidable engine. Just then a few dark-looking heads gleamed out of the dwellings, and the place seemed suddenly alive with beings, which, however, glided from cover to cover so swiftly as to allow no opportunity for examining their humors or pursuits. Alarmed at these suspicious and inexplicable movements, he was about to attempt the signal of the crows, when the rustling of leaves at hand drew his eyes in another direction. The young man started, and recoiled a few paces instinctively, when he found himself within a hundred yards of a stranger Indian. Recovering his recollection of the instant, instead of sounding alarm, which might prove fatal to himself, he remained stationary, an attentive observer of the other's motions. An instant of calm observation served to assure Duncan that he was undiscovered. The native, like himself, seemed occupied in considering the low dwellings of the village and the stolen movements of its inhabitants. It was impossible to discover the expression of his features through the grotesque mask of paint under which they were concealed, though Duncan fancied it was rather melancholy than savage. His head was shaved, as usual, with the exception of the crown, from whose tuft three or four faded feathers from a hawk's wing were loosely dangling. A ragged calico mantle half encircled his body, while his nether garment was composed of an ordinary shirt, the sleeves of which were made to perform the office that is usually expected by a much more commodious arrangement. His legs were, however, covered with a pair of good deerskin moccasins. Altogether, the appearance of the individual was forlorn and miserable. Duncan was still curiously observing the person of his neighbor, when the scout stole silently and cautiously to his side. "'You see, we have reached their settlement, or encampment,' whispered the young man. "'And here is one of the savages himself, in a very embarrassing position for our further movements.' Hawkeye started, and dropped his rifle when, directed by the finger of his companion, the stranger came under his view. Then, lowering the dangerous muzzle, he stretched forward his long neck, as if to assist a scrutiny that was already intensely keen. "'The imp is not Huron,' he said, "'nor of any of the Canada tribes. And yet, you see, by his clothes, the knave has been plundering the white. I... Montcalm has raked the woods for his inroad, and a whooping, murdering set of varlets has he gathered together. Can you see where he has put his rifle or his bow? He appears to have no arms, 
nor does he seem to be viciously inclined, unless he communicate the alarm to his fellows, who, as you see, are dodging about the water. We have but little to fear from him. The scout turned to Hayward, and regarded him a moment with unconcealed amazement. Then, opening his mouth, he indulged in unrestrained and heartfelt laughter, though in that silent and peculiar manner, which danger had so long taught him to practice, repeating the words, "'Fellows who are dodging about the water!' He added, "'So much for schooling and passing a boyhood in the settlements. The knave has long legs, though, and shall not be trusted. Do you keep him under your rifle, while I creep in behind through the bush and take him alive? Fire on no account!' Hayward had already permitted his companion to bury part of his person in the thicket, when, stretching forth his arm, he arrested him in order to ask, "'If I see you in danger, may I not risk a shot?' Hawkeye regarded him a moment, like one who knew not how to take the question. Then, nodding his head, he answered, still laughing, though inaudibly, "'Fire a whole platoon, Major!' In the next moment he was concealed by the leaves. Duncan waited several minutes in feverish impatience, before he caught another glimpse of the scout. Then he reappeared, creeping along the earth from which his dress was hardly distinguishable, directly in the rear of his intended captive. Having reached within a few yards of the latter, he arose to his feet silently and slowly. At that instant several loud blows were struck on the water, and Duncan turned his eyes just in time to perceive that a hundred dark forms were plunging in a body into the troubled little sheet. Grasping his rifle, his looks were again bent on the Indian near him. Instead of taking the alarm, the unconscious savage stretched forward his neck, as if he also watched the movements about the gloomy lake with a sort of silly curiosity. In the meantime, the uplifted hand of Hawkeye was above him but without any apparent reason it was withdrawn, and its owner indulged another long, though silent, fit of merriment. When the peculiar and hearty laughter of Hawkeye was ended, instead of grasping his victim by the throat, he tapped him on the shoulder and exclaimed aloud, "'How now, friend? Have you mind to teach the beavers to sing?' "'E'en so,' was the ready answer. "'It would seem—' that the being that gave them the power to improve his gifts so well would not deny them voices to proclaim his praise. End of chapter 21 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania In the Windy Autumn of 2007《The Last of the Mohicans A Narrative of 1757 》by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 22 Quote, Bought A Bibble We all met Key Pat Pat and here's a marvelous convenient place for our rehearsal." Unquote. From Midsummer Night's Dream. The reader may better imagine than we describe the surprise of Hayward. His lurking Indians were suddenly converted into four-footed beasts, his lake into a beaver pond, his cataract into a dam constructed by those industrious and ingenious quadrupeds and a suspected enemy into his tried friend, David Gamut, the master of psalmody. The presence of the latter created so many unexpected hopes relative to the sisters, that without a moment's hesitation the young man broke out of his ambush and sprang forward to join the two principal actors in the scene. The merriment of Hawkeye was not easily appeased. Without ceremony, and with a rough hand, he twirled the supple gamut around on his heel, and more than once affirmed that the Hurons had done themselves great credit 
in the fashion of his costume. Then, seizing the hand of the other, he squeezed it with a grip that brought tears into the eyes of the placid David, and wished him joy in his new condition. "'You were about opening your throat practicings among the beavers, were ye?' he said. "'The cunning devils know half the trade already, for they beat the time with their tails, as you heard just now. And in good time it was, too, or Kildeer might have sounded the first note among them. I have known greater fools who could read and write than an experienced old beaver. But as for squalling, the animals are born dumb. What think of you as such a song as this? David shut his sensitive ears, and even Hayward, apprised as he was of the nature of the cry, looked upward in quest of the bird, as the calling of a crow rang in the air about them. See? continued the laughing scout, as he pointed toward the remainder of the party, who, in obedience to the signal, were already approaching. This is music which has its natural virtues. It brings two good rifles to my elbow, to say nothing of the knives and tomahawks. But we see that you are safe. Now tell us what has become of the maidens. They are captives of the heathen, said David, and, though greatly troubled in spirit, enjoying comfort and safety in the body. Both, demanded the breathless Hayward, even so, though our wayfaring has been sore, and our sustenance scanty, we have had little other cause for complaint, except the violence done our feelings, by being thus led in captivity into a far land. "'Bless ye for these very words!' exclaimed the trembling Monroe. "'I shall then receive my babes, spotless and angel-like, as I lost them!' "'I know not that their delivery is at hand,' returned the doubting David. "'The leader of those savages is possessed of an evil spirit that no power short of omnipotence can tame. I have tried him sleeping and walking, but neither sounds nor language seem to touch his soul. Where is the knave? bluntly interrupted the scout. He hunts the moose today with his young men, and tomorrow, as I hear, they pass further into the forest and nigher to the borders of Canada. The elder maiden is conveyed to a neighboring people, whose lodges are situate beyond yonder black pinnacle of rock, while the younger is detained among the women of the Hurons, whose dwellings are but two short miles hence, on a tableland, where the fire had done the office of the axe, and prepared the place for their reception. "'Alice, my gentle Alice,' murmured Hayward, "'she has lost the consolation of her sister's presence?' "'Even so.' But so far as praise and thanksgiving and psalmody can temper the spirit of affliction, she has not suffered. Has she, then, a heart for music? Of the graver and more solemn character. Though it must be acknowledged that, in spite of all my endeavors, the maiden weeps oftener than she smiles. And such moments I forbear to press the holy songs. But there are many sweet and comfortable periods of satisfactory communication, when the ears of the savages are astounded with the uplifting of our voices. And why are you permitted to go at large, unwatched? David composed his features into what he intended should express an air of modest humility, before he meekly replied, Little be the praise to such a worm as I, but though the power of psalmody was suspended in the terrible business of that field of blood through which we have passed, it has recovered its influence over the souls of the heathen, and I am suffered to go and come at will. The scout laughed, and tapping his own forehead significantly, he perhaps explained the singular indulgence more satisfactorily when he said, the Indians never harm a non-composer. But why, 
when the path lay open before your eyes, did you not strike back on your own trail? It is not as blind as that which a squirrel would make, and bring in the tidings to Edward. The scout, remembering only his own sturdy and iron nature, had probably exacted a task that David under no circumstances could have performed. But, without entirely losing the meekness of his air, the latter was content to answer, Though my soul would rejoice to visit the habitations of Christendom once more, my feet would rather follow the tender spirits entrusted to my keeping, even into the idolatrous province of the Jesuits, than take one step backward while they pined in captivity and sorrow. Though the figurative language of David was not very intelligible, the sincere and steady expression of his eye and the glow of his honest countenance were not easily mistaken. Uncas pressed closer to his side and regarded the speaker with a look of commendation, while his father expressed his satisfaction by the ordinary pithy exclamation of approbation. The scout shook his head as he rejoined, The Lord never intended that a man should place all his endeavors in his throat to the neglect of other and better gifts. But he has fallen into the hands of some silly woman when he should have been gathering his education under the blue sky, among the beauties of the forest. Here, friend, I didn't intend to kindle a fire with this toothing whistle of thine, but, as you value the thing, take it and blow your best on it. Gamut received his pitch-pipe with as strong an expression of pleasure as he believed compatible with the grave functions he exercised. After essaying its virtues repeatedly, in contrast with his own voice, and satisfying himself that none of its melody was lost, he made a very serious demonstration toward achieving a few stanzas of one of the longest effusions in the little volume so often mentioned. Hayward, however, hastily interrupted his pious purpose by continuing questions concerning the past and present condition of his fellow captives, and in a manner more methodical than had been permitted by his feelings in the opening of their interview. David, though he regarded his treasure with longing eyes, was constrained to answer, especially as the venerable father took a part in the interrogatories with an interest too imposing to be denied. Nor did the scout fail to throw in a pertinent inquiry, whenever a fitting occasion presented. In this manner, though with frequent interruptions which were filled with certain threatening sounds from the recovered instrument, the pursuers were put in possession of such leading circumstances as were likely to prove useful in accomplishing their great and engrossing object, the recovery of the sisters. The narrative of David was simple, and the facts but few. Maqua had waited on the mountain until a safe moment to retire presented itself, when he had descended and taken the route along the western side of the Horican in the direction of the Canadas. As the subtle Huron was familiar with the paths, and well knew that there was no immediate danger of pursuit, their progress had been moderate and far from fatiguing. It appeared from the unembellished statement of David that his own presence had been rather endured than desired, though even Maqua had not been entirely exempt from the veneration with which the Indians regard those whom the Great Spirit had visited in their intellects. At night the utmost care had been taken of the captives, both to prevent injury from the damps of the woods and to guard against an escape. At the spring the horses were turned loose, as has been seen, and notwithstanding the remoteness and length of their trail, the artifices already named were resorted to in order to cut off every clue to their place of retreat. On their arrival at the encampment of his people, Maqua, in obedience to a policy seldom departed from, separated his prisoners. Cora had been sent to a tribe that temporarily occupied an adjacent valley. 
though David was far too ignorant of the customs and history of the natives to be able to declare anything satisfactory concerning their name or character. He only knew that they had not engaged in the late expedition against William Henry, that, like the Hurons themselves, they were allies of Montcalm, and that they maintained an amicable, though watchful intercourse with the warlike and savage people whom chance had, for a time, brought in such close and disagreeable contact with themselves. The Mohicans and the scout listened to his interrupted and imperfect narrative, with an interest that obviously increased as he proceeded, and it was while attempting to explain the pursuits of the community in which Cora was detained, that the latter abruptly demanded, Did you see the fashion of their knives? Were they of English or French formation? My thoughts were bent on no such vanities, but rather mingled in consolation with those of the maidens. The time may come when you will not consider the knife of a savage such a despicable vanity, returned the scout, with a strong expression of contempt for the other's dullness. Had they held their corn feast, or can you say anything of the totems of the tribe? Of corn. We had many and plentiful feast, for the grain being in the milk is both sweet to the mouth and comfortable to the stomach. Of totem, I know not the meaning, but if it pertaineth in any wise to the art of Indian music, it need not be inquired after at their hands. They never join their voices in praise, and it would seem that they are among the profanest of the idolatrous. Therein you belie the nature of an Indian. Even the Mingo adores but the true and loving God. Tis wicked fabrication of the whites, and I say it to the shame of my color, that would make the warrior bow down before images of his own creation. It is true they endeavor to make truces to the wicked one, as who would not with an enemy he cannot conquer? but they look up for favor and assistance to the great and good spirit only. It may be so, said David, but I have seen strange and fantastic images drawn in their paint, of which their admiration and care savored of spiritual pride, especially one, and that, too, a foul and loathsome object. Was it a serpent? quickly demanded the scout. Much the same. It was in the likeness of an object and creeping tortoise. Huh! exclaimed both the attentive Mohicans in a breath, while the scout shook his head with the air of one who had made an important but by no means a pleasing discovery. Then the father spoke in the language of the Delawares, and with a calmness and dignity that instantly arrested the attention even of those to whom his words were unintelligible. His gestures were impressive, and at times energetic. Once he lifted his arm on high, and as it descended, the action threw aside the folds of his light mantle, a finger resting on his breast, as if he could enforce the meaning by the attitude. Duncan's eyes followed the movement, and he perceived that the animal just mentioned was beautifully though faintly worked in blue tint on the swarthy breast of the chief. All that he had ever heard of the violent separation of the vast tribes of the Delawares rushed across his mind, and he awaited the proper moment to speak, with a suspense that was rendered nearly intolerable by his interest in the stake. His wish, however, was anticipated by the scout, who turned from his red friend, saying, we have found that which may be good or evil to us, as heaven disposes. The Sagamore is of the high blood of the Delawares, and is the great chief of their tortoises. That some of this stock are among the people of whom the singer tells us, is plain by his words, and, had he but spent half the breath in prudent questions, that he has blown away in making a trumpet of his throat, we might have known how many warriors they numbered. 
it is altogether a dangerous path we move in, for a friend whose face is turned from you often bears a bloodier mind than the enemy who seeks your scalp. Explain, said Duncan. Tis a long and melancholy tradition, and one I little like to think of, for it is not to be denied that the evil has been mainly done by men with white skins. But it has ended in turning the tomahawk of brother against brother, and brought the Mingo and the Delaware to travel in the same path. You then suspect it is a portion of that people among whom Cora resides? The scout nodded his head in assent, though he seemed anxious to waive the further discussion of a subject that appeared painful. The impatient Duncan now made several hasty and desperate propositions to attempt the release of the sisters. Monroe seemed to shake off his apathy, and listened to the wild schemes of the young man with a deference that his gray hairs and reverend years should have denied. But the scout, after suffering the ardor of the lover to expand itself a little, found means to convince him of the folly of precipitation, in a manner that would require their coolest judgment and utmost fortitude. It would be well, he added, to let this man go in again as usual, and for him to tarry in the lodges, giving notice to the gentle ones of our approach, until we call him out by signal to consult. You know the cry of a crow friend, from the whistle of a whippoorwill? "'Tis a pleasing bird," returned David, "'and has a soft and melancholy note, though the time is rather quick and ill-measured." "'He speaks of the wish ton wish said the scout. "'Well, since you like his whistle, it shall be your signal. Remember, then, when you hear the whippoorwill's call three times repeated, you are to come into the bushes where the bird might be supposed. Stop, interrupted Hayward. I will accompany him. You, exclaimed the astonished Hawkeye, are you tired of seeing the sun rise and set? David is living proof that the Hurons can be merciful. Aye, but David can use his throat, as no man in his senses would pervert the gift. I too can play the madman the fool, the hero. In short, any or everything to rescue her I love. Name your objections no longer. I am resolved. Hawkeye regarded the young man a moment in speechless amazement, but Duncan, who in deference to the other skill and services had hitherto submitted somewhat implicitly to his dictation, now assumed the superior with a manner that was not easily resisted. He waved his hand in sign of his dislike to all remonstrance, and then, in more tempered language, he continued, You have the means to disguise. Change me. Paint me too, if you will. In short, alter me to anything. A fool. It is not for one like me to say that he who is already formed by so powerful a hand as Providence stands in need of a change muttered the discontented scout. When you send your parties abroad in war, you find it prudent, at least, to arrange the marks and places of encampment, in order that they who fight on your side may know when and where to expect a friend. Listen, interrupted Duncan, you have heard from this faithful follower of the captives that the Indians are of two tribes, if not of different nations, with one whom you think to be a branch of the Delawares, is she you call the dark hair. The other, and younger of the ladies, is undeniably with our declared enemies, the Hurons. It becomes my youth and rank to attempt the latter adventure, while you, therefore, are negotiating with your friends for the release of one of the sisters. I will effect that of the other, or die. The awakened spirit of the young soldier gleamed in his eyes, and his form became imposing under its influence. Hawkeye, though too much accustomed to Indian artifices, not to foresee the danger of the experiment, knew not well how to combat this sudden resolution. Perhaps there was something in the proposal that suited his own hardy nature, 
and that secret love of desperate adventure, which had increased with his experience until hazard and danger had become in some measure necessary to the enjoyment of his existence. Instead of continuing to oppose the scheme of Duncan, his humor suddenly altered, and he lent himself to its execution. Come, he said with a good-humored smile, the buck that will take to the water must be headed and not followed. Chingachgook has as many different paints as the engineer's officer's wife, who takes down nature on scraps of paper, making the mountains look like crocks of rusty hay, and placing the blue sky in reach of your hand. The sagamore can use them, too. Seat yourself on the log, and my life on it. He can soon make a natural fool of you, and that well to your liking. Duncan complied, and the Mohican, who had been an attentive listener to their discourse, readily undertook the office. Long practiced in all the subtle arts of his race, he drew with great dexterity and quickness the fantastic shadow that the natives were accustomed to consider as the evidence of a friendly and jocular disposition. Every line that could possibly be interpreted into a secret inclination for war was carefully avoided, while, on the other hand, he studied those conceits that might be construed into amity. In short, he entirely sacrificed every appearance of the warrior to the masquerade of a buffoon. Such exhibitions were not uncommon among the Indians, and, as Duncan was already sufficiently disguised in his dress, there certainly did exist some reason for believing that, with his knowledge of French, he might pass for a juggler from Ticonderoga, straggling among the allied and friendly tribes. When he was thought to be sufficiently painted, the scout gave him much friendly advice, concerted signals, and appointed the place where they should meet in the event of mutual success. The parting between Monroe and his young friend was more melancholy. Still, the former submitted to the separation with an indifference that his warm and honest nature would never have permitted in a more healthful state of mind. The scout led Hayward aside and acquainted him with his intention to leave the veteran in some safe encampment in charge of Chingachgook, while he and Uncas pursued their inquiries among the people they had reason to believe were Delawares. Then, renewing his cautions and advice, he concluded by saying, with the solemnity and warmth of feeling with which Duncan was deeply touched, And now, God bless you. You have shown a spirit that I like, for it is the gift of youth, more especially one of warm blood and a stout heart. But believe the warning of a man who has reason to know all he says to be true. You will have occasion for your best manhood, and for a sharper wit than what is to be gathered in books afore you outdo the cunning or get the better of the courage of a Mingo. God bless you. If the Hurons master your scalp, rely on the promise of one who has two stout warriors to back him. They shall pay for their victory with a life for every hair it holds. I say, young gentlemen, may Providence bless your undertaking, which is altogether for good. And remember that to outwit the knaves it is lawful to practice things that may not be naturally the gift of a white skin. Duncan shook his worthy and reluctant associate warmly by the hand, once more recommended the aged friend to his care, and returning his good wishes, he motioned to David to proceed. Hawkeye gazed after the high-spirited and adventurous young man for several moments, in open admiration. Then, shaking his head doubtingly, he turned, and led his own division of the party into the concealment of the forest. The route taken by Duncan and David lay directly across the clearing of the beavers, and along the margin of their pond. When the former found himself alone with one so simple, 
and so little qualified to render any assistance in desperate emergencies. He first began to be sensible of the difficulties of the task he had undertaken. The fading light increased the gloominess of the bleak and savage wilderness that stretched so far on every side of him, and there was even a fearful character in the stillness of those little huts that he knew were so abundantly peopled. It struck him as he gazed at the admirable structures and the wonderful precautions of their sagacious inmates that even the brutes of these vast wilds were possessed of an instinct nearly commensurate with his own reason, and he could not reflect without anxiety on the unequal contest that he had so rashly courted. Then came the glowing image of Alice, her distress, her actual danger, and all the peril of his situation was forgotten. Cheering David, he moved on with the light and vigorous step of youth and enterprise. After making nearly a semicircle around the pond, they diverged from the watercourse and began to ascend to the level of a slight elevation in that bottomland over which they journeyed. Within half an hour they gained the margin of another opening that bore all the signs of having been also made by the beavers, and which those sagacious animals had probably been induced, by some accident, to abandon for the more eligible position they now occupied. A very natural sensation caused Duncan to hesitate a moment, unwilling to leave the cover of their bushy path, as a man pauses to collect his energies before he essays any hazardous experiment, in which he is secretly conscious they will all be needed. He profited by the halt to gather such information as might be obtained from his short and hasty glances. On the opposite side of the clearing, and near the point where the brook tumbled over some rocks, from a still higher level, some fifty or sixty lodges, rudely fabricated of logs, brush, and earth intermingled, were to be discovered. They were arranged without any order, and seemed to be constructed with very little attention to neatness or beauty. Indeed, so very inferior were they in the two latter particulars to the village Duncan had just seen, that he began to expect a second surprise, no less astonishing than the former. This expectation was in no degree diminished when, by the doubtful twilight, he beheld twenty or thirty forms rising alternately from the cover of the tall coarse grass in front of the lodges, and then sinking again from the sight, as it were, to burrow in the earth. By the sudden and hasty glimpses that he caught of these figures, they seemed more like dark, glancing specters, or some other unearthly beings, than creatures fashioned with the ordinary and vulgar materials of flesh and blood. A gaunt, naked form was seen for a single instant, tossing its arms wildly in the air, and then the spot it had filled was vacant, the figure appearing suddenly in some other and distant place, or being succeeded by another, possessing the same mysterious character. David, observing that his companion lingered, pursued the direction of his gaze, and in some measure recalled the recollection of Hayward by speaking. "'There is much fruitful soil uncultivated here,' he said, "'and I may add, without the sinful leaven of self-commendation, that since my short sojourn in these heathenish abodes, much good seed has been scattered by the wayside.' "'The tribes are founder of the chase than of the arts of men of labor.' returned the unconscious Duncan, still gazing at the objects of his wonder. It is rather joy than labor to the spirit, to lift up the voice in praise, but sadly do these boys abuse their gifts. Rarely have I found any of their age on whom nature has so freely bestowed the elements of psalmody, and surely, surely, there are none who neglect them more. Three nights have I now tarried here, and three several times have I assembled the urchins to join in sacred song, and as often have they responded to my efforts with whoopings 
and howlings that have chilled my soul. Of whom speak you? Of those children of the devil who waste the precious moments in yonder idle antics. Oh, the wholesome restraint of discipline is but little known among this self-abandoned people. In a country of birches a rod is never seen, and it ought not to appear a marvel in my eyes that the choicest blessings of providence are wasted in such cries as these. David closed his ears against the juvenile pack, whose yell just then rang shrilly through the forest. And Duncan, suffering his lip to curl as in mockery of his own superstition, said firmly, We will proceed. Without removing the safeguards from his ears, the master of song complied, and together they pursued their way toward what David was sometimes wont to call the quote, tents of the Philistines. Unquote. End of chapter twenty two. This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the autumn of 2007. Chapter 23 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 23 Quote, But though the beast of game the privilege of chase may claim, though space and law the stag we lend, ere hound we slip, or bow we bend, whoever wrecked, where, how, or when, the prowling fox was trapped or slain? Unquote. From Lady of the Lake. It is unusual to find an encampment of the natives, like those of the more instructed whites, guarded by the presence of armed men. Well informed of the approach of every danger, while it is yet at a distance, the Indian generally rests secure under his knowledge of the signs of the forest, and the long and difficult paths that separate him from those he has most reason to dread. But the enemy who, by any lucky concurrence of accidents, has found means to elude the vigilance of the scouts, will seldom meet with sentinels near home to sound the alarm. In addition to this general usage, the tribes, friendly to the French, knew too well the weight of the blow that had just been struck to apprehend any immediate danger from the hostile nations that were tributary to the crown of Britain. When Duncan and David, therefore, found themselves in the center of the children who played the antics already mentioned, it was without the least previous intimation of their approach. But, soon as they were observed, the whole of the juvenile pack raised by common consent a shrill and warning hoop and then sank, as it were, by magic, from before the sight of their visitors. The naked tawny bodies of the crouching urchins blended so nicely at that hour with the withered herbage that at first it seemed as if the earth had, in truth, swallowed up their forms. Though when surprise permitted Duncan to bend his look more curiously about the spot, he found it everywhere met by dark, quick, and rolling eyeballs. Gathering no encouragement from this startling presage of the nature of the scrutiny he was likely to undergo from the more mature judgments of the men, there was an instant when the young soldier would have retreated. It was, however, too late to appear to hesitate. The cry of the children had drawn a dozen warriors to the door of the nearest lodge, where they stood clustered in a dark and savage group gravely awaiting the nearer approach of those who had unexpectedly come among them. David, in some measure familiarized to the scene, led the way, with the steadiness that no slight obstacle was likely to disconcert, into this very building. It was the principal edifice of the village, 
though roughly constructed of the bark and branches of trees, being the lodge in which the tribe held its councils and public meetings during their temporary residence on the borders of the English province. Duncan found it difficult to assume the necessary appearance of unconcern, as he brushed the dark and powerful frames of the savages who thronged its threshold, but conscious that his existence depended on his presence of mind, he trusted to the discretion of his companion, who footsteps he closely followed, endeavoring, as he proceeded, to rally his thoughts for the occasion. His blood curdled when he found himself in absolute contact with such fierce and implacable enemies. But he so far mastered his feelings to pursue his way into the center of the lodge, with an exterior that did not betray the weakness. Imitating the example of the deliberate Gamut, he drew a bundle of fragrant brush from beneath a pile that filled the corner of the hut, and seated himself in silence. So soon as their visitor had passed, the observant warriors fell back from the entrance, and arranging themselves about him, they seemed patiently to await the moment when it might comport with the dignity of the stranger to speak. By far the greater number stood leaning, in lazy, lounging attitudes, against the upright post that supported the crazy building, while three or four of the oldest and most distinguished of the chiefs placed themselves on the earth a little more in advance. A flaring torch was burning in the place, and set its red glare from face to face and figure to figure, as it waved in the currents of air. Duncan profited by its light to read the probable character of his reception in the countenances of his host, but his ingenuity availed him little against the cold artifices of the people he had encountered. The chiefs in front scarce cast a glance at his person, keeping their eyes on the ground with an air that might have been intended for respect, but which it was quite easy to construe into distrust. The men in the shadow were less reserved. Duncan soon detected their searching but stolen looks, which, in truth, scanned his person and attire inch by inch, leaving no emotion of the countenance, no gesture, no line of the paint, nor even the fashion of a garment, unheeded and without comment. At length, one whose hair was beginning to be sprinkled with gray, but whose sinewy limbs and firm tread announced that he was still equal to the duties of manhood, advanced out of the gloom of a corner, whither he had probably posted himself to make his observations unseen, and spoke. He used the language of the Wyandots or Hurons. His words were consequently unintelligible to Hayward, though they seemed by the gestures that accompanied them to be uttered more in courtesy than anger. The latter shook his head and made a gesture indicative of his inability to reply. Do none of my brothers speak the French or the English? he said in the former language looking about him from countenance to countenance, in hopes of finding a nod of assent. Though more than one had turned as if to catch the meaning of his words, they remained unanswered. "'I should be grieved to think,' continued Duncan, speaking slowly and using the simplest French of which he was the master, "'to believe that none of this wise and brave nation understand the language that the Grand Marquis uses when he talks to his children? His heart would be heavy did he believe his red warriors paid him so little respect. A long and grave pause succeeded, during which no movement of a limb nor any expression of an eye betrayed the expression produced by this remark. Duncan, who knew that silence was a virtue among his host, gladly had recourse to the custom in order to arrange his ideas. At length, the same warrior who had before addressed him replied, by dryly demanding in the language of the Canadas, When our great father speaks to his people, is it with the tongue of a Huron? He knows no difference in his children whether the color of the skin be red or black or white, returned Duncan evasively, though chiefly he is satisfied with the brave Hurons. 
"'In what manner will he speak?' demanded the wary chief. "'When the runners count to him the scalps which five nights ago grew on the heads of the Yengeese?' "'They were his enemies,' said Duncan, shuddering involuntarily. "'And doubtless he will say it is good. My Hurons are very gallant. Our Canadian father does not think it. Instead of looking forward to reward his Indians, his eyes are turned backward. He sees the dead Yingis, but no Huron. What can this mean? A great chief like him has more thoughts than tongues. He looks to see that no enemies are on his trail. The canoe of a dead warrior will not float on the Horican, returned the savage gloomily. His ears are open to the Delawares, who are not our friends, and they fill them with lies. It cannot be. See? He has bid me, who am a man that knows the art of healing, to go to his children, the Red Hurons of the Great Lakes, and ask if any are sick. Another silence succeeded this enunciation of the character Duncan had assumed. Every eye was simultaneously bent on his person, as if to inquire into the truth or falsehood of the declaration, with an intelligence and keenness that caused the subject of their scrutiny to tremble for the result. He was, however, relieved again by the former speaker. "'Do the cunning men of the Canadas paint their skins?' the Huron coldly continued. "'We have heard them boast that their faces were pale.' "'When an Indian chief comes among his white fathers,' returned Duncan, with great steadiness, "'he lays aside his buffalo robe to carry the shirt that is offered him. "'My brothers have given me paint, and I wear it.' "'A low murmur of applause announced that the compliment of the tribe was favorably received. "'The elderly chief made a gesture of commendation, which was answered by most of his companions.' who each drew forth a hand and uttered a brief exclamation of pleasure. Duncan began to breathe more freely, believing that the weight of his examination was passed, and, as he had already prepared a simple and probable tale to support his pretend occupation, his hopes of ultimate success grew brighter. After a silence of a few moments, as if adjusting his thoughts, in order to make a suitable answer to the declaration, their guest had just given, another warrior arose and placed himself in an attitude to speak. While his lips were yet in the act of parting, a low but fearful sound arose from the forest. It was immediately succeeded by a high shrill yell that was drawn out until it equaled the longest and most plaintive howl of the wolf. The sudden and terrible interruption caused Duncan to start from his seat unconscious of everything but the effect produced by so frightful a cry. At the same moment the warriors glided in a body from the lodge, and the outer air was filled with loud shouts, that nearly drowned those awful sounds which were still ringing beneath the arches of the woods. Unable to command himself any longer, the youth broke from the place, and presently stood in the center of a disorderly throng, that included everything having life within the limits of the encampment. Men, women, and children, the aged, the infirm, the active, and the strong, were alike abroad, some exclaiming aloud, others clapping their hands with a joy that seemed frantic, and all expressing their savage pleasure in some unexpected event. Though astounded at first by the uproar, Hayward was soon able to find its solution by the scene that followed. There yet lingered sufficient light in the heavens to exhibit those bright openings among the treetops, where different paths left the clearing to enter the depths of the wilderness. Beneath one of them a line of warriors issued from the woods and advanced slowly toward the dwellings. One in front bore a short pole, on which, as it afterwards appeared, were suspended several human scalps. The startling sounds that Duncan had heard were what the whites have not inappropriately called the, quote, death halo, unquote, and each repetition of the cry was intended to announce to the tribe the fate of an enemy. 
Thus far the knowledge of Hayward assisted him in the explanation, and as he now knew that the interruption was caused by the unlooked-for return of a successful war party, every disagreeable sensation was quieted in inward congratulation for the opportune relief and insignificance it conferred on himself. When at the distance of a few hundred feet from the lodges, the newly arrived warriors halted, their plaintive and terrific cry, which was intended to represent equally the wailings of the dead and the triumph to the victors, had entirely ceased. One of their number now called aloud in words that were far from appalling, though not more intelligible to those whose ears they were intended, than their expressive yells. It would be difficult to convey a suitable idea of the savage ecstasy with which the news thus imparted was received. The whole encampment, in a moment, became a scene of the most violent bustle and commotion. The warriors drew their knives, and flourishing them, they arranged themselves in two lines, forming a lane that extended from war party to the lodges. The squaws seized clubs, axes, or whatever weapon of offense first offered itself to their hands, and rushed eagerly to act their part in the cruel game that was at hand. Even the children would not be excluded, but boys, little able to wield the instruments, tore the tomahawks from the belts of their fathers and stole into the ranks, apt imitators of the savage traits exhibited by their parents. Large piles of brush lay scattered about the clearing, and a wary and aged squaw was occupied in firing as many as might serve to light the coming exhibition. As the flame arose, its power exceeded that of the parting day, and assisted to render objects at the same time more distinct and more hideous. The whole scene formed a striking picture, whose frame was composed of the dark and tall border of pines. The warriors just arrived were the most distant figures. A little in advance stood two men, who were apparently selected from the rest as the principal actors in what was to follow. The light was not strong enough to render their features distinct, though it was quite evident that they were governed by very different emotions. While one stood erect and firm, prepared to meet his fate like a hero, the other bowed his head, as if palsied by terror or stricken with shame. The high-spirited Duncan felt a powerful impulse of admiration and pity toward the former, though no opportunity could offer to exhibit his generous emotions. He watched his slightest movement, however, with eager eyes, and, as he traced the fine outline of his admirably proportioned and active frame, he endeavored to persuade himself that if the powers of man, seconded by such noble resolution, could bear one harmless through so severe a trial, the youthful captive before him might hope for success in the hazardous race he was about to run. Insensibly, the young man drew nigher to the swarthy lines of the Hurons, and scarcely breathed. So intense became his interest in the spectacle. Just then the signal yell was given, and the momentary quiet that had preceded it was broken by a burst of cries that far exceeded any before heard. The more abject of the two victims continued motionless but the other bounded from the place of the cry with the activity and swiftness of a deer. Instead of rushing through the hostile lines, as had been expected, he just entered the dangerous defile, and before time was given for a single blow, turned short, and leaping the heads of a row of children, he gained at once the exterior and safer side of the formidable array. The artifice was answered by a hundred voices, raised in imprecations and the whole of the excited multitude broke from their order and spread themselves about the place in wild confusion. A dozen blazing piles now shed their lurid brightness on the place, which resembled some unhallowed and supernatural arena in which the malicious demons had assembled to act their bloody and lawless rites. The forms in the background looked like unearthly beings, gliding before the eye and cleaving the air with frantic and unmeaning gestures, while the savage passions of such as passed the flames 
were rendered fearfully distinct by the gleams that shot athwart their inflamed visages. It will easily be understood that amid such a concourse of vindictive enemies no breathing time was allowed the fugitive. There was a single moment when it seemed as if he would have reached the forest, but the whole body of his captors threw themselves before him and drove him back into the center of his relentless persecutors. Turning like a headed deer, he shot with the swiftness of an arrow through a pillar of forked flame, and passing the whole multitude harmless, he appeared on the opposite side of the clearing. Here, too, he was met and turned by a few of the older and more subtle of the Hurons. Once more he tried the throng, as if seeking safety in its blindness, and then several moments succeeded, during which Duncan believed the active and courageous young stranger was lost. Nothing could be distinguished but a dark mass of human forms, tossed and involved in inexplicable confusion. Arms, gleaming knives, and formidable clubs appeared above them. But the blows were evidently given at random. The awful effect was heightened by the piercing shrieks of the women and the fierce yells of the warriors. Now and then Duncan caught a glimpse of a light form cleaving the air in some desperate bound, and he rather hoped than believed that the captive yet retained the command of his astonishing powers of activity. Suddenly the multitude rolled backward and approached the spot where he himself stood. The heavy body in the rear pressed upon the women and children in front and bore them to the earth. The stranger reappeared in the confusion. Human power could not, however, much longer endure so severe a trial. Of this the captive seemed conscious. Profiting by the momentary opening, he darted from among the warriors and made a desperate and what seemed to Duncan a final effort to gain the wood. As if aware that no danger was to be apprehended from the young soldier, the fugitive nearly brushed his person in his flight. A tall and powerful Huron who had husbanded his forces pressed close upon his heels and with an uplifted arm menaced a fatal blow. Duncan thrust forth a foot, and the shock precipitated the eager savage headlong, many feet in advance of his intended victim. Thought itself is not quicker than was the motion with which the latter profited by the advantage. He turned, gleamed like a meteor again before the eyes of Duncan, and at the next moment, when the latter recovered his recollection and gazed around in quest of the captive, he saw him quietly leaning against a small painted post, which stood before the door of the principal lodge. Apprehensive that the part he had taken in the escape might prove fatal to himself, Duncan left the place without delay. He followed the crowd which drew nigh the lodges, gloomy and sullen, like any other multitude that had been disappointed in an execution. Curiosity, or perhaps a better feeling, induced him to approach the stranger. He found him standing with one arm cast about the protecting post, and breathing thick and hard after his exertions but disdaining to permit a single sign of suffering to escape. His person was now protected by immemorial and sacred usage, until the tribe and council had deliberated and determined on his fate. It was not difficult, however, to foretell the result, if any presage could be drawn from the feelings of those who crowded the place. There was no term of abuse known to the Huron vocabulary, that the disappointed woman did not lavishly expend on the successful stranger. They flouted at his efforts, and told him, with bitter scoffs, that his feet were better than his hands, and that he merited wings while he knew not how to use an arrow or a knife. To all this the captain made no reply, but was content to preserve an attitude in which dignity was singularly blended with disdain. Exasperated as much by his composure as by his good fortune, their words became unintelligible and were succeeded by shrill, piercing yells. Just then the crafty squaw who had taken the necessary precaution to fire the piles made her way through the throng 
and cleared a place for herself in front of the captive. The squalid and withered person of this hag might well have obtained for her the character of possessing more than human cunning. Throwing back her light vestment, she stretched forth her long skinny arm in derision, and using the language of the Lenape, as more intelligible to the subject of her jibes, she commenced aloud. Look, ye Delaware, she said, snapping her fingers in his face. Your nation is a race of women, and the whole is better fitted to your hands than the gun. Your squaws are the mothers of deer, but if a bear or a wildcat or a serpent were born among you, ye would flee. The Huron girl shall make you petticoats, and we will find you a husband. A burst of savage laughter succeeded this attack, during which the soft and musical merriment of the younger females strangely chimed with the cracked voices of their older and more malignant companion. But the stranger was superior to all their efforts. His head was immovable, nor did he betray the slightest consciousness that any were present except when his haughty eye rolled toward the dusky forms of the warriors, who stalked in the background, silent and sullen observers of the scene. Infuriated at the self-command of the captive, the woman placed her arms akimbo, and throwing herself in a posture of defiance, she broke out anew in a torrent of words that no art of ours could commit successfully to paper. Her breath was, however, expended in vain, for although distinguished in her nation as a proficient in the art of abuse, she was permitted to work herself into such a fury as actually to foam at the mouth without causing a muscle to vibrate in the motionless figure of the stranger. The effect of this indifference began to extend itself to the other spectators, and a youngster, who was just quitting the condition of a boy to enter the state of manhood, attempted to assist the termagant by flourishing his tomahawk before their victim, and adding his empty boast to the taunts of the women. Then, indeed, the captive turned his face toward the light, and looked down on the stripling with an expression that was superior to contempt. At the next moment he resumed his quiet and reclining attitude against the post. But the change of posture had permitted Duncan to exchange glances with the firm and piercing eyes of Uncas, breathless with amazement and heavily oppressed with the critical situation of his friend, Hayward recoiled before the look trembling lest its meaning might in some unknown manner hasten the prisoner's fate. There was not, however, any instant cause for such an apprehension. Just then a warrior forced his way into the exasperated crowd. Motioning the woman and children aside with a stern gesture, he took Uncas by the arm and led him toward the door of the council lodge. Thither all the chiefs and most of the distinguished warriors followed among whom the anxious Hayward found means to enter without attracting any dangerous attention to himself. A few moments were consumed in disposing of those present in a manner suitable to their rank and influence in the tribe. An order very similar to that adopted in the preceding interview was observed, the aged and superior chiefs occupying the area of the spacious apartment within the powerful light of a glaring torch, while their juniors and inferiors were arranged in the background, presenting a dark outline of swarthy marked visages. In the very center of the lodge, immediately under an opening that admitted the twinkling light of one or two stars, stood Uncas, calm, elevated, and collected. His high and haughty carriage was not lost on his captors, who often bent their looks on his person with eyes which, while they lost none of their inflexibility of purpose, plainly betrayed their admiration of the stranger's daring. The case was different with the individual whom Duncan had observed to stand forth with his friend previously to the desperate trial of speed, and who, instead of joining in the chase, had remained throughout its turbulent uproar like a cringing statue, expressive of shame and disgrace, though not a hand had been extended to greet him nor yet an eye had condescended to watch his movements, he had also entered the lodge, 
as though impelled by a fate to whose decrees he submitted, seemingly without a struggle. Hayward profited by the first opportunity to gaze in his face, secretly apprehensive he might find the features of another acquaintance. But they proved to be those of a stranger, and, what was still more inexplicable, of one who bore all the distinctive marks of a Huron warrior. Instead of mingling with his tribe, however, he sat apart, a solitary being in a multitude, his form shrinking into a crouching and abject attitude, as if anxious to fill as little space as possible. When each individual had taken his proper station, and silence reigned in the place, the gray-haired chief, already introduced to the reader, spoke aloud in the language of the Lenny Lenape. Delaware, he said, though one of a nation of women, you have proved yourself a man. I would give you food, but he who eats with a Huron should become his friend. Rest in peace till the morning sun, when our last words shall be spoken. Seven nights and as many summer days have I fasted on the trail of the Hurons, Uncas coldly replied. The children of the Lenape know how to travel the path of the just without lingering to eat. Two of my young men are in pursuit of your companion, resumed the other, without appearing to regard the boast of his captive. When they get back, then will our wise man say to you, Live or die. Has the Huron no ears? scornfully exclaimed Uncas. Twice since he has been your prisoner has the Delaware heard a gun that he knows. Your young men will never come back. A short and sullen pause succeeded this bold assertion. Duncan, who understood the Mohican to allude to the fatal rifle of the scout, bent forward in earnest observation of the effect it might produce on the conquerors. But the chief was content with simply retorting, if the Lenape are so skillful, why is one of their bravest warriors here? He followed the steps of a flying coward and fell into a snare. The cunning beaver may be caught. As Uncas thus replied, he pointed with his finger toward the solitary Huron, but without deigning to bestow any other notice on so unworthy an object. The words of the answer and the air of the speaker produced a strong sensation among his auditors. Every eye rolled sullenly toward the individual indicated by the simple gesture, and a low, threatening murmur passed through the crowd. The ominous sounds reached the outer door, and the women and children pressing into the throng no gap had been left between shoulder and shoulder that was not now filled with the dark lineaments of some eager and curious human countenance. In the meantime, the more aged chiefs in the center communed with each other in short and broken sentences. Not a word was uttered that did not convey the meaning of the speaker in the simplest and most energetic form. Again a long and deeply solemn pause took place. It was known by all present to be the brave precursor of a weighty and important judgment. They who composed the outer circle of faces were on tiptoe to gaze and even the culprit for an instant forgot his shame in a deeper emotion, and exposed his abject features in order to cast an anxious and troubled glance at the dark assemblage of chiefs. The silence was finally broken by the aged warrior so often named. He arose from the earth, and moving past the immovable form of Uncas, placed himself in a dignified attitude before the offender. At that moment, the withered squall already mentioned moved into the circle in a slow, sidling sort of dance, holding the torch and muttering the indistinct words of what might have been a species of incantation. Though her presence was altogether an intrusion, it was unheeded. Approaching Uncas, she held the blazing brand in such a manner as to cast its red glare on his person, and to expose the slightest emotion of his countenance. The Mohican maintained his firm and haughty attitude, and his eyes, so far from deigning to meet her inquisitive look, dwelt steadily on the distance, as though it penetrated the obstacles which impeded the view, 
and looked into futurity. Satisfied with her examination, she left him, with a slight expression of pleasure, and proceeded to practice the same trying experiment on her delinquent countrymen. The young Huron was in his war-paint, and very little of a finely molded form was concealed by his attire. The light rendered every limb and joint discernible, and Duncan turned away in horror when he saw they were writhing in irrepressible agony. The woman was commencing a low and plaintive howl at the sad and shameful spectacle, when the chief put forth his hand and gently pushed her aside. "'Read that bends,' he said, addressing the young culprit by name, and in his proper language. "'Though the great spirit has made you pleasant to the eyes, it would have been better that you had not been born. Your tongue is loud in the village, but in battle it is still.' None of my young men strike the tomahawk deeper into the war-post, none of them so lightly on the Angus. The enemy know the shape of your back, but they have never seen the color of your eyes. Three times have they called on you to come, and as often did you forget to answer. Your name will never be mentioned again in our tribe. It is already forgotten. As the chief slowly uttered these words, Pausing impressively between each sentence, the culprit raised his face, in deference to the other's rank and years. Shame, horror, and pride struggled in its lineaments. His eye, which was contracted with inward anguish, gleamed on the persons of those whose breath was his fame, and the latter emotion for an instant predominated. He arose to his feet and bearing his bosom looked steadily on the keen glittering knife that was already upheld by his inexorable judge. As the weapon passed slowly into his heart, he even smiled, as if in joy at having found death less dreadful than he had anticipated, and fell heavily on his face at the feet of the rigid and unyielding form of Uncas. The squaw gave a loud and plaintive yell, dashed the torch to the earth, and buried everything in darkness. The whole shuddering group of spectators glided from the lodge like troubled sprites, and Duncan thought that he and the yet throbbing body of the victim of an Indian judgment had now become its only tenants. End of chapter 23 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the autumn of 2007